Hi guys, I want to invite you to join the Patreon where you will get some benefits as well as audiobooks that will not be uploaded on YouTube. One hundred and seventy times. The exact number he had forgotten came out of her mouth. That's the number of times you attack my mother and the leaders of our race in front of my eyes. To be exact, it was a number he didn't even remember. From one point, death became nothing but an act of repetition which he didn't bother remembering. 169 times that's the number of times you died. Out of those you killed yourself 36 times. But among the iterations that he had thoughtlessly skimmed through was a victim who had clearly observed the process of his regression. 37 The number of times my mother almost died. Embedding an explosive amount of hatred and hostility into her eyes, she glared at Eugidi. I'm a dragon. I don't forget but that's different for you. You don't remember anything, do you? She started gasping for breath. Sealing her mouth shut, she clenched her small hands into fists and closed her eyes to withstand the dense fog of hatred. Hook, hook, kook. After somehow collecting her breath, she opened her eyes again. That's always how it is for the assailant. Would this be how it feels for his brain to melt away? Eugidi was feeling that something had already gone irreversibly wrong. He still didn't think his actions were wrong even at this point. He had done it out of necessity but that did not change the fact that the child of the dragon he had killed was cursing in front of him. While he was clenching his teeth and stopping his breath at the face of the unbelievable reality. She continued speaking. It was very strange. Back then, we were already in a very vulnerable state because of the strife with other sovereigns and there were fights happening between us. My mother moved the entire world into a visible place with conceptualization and shaped it into a human palace. It was to avoid their eyes. The girl still remembered that day. After several short gasps, her eyes turned blurry as they gazed into the distant past. That day was the same as every other day. After a strict education and training, I was complaining to my mum. It's too stressful. It's too painful, because my ribs were all shattered and dangling. I cursed her, why did you give birth to me if you were going to do this? But she suddenly got up in a hurry. I became more mad because I thought she was trying to hit me, but no. My mum led me and my sister somewhere hand in hand and I was surprised. It was my first time seeing her look so frightened. That was when something exploded outside the palace. Back then, we were preparing for a war against other sovereigns and there were about twenty black dragons protecting the palace. Her gaze turned blurry. All those unforgettable moments came back to her as complete memories. I heard screams outside. The palace was shaking from loud explosions. My mum shouted and sent someone off. My sister started to cry so I hugged her. Someone died outside. To something extremely dangerous. Eugidi knew who that something was without even needing to hear it from her. Even though memories of those moments were hazy, he could still remember what he himself had done. My mum pushed me and my sister to the non-providential world behind the throne. There was an alternate dimension opened beforehand. Because my sister belonged to the providential world, she was tied to the timeline but I wasn't. Mum said to me. Memory transferation unique to the black race flooded unedited memories into his head. Stay here. Do not ever come out. Lujayathan's expression tainted with fear. Mum will be alright. So never come out. Okay. And her endlessly quivering voice was vividly conveyed to him. My mum then covered the dimension with a veil. She didn't know how great her daughter was. She didn't expect me to rip that veil. She continued while gazing into Eugidi's eyes. A man carrying a sword came into the palace. Seemingly with a lump in her throat, she started off slow. Through the tear in the veil, the light purple eyes of the small girl saw something she shouldn't have. Mum was attacked by that man. All my uncles and aunties were being killed by the man but my mum retaliated fiercely. She was still the head of a dragon race. So in the end, the conceptualized palace crumbled and the man was bisected. It was quite shocking to me. Because all of my precious uncles and aunties had been killed. But, that wasn't the end. 
The moment the man died, the world regressed to its original point in time. Soon, the world flipped upside down. My aunties and uncles came back to life. The shattered building rebuilt itself. And the man came back carrying a sword. Unfortunately, the time she entered the non-providential world was too close to the man's assault. That specific point in time when the girl entered the non-providential world primal time became the starting point of her perception of the regression, and she was forced to watch the man constantly break through the palace. Next, Mum lost her legs. After that, she struggled in pain from a stab to her stomach. And later, the fight ended with her arms amputated. Time flew back and my mum repeatedly returned to the mum I knew. But without even skipping a single time. She bit her lips. That man came to kill my mum. One time, she had to crawl with her legs cut off. One time, she bled from her dugout eyes as she cried in pain. And one time, her heart was gouged out as she was stuck in a corner, being stabbed on repeat for a few hours. As time repeated 170 times. There was one baby dragon who had to watch all that happened without ever turning away from it. Mum didn't die when she was decapitated, and didn't die even when her heart was stabbed. It was because the source of her life was in fact embedded in a different part of her body. Can you guess where that was? She gave a wide smile despite the melancholic look on her face. When the crushed fawn was revealed by the smile, Ujidi was frozen stiff. Mum died and the man left. But I stayed there crying. After a few years, I came out of the shelter and woke up my sister who was still unconscious. The moment I left the non-providential world, my world was included inside the destined providence. In other words, my mother's death was decided the very moment I returned to the palace. It couldn't be helped. I couldn't stay in that tiny and suffocating prison all my life. So mum was forever dead. My sister lost her mind because of the sudden reality that she had to face and tried to stop her heart to die. I had to make sure she wouldn't die. I was young, but back then, I was quite calm. Crouching there together with my sister, we thought about what to do while looking at mother's corpse. How should we take revenge? We asked each other. She erased the smile from her mouth. Before coming up with a detailed plan. I recalled all of your 170 deaths to collect your information. You were very arrogant back then. You didn't even try to hide your emotions or memories. Maybe that was because you were going to keep on regressing anyway. Thanks to that, I got the information I needed, but it was difficult. She giggled. Our plan for revenge was difficult from the get-go. The first obstacle was that you were too strong. You were too strong, and too great. I saw from your memory fragments that you had killed Sovereign several times even though I learned a lot of amazing spells, I had no idea how I was supposed to kill you. I realized I would not be able to create any risk to your life in the first place, because no matter how strong I became, it would be impossible for me to overwhelm you to death. That wasn't the only problem. The second obstacle, was that funnily enough, you were wishing for death. Later I realized that too was because of dragons, but so what? That didn't matter in the slightest. What was important was that you, who I wanted to kill, wanted to die. Even if I do fully kill you, that is nothing but achieving your objective in your stead. Is listening to the opponent's request a revenge? I didn't think so at least. So killing you was meaningless. Lifting her hands, she showed off her palms. Then what should I do to take revenge against you? It's hard even when you think about it right? But, when I calmly pondered about it, I did find a method. With a gaze surging with sin and a set of movements filled with hatred, she continued with an assured voice. Because you wanted to die, I had to make you want to live. And because I couldn't kill you even when you wanted to live, I simply had to take what you considered precious. Fortunately, I was like my mother and could drag out a strong emotion from others. That is including love. She used one of her hands to caress her own cheeks, while using her other hand to grab and knead her breasts. For that, I had to give my body. To my nemesis who killed my mother. Biting her lips, she continued. Although that was distressing, I was still willing to do it. My mum was everything to me. She was the world. 
using my body to take revenge on the one who destroyed my world was nothing. But, that wasn't the end either. Somehow, you could look at the depths of someone's feelings and I realized that was because of those fickle eyes of yours. Everything would be over the moment you realized I was Lejiathan's daughter, right? In order to deceive you, I had to deceive myself first. You know a black dragon's ability is to manipulate and convey memories, yes? So I killed my personality and sealed it and likewise, I also locked my sister's personality and the memories of her childhood. I said to her. I will go bewitch my nemesis first. You come when it's time, and hand me the key. She sneered before raising the tip of the ballista and pointing it at Giles's head again. Making a person who desired death want to live, and in the end taking everything precious from him. That was the revenge plan of the young baby dragon. It wasn't easy. Ujidi didn't reply. He felt like he was going insane, and he therefore had no idea what he was supposed to say, nor what expression he was supposed to wear. If there was hell, this would be it. At the very end of his long drop, he at last realized that his soul was dumped and completely crushed at the bottom of the abyss. He was powerless. He couldn't say anything. Meanwhile, she tilted her head and observed his expression like a scientist watching the change of a test subject. So, how do you feel? A slightly brighter expression appeared on her face as she glanced through him. She whispered with a soft voice. Do you want to live now? Her childhood memories came back to her. When the seemingly unending hell finally came to an end, and after the murderer, who was standing still in pleasure in front of her mother's corpse as if he was ejaculating, turned and left the palace. The baby dragon stood in front of her mother. Her fangs as well as her mouth were pulverized and her entire body was sliced into pieces. Blankly, the child walked up and touched her mum. Shaking the still body of her mother, lifting and dropping her heavy hand that used to move on its own, and gazing at the powerless hand that dropped back down to the ground. While leaning her head to the cold heart that would no longer pulse with life. The child had to accept the unbelievable truth. Her younger sister was unconscious. Soon, after gaining her consciousness, her sister tried to stop her heart from the unbearable shock so the child had to squeeze her body and stop her. Despite being young, the two of them knew what kind of race the black dragons were. They did not have any place to call home, and they were the trash of a scalifa that couldn't be acknowledged by any other race. They were the dimensional garbage. Because those kids only had their family to rely on. Their mother used to be the world to them. And yet now, their mother was dead. After a long and violent fight, the older sister suppressed her younger sister from above and shouted at her. Why would you kill yourself? Is everything over if we die? Even if we do die, we have to take our revenge before that. Because she was still crude with words and sloppy with expressions, she couldn't properly convey her deathly despair, but there was another method. Their minds became one as thoughts were connected. The young dragon conveyed her thoughts to her younger sister. If you can't do it with your own hands, then help me achieve our revenge. Make a vow. On mum's corpse. That we will definitely avenge her death. Hearing the shout of her older sister who always used to speak softly, the younger dragon widened her eyes and held back her tears. Do it. Like that, the hatchlings made a pledge. The dimension where their residential palace was located was very close to primal time. Time and space became more and more distorted the closer one was to the non-providential world, and after entering the world of primal time, it would deviate into a parallel timeline that travels differently from the time providence. The older sister calculated in her head. It would create a difference of roughly 500 years for her to leave this place and arrive at Earth. Even though the murderer had jumped through the restrictions of time using the power of a certain transcendent authority, the baby dragons did not have such a power. From inside the treasure of the black race, the older sister observed the undistorted timeline. There, another version of herself was about to depart on a journey to become the dragon lord. By pretending to be a green dragon, she was at a scalifet greeting some hatchlings she was seeing for the first time under the permission of the dragon lord. It was a very opportune timing. However, she herself couldn't go to that place. She was a mutant, and was an existence that could gaze at providence from outside providence. 
If she were to jump into the providential time here, it would create two versions of herself. If that happened, then the guy called Vintage Clock who looked after Providence would perceive her existence and come to erase her by sending a sovereign or something. Fortunately there was a method, because a black dragon's ability was editing and transferring memories. However, it was also impossible to directly send her current memories to her other self that was in such a distant place. There was too much of a deficiency in output and all she could do here was light up a small ember on the fuse. Therefore, the older sister decided to convey those memories through her sister. Looking at her younger sister who was crouching on the ground, she opened her mouth. From now on, you have to fly by yourself for 500 years. I will seal your memories, so you don't die from that loneliness. Flying there will be very tiring and it will be very lonely. But you still must go. Help me. While sealing her memories, the older sister applied a simple brainwash on top. Help the younger sister's purpose in life would be to help someone. This was the power that would allow her to traverse through other dimensions for 500 years all by herself, making sure that she would arrive at her other self that was waiting very far ahead without deviating from the path. But right as she was about to use her sealing spell, the younger sister asked a question. Uni. NN. When my job is over, and when all the memories get transferred back to you. NN. After that, can I die first? The older sister just could not turn her down, because that was the only way to postpone her sister's death as much as possible. Wait for me there. Using the power of the green race, the baby dragon aligned herself to Providence. For her other self to unhurriedly leave on the amusement 500 years later in the providential world, she had to completely seal her own memories. Like that, she had to become oblivious to everything in order to avoid the eyes of vintage clock supervision over the providence of time. Before erasing her memories, it was possible to mess around with her body and she could also apply a little brainwash on herself. Even vintage clock would not be able to notice that. Therefore, the baby dragon brainwashed herself on three points. 1. Fall in crazy love with my nemesis for no reason and endlessly crave for his love. For her first brainwash, she touched her origin fragment. After 500 years, she would probably leave on an amusement while pretending to be a hatchling all over again, and she was going to make preparations for that beforehand. Fortunately, there was a tool among the treasures of the black race that allowed her to manipulate the origin fragment. 2. Intrude deeply into my nemesis, shake his heart and make him hold romantic feelings for myself. She set up a few devices for her second brainwash. The opponent was fundamentally a human, and a male. The young dragon prepared various things that could allow her to shake a male's heart. Firstly, she edited the basic settings of her polymorph. Her face that was already pretty among dragons thanks to her taking after her mother became even more attractive. The lines going down her white neck to her collarbones the beautiful form of breasts and the slender waist, as well as the appealing hip line were all modified to be even prettier. Her white and tiny hands and feet were carved into more beautiful shapes. She then formed ample muscles, glossy hair and soft skin. After that, she learned how to speak with a wonderful and refreshing voice, and made her body emanate a fragrance that could shake an existence's heart. Since she could use the abilities of both races at her free will, she disguised that fragrance under the scent of nature and made it natural. Also, she tried to hold a warm heart that could soothe others. She had to be aggressive and on the move to shake the blunt heart of a dull human, and had to hold enough possessive desire to threaten him and ensure his romantic feelings wouldn't stray towards a different person after being woken up. According to what she had learned from her mother, an existence that was not dangerous seemed to be ignored in a human society. But while changing everything one by one, her size turned bigger over time. These parts were still probably imperfect and sloppy. From the start, she had always been an uninteresting existence and had never even contemplated how to appeal to a male before. Regardless, she did everything she could. 3. Help him do everything he wants to achieve. After finishing all the way up to her third brainwash. The baby dragon thought to herself. It was unclear when all this would actually come into play because her nemesis had the ability to flip time upside down. It was unclear when that mental patient with a worn-out personality would treat her other self nicely. 
However, by constantly sharing the same space with him and increasing her conversation with him, and when they finally had a bond between each other. Her brainwashes would definitely come into play. Finishing her line of thought, the baby dragon sealed her memories. And entered a deep slumber. In the warm season, there were kids watering the ground. Although it was a dry and parched piece of land, there was definitely life on it before, and even until now, there seemed to have been a small seed left behind on the crevices of the seemingly infertile land. Judging from the small leaf leaving the ground, that was. That small leaf was his heart. Like how it had been called a kid by the innocently young curl, the tiny leaf was very immature and shaky with each breeze of dust being too sharp for comfort. Even then, it was okay. I, trust you. Someone gave water when it was time. It might hurt more for the one who lied right. While another blocked the harsh wind from the side. The small leaf gradually became bigger and the roots went deeper down, holding more water hostage. Life slowly returned to the parched piece of land. There were a lot of hazards throughout the process and there were also solutions. Facing anything uncomfortable with disregard, and using habit for what was familiar, he used various solutions to avoid the risks that threatened him. However, what he couldn't expect was the watering child to suddenly tear him to pieces. So, how do you feel? The hands that used to be softer and warmer than anything else in the world were shredding the leaf to tatters. He did not know how to deal with such a thing. Do you want to live now? Her voice was apathetic and her gaze was so cold it gave him chills. Eugidi placed his hand on his chest feeling the shattered fragments of a glass marble wreaking havoc in his heart. His heart was being crushed. It was painful. Like he was dying. Lifting his head, he looked at her. However, he had no idea how he was supposed to reply to her question. If he said he wanted to live, her revenge would be made complete and Joel would die. If he said he wanted to die, then he wouldn't be able to explain why he came here. Suddenly, he saw Yoram and Joel looking at him with their eyes open. They were urging him to reply but in that scene, Yoram was covered in more wounds while Joel looked more like an adult. His heart dropped an inch. But when he reopened his eyes after a blink, he realized the kids were still unconsciously closing their eyes. His mental shock appeared to have crossed the line. What he saw just then, was his sin. N.N. She asked him again. Do you want to live? He remained silent. His heart was thumping in concern that she might pull the trigger but she didn't. She continued gazing at his face with a pouty look on her face. You look quite shocked. Didn't know you could show an expression like that. If you don't want to reply to that, how about I ask something else? How do you feel right now? What? I wanted to ask if a day like this ever came. You probably want to live now because of us, so these kids dying must feel like your world is crumbling down right? How would you feel in a time like this? Would you feel half as much despair as what I have felt? Eugidi stared at the ground with unfocused eyes. If your plan included making me want to die, B.O.M., then it was a complete success. The steaming hot spring he prepared for the kids to warm up their bodies on the way back home was icy cold and so was his heart. A chilly blizzard was freezing the flesh inside his cracked skin. Because I feel like dying. However. As always. No matter how vicious of a thing happened to him. Even if his heart was to be crushed. And even if he was to die. His life always continued on its own so he had to face reality. Suppressing his emotions that could burst out and kill him anytime, Eugidi closed his eyes and contemplated. That means you want to live, right? After hearing the question a third time. Reopening his eyes, he slowly opened his mouth. Yes. I want to live. An intense pressure was trampling down on his physical body as blood oozed out from within. A drop of blood butted under one of his eyes, which soon traveled down his cheek. I want to live, with all of you. TLN Hi. This is Rain. I am uploading these chapters in bulks in a similar fashion to how the author had initially uploaded them although not exactly the same. After the end of this arc, there was a period of three weeks without any updates. During that time, 
the author stocked all the chapters until chapter 425 and dropped it all at once, and that is what I am going to do as well. Now I didn't want you to wait all that time, and that is why I have been piling up a lot of chapters instead. I believe he'll finish translating them by the coming Sunday Monday so that would be when I upload all the remaining chapters at once. On another note, I have decided on the next novels he'll be translating. The novel, I Killed the Player of the Academy will be uploaded in partnership with Genesis Translations on their website, whereas I will be doing a different novel on this site. They'll talk more on that in an announcement after I post all the main chapters of Kidnapped Dragons. His fingers didn't move. Looking once again at the drop of blood on Giles' neck, he controlled the explosive tension thumping in his heart before turning towards her. For some reason, she did not shoot Joel. She simply continued expressionlessly staring at him, and although it was painful for Eugidi to meet her gaze, he had to. So calm down for the time being. And even though his heart had already been shattered, he needed to maintain his rationality. Although a tremendous sense of betrayal was strangling him by the neck and he was feeling like dying right now. He still wanted to live, and still wanted all the baby dragons to survive. It was funny how even at this point, he was finding Bill M. pretty. Please lower the ballista for now. Let us have a conversation. Why should I? There were a lot of times where you and I, and the kids each hoped for something else. In times like that, you taught me how to talk it out. I learned how to converse from you, and that's what we need. No. There is nothing you can change with just a few words. Buzz. When the manor residing in the ballista increased even more in size, he felt his heart skip a beat. However, she still did not shoot. She had a story that was too stubborn to change with his superficial logic but he had to persuade her. Listen to me a bit more. You won't be suffering any loss. Wasn't your intention to make me suffer as much as possible? Weren't you hoping for my bigger despair? So give me a chance. You can watch me struggle for a way out a little more. What do you think you can do? What can you even do by adding a few more words? I will now persuade you so that you don't kill the kids and ask for your forgiveness. If I haven't persuaded you by the end and if you still can't forgive me, then you can do whatever you want. I will regret more the longer I've been talking for and you will achieve a greater revenge, will you not? She still had an indifferent look on her face. The one holding the gun was her. If she didn't even allow him to do this, then everything was over. Okay. Saying that, she lowered the ballista but that was nothing but an act of formality because the blade of the tentacle could still tear through the baby dragons at any moment. However, Eugidi felt like he had found a strand of solace from the pit of despair. But in return, I will ask you three questions before you persuade me. Three questions? Yes. They are things I've been wanting to ask you. Until the very end, the meticulous Avenger did not let him control the pace of the conversation. All right. You are used to lying. In the same, and your life was also full of deceit but you better be honest for these questions. All right. I get it. He nodded with a desperate heart. Leisurely, she raised her body and walked on the surface of the cold water of the hot spring to slowly approach him. First question. Crossing her arms, she asked. Do you ever feel guilty? Once, there was a time in the past when he thought this guy called God of Fate was standing before his eyes choking his neck, asking him are you still not going to give up? Do you still wish to be happy? Even though he was still feeling the same thing, this time, the guy was saying something slightly different in his head. This was what the God of Fate was saying. Did you think you could turn away from it forever? Putting it that way, he started to consider everything surrounding him in a different light. He killed people. Brutally, and repeatedly. Abduction and imprisonment was his habit. Let alone the baby dragons, he had also abducted other people whenever necessary to imprison them near his eyes. That wasn't the end. He instigated people with deceit, acted for profit, impulsively destroyed things when he got angry and pushed others to the brink of despair because of revenge. Due to his lengthened life, he had more sins than others. Existing in his memories was a thousand years worth of sin. There was a triangle in his heart its name was conscience. Looking back, 
the tips of the triangle were probably sharper than that of other people. Back when the tips were still there, he had to argue for his actions whenever the triangle rolled around prickling his heart. He gave excuses for his actions. This is unfair. It couldn't be helped. I'm not wrong. Who's the one that drove me into this pit? Do you think I wanted this myself? By constantly reminding himself of his position, he escaped from responsibility. It was a fairly decent method. Blaming other people allowed him to stay reasonable. However, when the tips weathered away, he gave up on coming up with excuses. If he was a wiser and a more virtuous person, things might have been different. He would have gained a lot of things without stealing from others and would have become stronger without killing people. In the end, it was because he, the subject of the regression, was such a miserable and lacking person that he had to rely on such a method. After admitting that fact, there was no longer a need to be conscious of it. Sin later became a convenient tool for him. Lastly, when the points were completely worn out into a round circle, he gave up on thinking about it. He turned away from it. He set up the thought that in the end, he'll die as well. And that made it easier for him to look away from his sins. Am I not afraid of punishment? Kill me then. How can a person kill another person? What about it? He'll be dying as well anyway. The thing he considered a tool became his hand by the time he came to himself. Steal if I want something. Kill if they retaliate. It was a simple principle. Going back to the question of do you ever feel guilty? I used to, he replied. The purple pair of eyes frowned in response. Did you feel any guilt when you were killing my mum? No. To be honest, I didn't. Why? For me back then, life was nothing but a struggle for improvement. I was buried in the real world to accomplish my dream I became insensitive to the repeated misdeeds, and I had no leisure to feel any sense of guilt. In the middle of his response, she, after crossing the hot spring, walked all the way up to him. She raised her hand and rested it in the air like how one would ask for the paws of a puppy, and he replied by reaching his hand out. Her tiny hand grabbed onto the tip of his middle finger as his emotions and memories started being completely analyzed by her. Was it not for revenge? There was probably a bit of that too. Because I hated dragons. And yet you still want to let the kids live? That paradox was what led to this situation. The baby dragons taught him how to love even the offspring of his enemies. Yes. She silently stared into his eyes for a while. Her purple gaze did not quiver but the muscles underneath her eyes twitched. Second question. With what mindset can you possibly ask me for my forgiveness? It's very strange. I know you very well. Why don't you do what you always do? Stop doing nonsense and get angry get mad at me and break everything apart. A murderer that can explode at any time despite pretending to suppress your urge isn't that who you are. That indeed was you Gidi, and was only possible because his final destination had always been death. But after retrieving the lost daily life, and as the premise of his death started to crumble, he began feeling guilty over the past moments. Daily life had pushed seemingly insignificant things at his face, and the things he was feeling guilty for also originated from those tiny things. Even at this point, he was only regretting the portion of his sin that was related to what he had done to the baby dragons. No. For him, sin was but a tool a tool that let him gain things outside of his ability. I'm just a person that can do anything to achieve what I want. Even if that means killing someone. Because I wanted to be happy. How selfish. I decided to become a selfish person to lay my lands on the unreachable happiness. But now, that is not the case. Rediscovering daily life and becoming a human was completely unexpected and thus, he also wasn't expecting to retrieve the wickedness and selfishness of a human during that process. Laughably enough, he had even learned how to turn away from the small sin of lying to the baby dragons he wasn't honest and continued telling lies until the end. I will do anything if I can atone for what I did. However, her expression turned ferocious. In the blink of an eye. The mana gathered at the ballista. She pulled the trigger as the arrow flew towards his leg. Along with a roaring thud, his thigh was destroyed. Seeing him still standing despite the flood of pain, 
she collected mana again before shooting it at his other leg. Even though both of his thighs were almost fully crushed, he did not fall down. Without even avoiding or blocking her attack, he accepted her wrath. She appeared a little shaken. It's too late she muttered while breathing coarsely through her nose as her eyes twitched even more. Last question. Her voice was louder than before alongside her heated breath. You created innumerable hatred all because of your petty hope. You are the one that made me. Does someone like you have the right to praise life? Do you have any justification? And her question was also very emotional. She was throwing at his face everything, which he had been escaping and turning away from over the vastly long period of time. She was B.O.M., and was the daughter of the Black Dragon that had been repeatedly killed by his hands. At the same time, she was the portion of sin that increased its size while he was disregarding it throughout his life. While he was turning away from all of his sinful times by just labeling them as unfortunate events, the sin that had been gradually growing in size was now facing him like a colossal wave. Do you even have the right to live? It struck him like a tornado. Standing on top of a tiny boat, he was gazing up at the indescribably immense sin. Does a sinner have the right to live? Do they have the qualification to seek happiness? In response to the question being thrown by the unfathomably enormous hostility, the sinner replied. What else can I do? What? When I still want to live on. An even greater sense of displeasure floated upon her face and her eyes quivered. What was the reply she was hoping for did she want him to plead on his knees? Or be controlled by his fury and wreak havoc? W, what insane thing are you talking about? No. I'm serious. I don't have the right nor the justification. But I still need to survive. You are a cluster of sin that will continue creating more sins throughout your life. There will be more people shedding tears of blood like me. And yet are you saying you still need to live on? You still have to survive. So what? How does that matter when I want to live? I want to live on now. Crazy. I thought you became a little more human, but you were still out of your mind. Saying that, she reprimanded him as he listened with widened eyes. There was nothing wrong with her words. If a sinner did not have the right to live, he should die. However, he will live on. If a sinner shouldn't become happy, then he should be left miserable. But he will become happy. For him, sin had always been a tool a power that made the impossible possible. It was the paddle letting him proceed towards his dream, and was the whip moving him within the hopeless pit of despair. His sin was connected to his struggle in life. Now, he was just going to change the tool he was using a little bit. Thinking about it like that suddenly reminded him of the last words of his precious friend. I had a friend. Her face crumpled unpleasantly. Taking a big step forward, Eugidi walked deeper into the room as she instinctively took a step back. The air shifted his heart that had been trembling in despair gained a strand of blooming courage. There was a friend who constantly told me about the future like you. What are you doing? Don't come any closer. Ignoring her cry, Eugidi approached her. From the three questions, he realized that logically persuading her was impossible. Regardless, he was still going to live and was still going to save the baby dragons. You will. Definitely. Become happy. Even though it was a plan that will definitely fail from one flick of her fingers, he sincerely believed in that small possibility. My friend told me that he'll definitely become happy. I was hoping to die when I heard those words, so I thought those last words would be completed through my death. I warned you. Don't come here. She, who had been constantly stepping back, jumped across the dimension before reappearing behind Joel. It was to threaten him a bit more. The tentacles twitched and tensed up. However, I was not able to die and now I no longer view death as happiness. Then what does this mean? It means that the prediction is still valid. Walking forward with his two crumbling legs, Eugidi bore hope. What does that mean? Doesn't that mean I will live on and definitely become happy in the end? Light bursted out from the dark hail covering him. So Boem. I will become happy through life. She shrieked with a piercing voice. Shut your nonsense. 
Her hands, however, were trembling. No. Drop the ballista. Bjorn. You can't shoot the baby dragons. You think I can't? You should not. You must become happy with me. Do you still not understand after hearing everything I said? It was all fake. Your heart moving towards me, and me pretending to love you they all began from my brainwashing of myself. Can you still not tell everything was fake? And what about that? He roared like a beast. So what if it was a fake relationship that began with an objective in mind? So what if it was a brainwashed love to make me want to live? Were all the meals we shared fake? Or the conversations we whispered? If all the countless concerns we shared while hoping for happiness were all fake, then we would have crumbled already at the face of all those problems. Tell me, which of those was fake? That changed who I am, and made me want to live and breathe. Your deceit led me to truth. You are the one that made me want to live. I was like that, so would you be any different? That was what he wanted to believe in, at the very least. Her eyes widened into circles as Ujidi shouted at her. I will keep my word. I will now give you anything you wish for to atone for what I did. If you need to become the dragon lord of Escalifa for the betterment of your race, then I will help you. If you can't trust me, I will live forever in doubt. That is fine. He shouted to become happy. It was fine no matter what method he used. He had to persuade her, using the same method that persuaded him and turned him away from death. After you complete all those desires, and if I've managed to atone for my sins, if there is even a sliver of a possibility that you forgive me, then bomb. Let us live together. When that time comes. There was a word at the tip of his tongue. It was one he had never conveyed to her before, but was one that he had sincerely hoped for. Even though those moments of the past were before she recalled her actual memories, those shouldn't have been fake they must have been her true feelings. If his existence was in a corner of her heart and if he could change her mind like how she did with his through all the time they spent together. Then it didn't matter even if this wasn't the greatest time to do so. Ujidi ruthlessly used the word that was in his mind. When that day comes. Please marry me. After saying his words, he felt time coming to a freeze. Her face turned stiff and so did her entire body. Her eyes tainted with fluster was quivering and she had trouble putting words together. What? She cut her words off, before screaming with a sharp voice. What utter nonsense are you talking about? The magic arrow in her hand turned larger as the enveloping light turned brighter. The light touching Giles' blue hair started snapping the hairs of the dragon despite simply coming into contact. The water-colored strands of hair were one by one falling to the floor, but he continued shouting. Give me a little bit of time. And give me the opportunity to atone for my sins. When that day comes, promise me our future. Let's have children together. And let's change this relationship which began from our deceit into the truth. Isn't that what you told me yourself? He took a large stride forward, as she stepped back on reflex. His words appeared to have rang her heart in some way or another, and she looked a little frightened. It was evident from how the killing intent oozing out of her body was now so immense that it was suppressing the entire dimension, in spite of the tentacles still not being able to attack the baby dragons. He took another step forward. Ah! She yelled while grabbing her head. Then, she flew up with Joel in her grip. Breaking through the ceiling of the cruise ship, she headed outside. In her dragonite form, she spread her large jet black wings far apart. You bomb! He followed suit with a shout. Even though his crushed and dislocated legs were trying to force him down onto his knees, he chased after her. She flew off to the other side of the outer dimension. Although he could catch up to her if he sped up, he still didn't dare do so because the ballista was in her right hand, while Joel was still hanging under her left hand. The magic arrow shone brightly within the darkness of the outer dimension. And at last, when he saw the stern look on her face as if she had made up her mind. The hope he had been blabbering about till now, rapidly started to be extinguished. Thus, he screamed. Let us live. Even though it might be a life filled with series of hardships, hatred and resentment. 
they would have to be alive to quench those problems, won't they? Live together with me. Bomb. Her hand moved. Time lengthened like cheese. The arrowhead at the tip of the ballista turned brighter. Her face turned fierce like that of a devil. Eugidi screamed. Stop. He wailed. Her finger approached the trigger. And when she slowly began to pull the trigger. He dashed forward like a bolt of lightning. She raised the ballista and pointed it at the head. His eyes ripped open from the unbelievable scenery in front of his eyes it was because she had released Giles' neck. The devilish look was not there anymore. She looked down at him with a hazy look on her face. The head the ballista was pointing at. Was her own. Bium. You bomb. She looked back on her five years of amusement. The plan was a relative success. Hi. Hello. She first met her nemesis. You said you'll never harm me if I listen well. Can you promise that? I promise. As planned, she unconditionally followed him and did everything for him. It was fun. What about you Ajusi? It was good like last time. She slowly opened his heart. What if she wakes up? You didn't know. Joel doesn't wake up easily after falling asleep. And helped him protect his daily life. That's a bad habit. Do you laugh while seeing others in pain or something? Because a juicy never refuses it, I keep giving you more. Since he was a very defensive person. Look. You go further away, when I get closer. She had to be audacious with her approach. Bium. Are you okay? Ah, ah, ah yes. As he was slowly regaining his personality. I'm sorry if that surprised you. I was trying to make it feel like something big was about to happen, but it must have been over the top. And, no I'm really fine. She endlessly threw him new situations and new emotions. Do you find me burdensome, a juicy? No. Or do you see me as a woman? But the outside shell is a female human. So are you embarrassed? At last at the distance of touching breaths. She succeeded in blooming a small flower in his heart. You are the one that wanted to be closer. But this is too close. That had to be the end, B.O.M. thought to herself. She definitely should have stopped there. So, do you want to separate? It was a fake plan. Falling greatly in love for the nemesis and endlessly craving his attention. At last after being loved by the nemesis, and after blindly helping him retrieve the long-lost daily life. She made her nemesis turn from death and wish to live. And by keeping hostage of the lives of the hatchlings that weren't related to her, which was the reason her nemesis was hoping to live. After reproaching him, loathing him, and pressing him. And after he feels a strong sense of guilt. Shoot Joel on her head. That should have been what happened. She should have done all that but. Until the end, she could not pull the trigger at Giles' head. Perhaps, she might have sensed already beforehand that things would turn out like this. In fact, the plan had gone wrong from the beginning. According to plan, she should have shown him the corpses of Yoram and Curl the moment he arrived at the cruise ship, to emphasize what came next. After talking to him and letting him know about her revenge plan and the reason, while he was despairing before her eyes, she was going to kill Joel in front of him to fully etch it into his memories. Because that way, he would forever suffer from the unforgettable memory. Lastly, being either killed or tortured by his hands was the end of her plan. However, she could not do it. Before he came after neutralizing the kids, she sat by herself in deep contemplation. She had to kill them now. She had to kill them now, but... B.O.M. just could not make herself shoot Yoram or Curl, and that hesitation was still there. B.O.M. could not shoot Joel. A deep sigh left her mouth. She felt a strong sense of self-hatred. It was truly, truly stupid. All of this long plan had been formed to shake his heart. However. Perhaps. The long period of time they spent together, and all the moments they shared without any deceit. They might have ended up twisting things out of hand. Do you believe in fate? Me neither. Bium. Even so, you should have done better. 
That's it for the hug of reconciliation. One more minute. Even if it was warm in his embrace, you should have stayed skeptical. You should have known it was dangerous no matter how pretty he found you. How, do I look? You look pretty. Or at least, you should have made these emotions disappear alongside the brainwash. Please embrace me, until I break. All right. Ill love only you. You should have just pretended to love him. Why did you really fall in love? Let us live. Live together with me. Bomb. B.O.M. gave an empty smile. She found her current state hilarious. Please marry me. Even though it was a crude marriage proposal without even a ring. For a moment, it made her heart quiver from insane happiness. Mom. I'm sorry. I made a vow but. B.O.M. released Joel from her grip. He flinched before flying in to receive Joel after which he checked her body to see if there was anything wrong with her. There should be no threats to her life, because B.O.M. didn't do anything to her. After confirming the state of the child, Ujidi stretched his eyes wide open and looked at her. B.O.M. looked back at his eyes for a while before raising her head and staring off into a distance. She gazed into the faint darkness at the outskirts of the outer dimension as the brilliant source of light hanging in her right hand gleamed brighter in comparison. Once again, she gazed down at him with an indifferent pair of eyes. At one point, she was pretty much dead, and her life was just a continuation that had been going on until this moment. However, half of her revenge had failed she just couldn't kill the baby dragons that he cherished above everything else. But living with him was also impossible. Her dead mother and sister would be endlessly revived in her unforgetting memories, and B.O.M. would curse him every time that happened. Because she was still feeling the same despair she had felt at the front of her mother's corpse. There was only one option left for her. Thinking of this as the last moment gave rise to a myriad of thoughts in her mind. Her unforgetting, and thus vivid memories made her forever remember his voice and his love that filled her up to the brim, but the stabbing sword, her mother groaning in pain, her dead sister and all the wounds she had personally inflicted on him on top of that were also unable to be forgotten. When reflecting on all of that, her body relaxed like a marionette that lost its strings. She resolved herself. With a lowered head and unfocused eyes, Bilm thought to herself. If only it wasn't a relationship like this. Even so, she liked it nonetheless the delicious food, the warm shelter. She was nonetheless happy for receiving his attention and love. There were many grateful memories. He called her Spring, a name that was so warm for a dirty kid like her. Hugging Joel, he asked. What are you trying to do? But, we just can't, right? B.O.M. asked herself in a whisper. We've done too many bad things to each other already. Perhaps realizing something from her words. He screamed and yelled her name. Ujidi roared with a voice trembling the outer dimension, that a conclusion like this was not the happiness predicted by that guy. However, Bomb collected her heart while staring into the distance. Because she felt like looking into his eyes would sway her determination, because it could crush the vow she made in front of her mother's corpse. And because, it might make her want to live. She wasn't confident in being as mature as him no matter how many thousands of years she was to live. Unlike him, she wasn't sure she could live while accepting all those sins and hatred. Even so, he was trying to stop her, was accepting her mistakes, and even asked for a marriage. Thinking about that filled her heart with an indescribable sense of guilt. How would it feel, to marry him? What would his child look like? Would they be as cute as him? Drawing the image of a harmonious family in her mind made her want to continue that immoral line of thought. Therefore, she forcibly emptied her brain it was time to say goodbye. While he was sorrowfully shouting and as his thunderous voice was shaking the world, she ended up letting out tears. The magic arrowhead of the ballista, however, was still turning brighter. If only one of us can live. She opened her mouth at the man approaching her with a scream as her broken fong showed up from behind her lips. Bilm whispered. I want you to be happy. This was the outer dimension, and his curse of regression had been undone. Now, there won't be a next life for him either. But if if we do, meet again, in our next life. Then, in a world without scars. 
Then, just one more time, let us. Episode 107 Let Us Love E.N.D. Bill M. pulled the trigger. When the ballista enveloped in light left her hand with a violent twitch of the overflowing mana. Because he had been carrying in his heart the words of his dead friend who said he would definitely become happy because he wasn't expecting something like this to happen in the slightest. And because that was his belief. He was immensely shocked as if he was shot in his head. The arrowhead flew forward as time lengthened like cheese. The tears falling down her cheeks scattered from the oppressive manna and her lips that were still forming a smile quivered faintly. After a little bit of time, he saw the source of that manna coming into contact with a regular pulse. He supported Bomb's body from crumbling down her body hung loose. Her black gaze lost its light. And his world stopped moving. Ever since he became concerned about the fact that his past might be discovered, and when his emotions began falling without the bottom in sight, Ujidi often came across a dark sticky monster crawling at the bottom of his heart. Whenever he was back in his right mind, he was unable to find that thing and he didn't even know how he saw that in the first place. But when he embraced Bomb's unmoving corpse, he saw something like an illusion of his inner world once again. That guy was there there was a monster that was black and gooey, who had a disgusting and poisonous odor. Its liquid body ripped open at the center as the entangled teeth of a human showed itself. That was its mouth. Did you think it would be that easy to become happy? It said to him. You were lying until the very end. And you never repented for the sins you have committed. He started crumbling from sorrow. Never had he wished for a conclusion like this. Were you thinking it would disappear if Noon knew about it? That's why all you had to do was act. Act like nothing happened, as if it was your first time meeting them. He couldn't even find any words to say in response while the black thing continued stabbing his heart with its sharp tongue. Am I wrong? Acting like a father, like a guardian, like a teacher and like a lover. Wearing several masks like that, you pretended like you were treasuring the baby dragons and as if you were wishing for the best of them. Do that and they will be relatively happy on their way back without dying that was what you were thinking, right? That's amazing. Because you did succeed. But you should have ended it there then. The unclean voice of the guy disgustingly echoed with noise. Its squirming body gradually became bigger as another crack appeared at a different part of the now bigger body. A new mouth opened itself. If you wanted to die, then you should have. Another mouth appeared next to that same mouth and spoke to him. How could you dare want to live? How can you hope for a bond with those oblivious children? Even though you are still deceiving them? The body explosively amplified its size alongside a similar increase in the blabbering mouths. Or are you saying it's fine because they don't know it? So you imprisoning countless Yorums disappears into the horizon right? You experimenting with an unborn child becomes non-existent, yes? From two to dozens. Then piercing your sword into a screaming throat because it was noisy and breaking the vocal cords would also disappear right? And how you used a saw to slice apart the skin for a heart experiment? What about all the time you struck the unbreaking bone with a hammer and a chisel? Again, from dozens to hundreds. It now felt as big as a wide room as it covered the entire area from one end to the other end of his vision. That entire room was filled with those disgusting mouths. They all become non-existent. Right? Nothing like that happened in the first place. Because Noon knows about it. All the children that might remember it were all gone because of your regression. And you have something to say if someone reprimands you, don't you? Noon in the world knows about it so what? Yeah. Noon can say anything to me as long as I keep my mouth shut. The last one who had been keeping that a secret died just then. So you'll be able to become happy now, won't you? It's a perfect crime right? Right? NN. Of course that's right. Thousands of words violently raged at him like a storm. Like an erupting volcano, it poured out hatred that tried to bury him like a flood. The world that was filled with rebukes and noises of condemnation suddenly turned quiet as all the mouths stopped moving. Oh no oh. How unfortunate though. The first mouth softly whispered. I know what you did. It suddenly felt like he was buried in a quagmire. 
His world was soon covered with something murky that was filled up to the brim like the ocean, swaying him with each wave. He was floating adrift on a cruise ship. The waves of the quagmire were so tall, the ship rocked up and down immensely as if it would sink any time soon. That was when the sea cracked open and revealed a long mouth. Do you get it now? He used to think its name was guilt. The monster whom he had built up over a long period of time, that he disregarded because Noon knew about it. The goodness that used to exist in his heart in the distant past back when he didn't steal even when he was starving to death back when he wanted to live a dignified life despite not having anything had become a monster like this during all that time. That was what he was thinking. We have no right to be fully happy. It was buried in the dirty quagmire and he couldn't see exactly what it was when he was turning away from it, but now he could see it clearly. Underneath the dark veil inside the ripped mouth was the figure of a person. A young Ujidi was staring at him. So, why don't we put everything down now? Guilt started persuading him. You've worked hard enough already. This is far more than enough. You were always thinking what the best method was right. This is the best we have now. Just make a compromise and focus on what we have. The persuasion was very calm, as if it was consoling a sickly and exhausted patient suffering from leprosy. All you have to do is discard you BOM. It was telling him to carve out the rotten skin. He lowered his head to the deck of the ship. As the dark waves of the quagmire rose up like a tidal wave, a boy walked out from within and laid his hands on top of the head of his despairing self. Let's just get rid of one. Get rid of you BOM, and live happily with the three kids. Just a small compromise and you can become happy. And you can look at your favorite kids all you want. If you need to, you can just deceive them. The three of them have no idea anyway right? How easy and convenient would that be? Eugidi was completely crushed. He could not bear the flood of sorrow. The complete form of happiness that he had been dreaming of needed to have bomb inside. However, Boem cursed yet loved him and killed herself, leaving him with not even a sliver of hope. Eugidi's dream. Had now completely failed. So, let's stop here. We've done enough. Let's stop. Stop. Its voice echoed across. The dark sea of quagmire that had been storming until just then was now tranquil. The subtle silence was pressing him for his choice. It was a life that had been wrongly entangled from the start. Unfortunate memories resurfaced in his mind a life where everything he had wished for were broken time after time. No matter what he did and who he met, everything returned to nothing and he had to spend a long time with nothing left behind in his grasp. After standing at the tip of that point several times, and crumbling several times, his life had continued all the way here. It appeared that the play of despair and hardships was now coming to an end. There was no curtain call the stage was blacked out with everyone hoping for my despair, and as the only one under the spotlight I was on my knees again. Would you watch this and say it is a complete story? Would you be standing up from your seats clapping at my despair? Amidst the silence, Eugidi lifted his head and looked at the boy tearing up while staring at him with a melancholic gaze. It's over. And lowered his head again. He was stuck in a quagmire. Sorrow encroached his heart as lethargy suppressed his entire body. It was finally over with this. You will. Definitely. Become happy. No. He raised his head. Ha. Huh. Immediately after that. He lifted his arm, grabbed the boy by his neck and raised his other arm. His muscles twitched as his steel fist went flying in. Slam. The boy's head was shattered as pieces of flesh and blood scattered to the surroundings. Before long, those fragments gathered back together in the air to reappear in front of him. There was a frown on the boy's face. Eugidi noticed what the thing in front of his eyes was. This was not guilt. Who are you to judge my life? He muttered with a powerless voice. The guy was once again coaxing him into a deceitful life. The deceit that had been pushing him to destruction was once again inciting him using compromise as the excuse. A monster who endlessly tried to put a limit to his capability, that wished to fill his heart with hypocrisy. How could something like that be guilt? The guy sneered. Unlucky. 
The boy was none other than sin itself. I get it now. Ujidi realized what the one and only way out of this situation was. Running into the boy, he grabbed onto the boy's body and immediately smashed him into the deck. Kohuk. Suddenly the sky started roaring with thunder as the tranquil ocean began violently raging again, trying to capsize the ship. The sky which had been bright for a little bit was tainted by darkness again as black rain of poison poured down at him. Kohuk. L, let go. It thundered as filth drenched his body but Ujidi did not let go of his grip. He found one way out. When he was wailing with Bomb's corpse in hand, all the obelisks of emotion had been lit up. After gathering his mind back to one piece from the corrosion of sin, he at last discovered information about that from the darkness. The right to modify providence. Mana was the manifestation of will Ujidi's wish to reject reality had been answered. Ujidi pressed onto the guy's neck, and at the same time, floated the name of the authority he wanted to use in his head. That was when Sin, after realizing what Ujidi was trying to do, shrieked at him. Stop! You stupid fool! That will kill you for sure! Why can you not make a compromise? Why are you standing up for that sinful child who tried to deceive you? He thought to himself. Sin's words were not wrong. Maybe coming to a compromise could be the best option. Give up, and let go he simply had to make a compromise like what it said. Treating BOM as a traitor and protesting that I too was a victim how easy would that be? Even though the result would be a limited happiness, he could choose to continue the relationship by camouflaging it with falsehood. But that was wrong. It was because he had been turning away from the truth like that until now, that he was regretting it at this point. The broken past was not the most important thing. Atoning for his sin must begin from his own choice and he had to be one saving himself. That is why I will not give up the moment he gave up, this aspiration of his would also become fake. I will not let go. I will not make a compromise the moment he came to a compromise, his feelings would be rendered fake. BOM told him that everything had begun from deceit, but he knew that their bond was composed of truth despite having started from falsehood. Him wanting to live together with the baby dragons was the truth, and BOM giving up on revenge was another fact. There was no falsehood or deceit left behind there. You will regret it. Although his thousand-year-long dream of death had crumbled and he at last began dreaming of life, his aspiration for life was one that stemmed from his daily life with the baby dragons. Within that daily life had to be Joel, Curl and Yoram. And there definitely had to be Baum as well. You will definitely die. No. I still believe it. I will become happy. Ujidi clenched his grip even more and pressed even harder onto Sin to kill it while shouting at the damned audience in his heart. This play is not over yet. Because I, wish for happiness. In that instant, the obelisks of emotion responded to his call. The authority activated itself. Conceptualization EX Target Sin. The boy under Ujidi's grip turned once again to something dark. Then, it was analyzed in full detail by his authority. Ujidi's world turned upside down. He sank into his inner world. Things incomprehensible by a human brain flooded in like a wave forming an image in his mind. For him, it was no different from a sealed box. Conceptualization EX. The activated transcendent authority analyzed all of them as the foreign data was turned into things that could be understood by a human. Something resembling a belt appeared in front of his eyes. It was long and thick, and was stretching out into the distance. He instinctively understood that this was providence of time itself. The strange part was that the belt had dozens of smaller strips reaching out of it with a few of them being snapped. The innumerable small strips going along the large one all represented parallel world lines. Three out of those strips were colored in ash. Everything ashen that was interpreted by conceptualization, meant it was linked to Ujidi. One of the ends of the first strip was linked to five years ago and was the point of Ujidi's regression. This was the turning point decided by Vintage Clock. The second strip was connected to 500 years ago, at the non-providential world of primal time. This was the turning point created by an existence that was born with unprecedented talent who could observe the time providence, 
having come out of the non-providential world into the providential world. In other words, it was the moment B.O.M. returned to the providential world to stand in front of her mother's corpse. The last strip was connected all the way to the future. One of the ends of the strip was buried by the white background and he couldn't exactly tell how far this was in the future. The other end of that strip was connected to the time that was a little ahead of the first strip. Even though he didn't know what exactly it was, that was not important for Ujidi. His plan was to head towards the non-providential world of primal time. There, he would stop the sin he had committed with his own hands. A world without a reigning sovereign did not have a name. This was one of the many nameless worlds. Right now it was daytime but there was no atmosphere and the sky was therefore dark. In the distance was a source of light similar to the sun so the surroundings were quite bright but the sky remained black which was quite different from earth. The ground was covered in gravel. There were tall walls on all sides but they were transparent and were made from mana, so at a glance, it looked like it was nothing but gravel all the way to the horizon. This was not an actual world. Like how he interpreted Mayu's origin fragment and the transcendent authority, vintage clock, it was a world substituted into a concept for a better comprehension. In that place, Ujidi appeared similar to a human a human that was a fair amount stronger than others. Here, even the dragons would also look like humans because conceptualization tended to lower the overall power balance. When he turned his eyes to one corner of the vast wasteland, he found a building that did not fit into the background. It had ash-colored walls, ash-colored pillars, and was overall a palace of achromatic colors. The uniquely formed palace reflected the ambient light coming from the light source as it gleamed within the dry and gray desert. That place was Lajayathan's palace. The place where Bioem, Bomb's mother, and the black dragons lived a dragon's nest interpreted by conceptualization. Ujidi now had to head to that place. He was standing still when someone appeared from the other side of the desert at just the right timing, with the clinking sound of metal. It was a protector one of the dragon's pawns. While observing its appearance with care, Ujidi twitched his eyes. This guy looked familiar. It was the same guy that lived at Unit 301 with him. Seems like you are the next private tutor. It spoke to him. For days went by ever since he was led by the restrictive transcendent authority, turning point regression EX to this place. Thanks to the arrangement of the vintage clock, he was able to enter the palace. Entering the palace was simple. Around this point in time, the black dragons had been taking in various mages from the outer dimension to have them become tutors for BOM. That was one of the pedagogies set in place for the accomplishment of the grand schema. In the past four days, Ujidi looked for that original mage and sent him back to where he came from to replace his position. This was what he had been waiting for. Do you have proof of your identification? It's here. That was something he had created as an imitation during the past four days. After checking the mana embedded inside the small jewelry of the necklace Ujidi showed him, the protector gave a nod. Let's go. He followed him into the palace to the location where the event that shook his life from the core would occur at. Hmm, hmm. I'm sure you would have heard from the other protectors already, but you better stay quiet about everything that you see inside as well as the princess. Silently Ujidi returned a nod while the red lights flickered brightly behind the metal helmet. In addition, you need to realize how big of an honor this is. The one you will be teaching henceforth is an unprecedented genius throughout history. Do you know how great her talents are? She has had 35 tutors over the past 10 years. Was it because they were incompetent? Or were they bad teachers? That's not it. Two months and there was no longer anything to learn for our young miss. You teach her one thing and she realizes twelve. Kerarke. Kerk. It laughed with the sound of screeching metal. So, should I give you some advice on that? Don't try to needlessly get too friendly because young miss will find it uncomfortable. She gets fatigued from relationships. Since you must have been a worldly mage in your own world, you would be interested in such an unprecedented genius. But keep that to yourself. Although she would be a genius you'll never see again in your lifetime, for her, you are just one of the many passing tutors. But if you teach with all your heart, then you don't have to worry a single thing about the reward we have promised. Very talkative as always. 
The red eyes of the protector blinked as tiny dots. What? Ujidi shook his head. No nothing. Hmm. Rather than that, I want to hear a little bit more about that young miss. Ah, back when I first saw young miss at the primeval forest. At least the stories were bearable to listen to. Before long, the two of them arrived at the enormous palace. The building looked extremely unique close up. There were no pillars anywhere on the ground and yet the thing that was at the rooftop looked very heavy. After arriving at the entrance of the palace, Ujidi halted for a bit to tidy up his clothes and organized his hair. The protector waited for him to finish. Closing his eyes, Ujidi heaved a deep breath. The black-haired girl who died in front of his eyes was inside this place, living and breathing. He walked into Lujayathan's palace. The palace interpreted by his authority looked exactly the same as a human palace. There was a high ceiling, and everything was very wide. Tall pillars were supporting the structure while the bright light emanating out of the light source outside was scattered by the stained glasses to brighten up the castle. It was very quiet inside the palace. Walking silently, he could even hear the thumping rhythm of his feet. Soon, four extra protectors walked outside to surround Ujidi and the protector. First, we will be greeting Her Majesty of our race. You don't know our etiquette and that is okay, but just do not behave rashly. He nodded back. After walking down the quiet corridor for a while, the protectors soon stopped in front of a large red gate. The moment they opened the doors, a noisy commotion suddenly reached his ears. The chatting voices of male and female, stepping sounds of those dancing and the musics being played by musicians echoed across the room with the heavy thud of percussion being the loudest of them all. It was a banquet hall the largest room of the palace. Stay here for a while. Left with just the protector at the hall, Ujidi pulled out a chair and sat on it before leisurely intertwining his legs. Everyone at the banquet appeared like a black dragon. Due to being interpreted by conceptualization, they looked more human than how they would look with polymorph. A pair of male and female were sharing glasses of alcohol whereas an old lady was dancing in front of the musician. He could also see young kids that were running around. They were probably hatchlings. Out of them, Ujidi found a familiar person. She had black hair and purple eyes. She looked back at him. The temperament shown in her eyes was definitely not that of a normal person after glaring at him, she opened her mouth. What are you looking at? What? Say something. Humph. Seeing that he remained silent, the child turned around with a flick before walking into other adults. It was interesting. Surprisingly, she was Mew. Ha! He was standing still when a maid walked over and handed him a glass of alcohol that was interpreted into a wine. While swirling the wine, he gazed at the scenery of the banquet hall. The owner of this banquet was the chief of the black dragon race, Lujayathan. Here, she was treated like a king. This was not a simple banquet hall either. At the end of the room was a large throne, so it was probably similar to an audience chamber. It seemed that this banquet was planned to promote friendship among the scattered black dragons. Black dragons of this time frame were targeted by many sovereigns and were always at risk, so this banquet appeared to be the gathering place for them. And that was what Ujidi had been targeting during the sixth iteration. Ehe. It's this way. Here. It was then. A girl who had been running while looking behind bashed Ujidi's leg with her elbow. Ot, sorry. Ujidi nodded. The girl started running again with a boy chasing after her. They too were probably hatchlings. It was nothing but peaceful, but this would be where everything takes place. Ujidi calculated the time. In about a few hours, this banquet hall would probably be soaked in blood. Since the conceptual world had been interpreted as a palace, all the important devices must have been also interpreted as unique objects. He didn't have any memories of the time he attacked the palace in the past. Therefore, his job now was to predict how Ujidi of the sixth iteration would attempt to attack this place. How would he move? He looked around with the eyes of a hunter as he scrutinized everything across the banquet hall. Firstly, he looked at Lujayathan's throne. 
the one sitting on that seat would be the chief of the dragon race and would be the first one to gather his attention. The next thing Ujidi turned to were the enormous pillars arranged in a sign that supported this unique building. There was one pillar on each of the four corners of this banquet hall that were distanced by approximately 20 meters. Since these were the pillars that supported the entirety of this palace, he would be actively making use of them, by for example destroying a pillar and escaping this place if he happened to fail an ambush. Lastly, he searched for the entrance of the non-providential world called Primal Time that should be linked to this palace. Eugidi's gaze reached the veil located behind the throne. Because this was a conceptual world, he couldn't really feel the fluctuation of mana properly, but he assumed there would be a path leading to the non-providential world on the other side of the veil. Bom said she saw her mother's death in front of her own eyes. In terms of the structure of this building, it was highly likely for there to be something like a tiny room behind that veil. In addition to that, he also observed the holes on the floor, locations of the chandeliers as well as where the windows were. He predicted where he would come out from and imagined several situations in his mind. His heart felt slightly stifled. Eugidi had been intentionally turning away from his actions because he knew how sinful they were. But now that he was going to atone for it, he couldn't disregard them anymore. He had to see the sin he had committed with his own eyes. And that was a very painful thing to do. Come here. The protectors called him as he followed them towards a small door at the side of the banquet hall. There, Eugidi finally met Lujayathan. She looked the same as other black dragons. She wasn't wearing a crown because she was the king or anything, and was a lady with black hair wearing plain clothes. One interesting thing was that her face looked extremely similar to Bomb's. However, the red gem at where her fong should be when she smiled was different from other dragons. That was his objective. I look forward to your cooperation with the education of my child, O Mage of Badrahom. Eugidi lowered his head a little without saying anything in response. You may enjoy today's banquet as well. Though I am not sure whether it would be as enjoyable for a human. That was the end of the audience. After once again returning to the banquet hall, Eugidi slowly bit into a piece of meat. He pondered about this and that until one doubt appeared in his mind. Oi! Metal plates! He called the protector who was furtively dancing before the musicians. What is wrong? Is the young miss you were talking about not here? Ah, young miss does not like banquets a whole lot. She would still have to come once it does start, but it hasn't begun yet. She is probably resting because of the tiring lessons until now. Is that so? There was not a single reason to hesitate. I'd like to meet her beforehand if possible. He followed the protector out of the banquet hall. Walking down a narrow and dark corridor, they soon came across a room with a faint light. Even though the palace was small, wasn't this still too close? While thinking that, he stopped in his tracks for a bit. He tidied up his clothes and organized his hair again. You seem quite concerned about your appearance for a mage. Stay here. I will come back after asking young miss her opinion. It knocked on the door as a voice echoed from the inside. The protector walked into the room, talked with someone, and soon peeked out of the room with its helmet. She has given her permission. Come in. He closed his eyes. Staying still, he took a deep breath out through his nose. Moving his feet that were stubbornly stuck to the ground, he entered the room through the open door. He saw a bed. On the bed, he also saw a girl. And he also saw innumerable chains going out of the girl's body. One end of the chains was connected into other dimensions while the other ends were locking her body. There were handcuffs on her wrists, shackles on her feet and chains around her thin neck. Even an elephant wouldn't be able to escape from all those chains. She appeared to be about Giles age. Her body was small and her head even smaller. Her entire body was covered with blood and wounds. Underneath the black hair was a powerless expression and black exhausted eyes. Lifting his gaze, he looked into the eyes of the child, as baby Bilem similarly looked back at him. The things binding her hands and feet were chains of hell. Mana was the manifestation of will, and those chains snapped everything including both the body and the mind like a heavy piece of lead. 
Her restricted limbs were flushed and red as if they had gone through several repetitions of being chafed and recovered. Some of them were even bleeding, and the fact that her wounds weren't healed yet meant that baby B.O.M. had been taking a lesson until just then. A lesson. He squinted his eyes. It would have been a lesson that tore through her skin and made her bleed. The young B.O.M. did not look very good. Perhaps because of the exhausting lesson, her fidgety hands appeared unstable as her powerless gaze faintly wavered. Eugidi thought for a while. This part henceforth was the most important part, because he had to leave a favorable impression of himself on baby B.O.M. Are you the new tutor? The same voice as B.O.M., but one that was a bit more childish lethargically left her mouth. Yes. Okay. You can leave now. Things were going south already. I'm a bit tired today. After finishing her words, the young Bill M grabbed onto her blanket as that slight movement rocked the chains. She was clearly telling him to go away. A moment will do. A moment? Let's talk a little bit. It is our first time seeing each other. He didn't know how to make someone fond of himself. Even in the seventh iteration, he had never tried to get close to someone. However, it was a different story if the opponent was bomb. Taking a natural step forward, he headed deeper into her room. My name is Eugidi. Nice to meet you. Without replying to his words, B.O.M. simply showed her discomfort by gesturing at the protector with her gaze. It was fortunate that the protector was bad at reading the mood. Thanks to that, he was able to add a few more sentences. What is your name? Nothing. I don't have one. Isn't it suffocating? Those chains. Looking at your face, you look like someone who doesn't like being tied up. I'm used to it. She gave a curt reply while sending another gaze towards the protector. A sliver of irritation appeared on her exhausted expression. Oi. If you're done greeting her, then. In the past. When the protector tried to pull him out, he stopped it with his hands and continued his words. I had a friend that looked exactly the same as you. She traveled anywhere she wanted to go, met new people and had delicious food. She said it was more boring and meaningless than what she expected. However, the reason traveling is fun is because you come across events that are totally out of your expectation. That was the same for her. She coincidentally met someone. Oi, mage. Don't you hear me telling you to come out? The protector strengthened its grip and this time, it was fairly threatening. Since it would seem strange to hold his ground here, he obediently let it pull him. It was then. And then. Good. She took the bait. What Baum wanted the most was freedom. She wanted freedom so much so that she had gone across the globe by herself despite the strong brainwash of loving Eugidi. It was the same for baby Bioam in front of his eyes. Flicking off the protector's hand, he said to her. It's quite a long story. Baby B.O.M. wasn't fully into it yet. She touched the blanket above her knees with the same lethargic look on her face. It'll chase you out if it's boring. She said while sending a gaze at the protector. Kerarke. Being someone that was bad at reading the mood, the protector did not understand what she meant so the young B.O.M. voiced out her command. You can stay outside. He didn't have much time. There was around five to six hours left until Eugidi of the sixth iteration would show himself. He had to fully gain her favor by then. Something that he definitely had to admit, was that he was slightly weaker than Eugidi of the sixth iteration. If his strength was 100 and if that was the limit of an existence, then he would currently be at around 99. It was because through the events like the fight against Mew and his massacre of the judges, he had permanently used up a portion of the killing intent he had gathered. The difference of one was definitely nothing to scoff at because there were no variables in a fight among transcendent powers. However, he did have an upper hand in one aspect, and that was the difference in information. He knew exactly who Eugidi of the sixth iteration was, as well as how he went into a fight. So to keep that advantage, he had to make sure Eugidi of the sixth iteration wouldn't be able to identify him perfectly at one glance. In order to do so, he needed a great artifact that could deceive Eugidi by allowing him to hide the attributes of his mana and change his external appearance. 
Fortunately, there was a treasure among the black dragon race that perfectly fit the description. Nigh Perfect Truth It was a laughable name. A nigh perfect truth, in the end still meant it was false. In any case, he had to befriend baby B.O.M. and obtain the nigh perfect truth which would probably be at the treasury of the black dragons. That was why he was talking to her about this and that for almost twenty minutes. A novel almost became a movie. What's a movie? It's something similar to a memory crystal. It shows dreamy images that are exactly the same as reality to a lot of people. Do they watch it a lot? They do. Tens of millions of people around the whole world watch them. Millions. Baby B.O.M. tried to envision it in her head but ended up shaking her head. I don't know. That's too big of a number. He then talked about the events that had happened to Bion, which had shaken Bom's heart the most. To the young Bom who was locked in the palace and constantly educated ever since her birth, freedom was like sugar. Her eyes were glistening throughout the story. It's probably not the same here, but usually there are seasons in a dimension. Spring Bom is a season of warm breezes, and blooming flowers. I know what a flower is. Saying that, baby B.O.M. took out a black flower from somewhere and showed it to him. He recognized the flower it was a wyvernip. What flower is that, he asked. It's the sleeping assistant of our race. A sleeping assistant? When it hurts a lot, you can take a deep breath of this and go to sleep at once. Wyvernip had been especially more effective against B.O.M. compared to Curl and Yoram. That was why unlike the two kids that constantly tried to smell the flower, B.O.M. refused to smell it after doing it once because of how potent it was. That seemed to have been another sign that showed B.O.M. was a black dragon. But that flower is only black. It is different from what I'm trying to explain. What do you mean? Flowers are black. I don't think so. This was an opportunity. Thinking that, Ugd stretched his hand out to the young B.O.M. Her tiny eyes deeply stared at his hand as if she was still somewhat disinclined. Hold it. It'll show you the types of flowers I saw. After a short hesitation, the young Bilem carefully took her index finger and placed it gently above his middle finger. Ugd recalled the garden of flowers that he saw on a certain trip with the baby dragons the place where he considered himself as a horrendous sculpture that did not suit the scenery. Flowers of all sorts of colors seeped into the head of baby Bilem. This time, the sugar was a little sweeter it should be as fragrant as a candy. You're right. That's interesting. However, the young bomb's reaction was different from what he expected. Even though it didn't seem like she was being sarcastic, she didn't seem too interested either. He wondered if this was the wrong choice. Thank you. I want to rest a little now, she said while pulling her hand back. Eugenie pondered for a bit before standing up from the ground. Unfortunately, he seemed to have ruined it. It was a shame. Although he was a bad talker, he had organized memories that the young B.O.M. would like after contemplating for four days but. There was nothing else he could do at this point. It wasn't like this was the only opportunity, and he simply had to find the next chance. Thinking that, he lifted the blanket that was around her calves and covered her body. It was an act of habit because that was what he had always done for Joel. But it was then. A slight fluster appeared in the eyes of the young B.O.M. Huh? Why? What did you do just then? I pulled the blanket over you. Why? What do you mean why? It's my blanket though. Why would you do that for me? How distant was she from such normal things? He still wasn't used to it. But that was when he suddenly had this line of thought. When designing her revenge plan, the young B.O.M. had prepared several tools to shake the heart of the enemy. She said there was something she had constantly told herself with a sigh during that process. I had never even contemplated how to appeal to someone before so I'm probably bad at it was what she had been telling herself. Then what about those excessive and proactive approaches B.O.M. had shown him? Maybe that was how she herself would open her heart to someone else. At a glance, it seemed a little over the top but after lingering on that thought, he realized that it was quite plausible. It was similar to how a child would give a candy to an adult as a present. Thus, he decided to conduct a little experiment. 
Why? You said you were going to rest. You look tired anyway so you better take some sleep. What would Bong have done in a situation like this? Bill M. would. But why aren't you using cleanse on yourself before going to sleep? Saying that, Yujidi rested his hand on her small face that turned slightly more perplexed. Come here. B.O.M. stayed still without avoiding his touch so he placed his hand near her eyes. Her head was tiny. When her eyes that were even smaller than that quivered to a close, he softly whispered into her ears while remembering Baum's past voice. It's dirty. At the same time, he gently wiped the clots of blood with his hand. It was a voice that did not suit him, and he felt very repulsed by his own greasy action. He even questioned himself, whether he was doing the right thing or not. What was the young Bilem doing in response? Looking at her eyes, he found perplexity still filling her eyes. This was enough for pulling a move on a kid. What came next? What did Baum used to do after this? Bom tended to check his reaction after teasing him. Did you fall for me? Was her general question because it was a continuation of her tease. However, that was something he just couldn't make himself do. The instinctive repulsion he felt towards it was ridiculous, and was just as big as how he felt when Yoram was trying to make him wear a bunny boy uniform in the past. That was why he thought about her next action. Like how Bill M used to run away after teasing him, he was going to leave as if nothing happened. Rest up. Eugidi stood up and was about to leave the room. Wait. But the voice of the young Bill M halted him in his tracks. Slowly, he turned back to the child as her anxious eyes directly looked into his eyes. Do you want to talk a bit more? It was clearly a sign of curiosity. He felt a faint firework bursting out in his head. The first process of getting close to her was a success. Before that, there is something I have to do. Clink. The young B.O.M. moved her hands as the chains swayed with each of her movements. Crawling on all fours across the bed, the little child headed to the drawer and took out a thick chisel. The sharp tip was forking off like thorns and looked like it would be met with a fair bit of resistance when used. Pretend you didn't see anything. He was curiously looking at her when the little B.O.M. raised the chisel and scraped her hand. Clink. She twitched her hand from pain which was followed by the screeching noise of chains. Eugidi frowned wondering what this kid was doing. However, the young B.O.M. did not stop she stabbed the chisel through her thigh and pierced near her wrist to let it bleed. She was harming herself. It didn't seem like she was immune to pain either. Whenever the tip of the sharp chisel cut through her skin to pour out blood, she squinted her eyes and let out a faint groan. Despite that, the child continued creating wounds here and there before at last raising the chisel and bringing it to her eyes. Girl. Hold on. What is all this about? It's something that has to be done. Don't tell me she was going to stab her own eye with that thing. It was when he was staring at the young B.O.M. with a frown. B.O.M. stabbed her eye with the chisel. This time, she was in especially more pain. Her body convulsed as her fingers curled in. The chains shrieked out loud with each shake of her body and the young B.O.M. released the chisel to surround her eye with her two hands. Blood dripped down her cheeks. Fortunately, a dragon was still a dragon in the interpreted world. Before long, B.O.M. turned towards him with a deeply flushed eye that was somewhat healed. What are you doing? Why did you clean up the blood? I have to go to the hall. I shouldn't look like I'm in a good state. Eugidi couldn't readily understand her words and guessed her intention. Why does your education become more difficult if you have no injuries? Baby Bomb shook her head. The intensity is always the same. It's not that. It's because the adults of our race have expectations of me that shouldn't be betrayed. Expectations. I'm a very important hatchling. They're all waiting for me to become the hero. Finally, Eugidi realized what the young Bill M was saying. An existence that had expectations of everyone else had to be careful for even small actions that may seem trivial at a glance. A little bit of a difference and the one seeing her would either see hope or despair on their own accord. I need to train hard to become a hero. There has to be evidence of my injury if I train hard, so it's better for me if I have bloodstains. 
they will be doubtful if I'm too clean. He once again realized what kind of existence the young Bill M was to the black race. Placing the chisel back into the drawer, she asked. So, are you a mage? For now. You don't look that strong though. Ugd shrugged his shoulders. I do have the right to teach you. Is there a lot to teach? Of course. The young Bill M gazed at him before tucking her hair behind her ears. I usually don't talk with my tutors. Why is that? Usually, you talk to become closer, right? But I'm a very fast learner. I learn quickly and graduate very fast. The tutor gets replaced by another one when I have nothing more to learn. Ugd gave a nod. There were a lot before you too. And none of them were able to go over two or three months. You must be very talented. You have to teach me properly. It'll chase you out immediately if you're useless. Don't be nervous though. And don't be stingy with teaching because of that. Yeah. After saying all that, Baby Bomb closed her mouth. Then, she pondered for a bit before hugging her knees. But, you are a bit different. She muttered. I want you to teach me for a long time. Of course, he said with a nod. Afterwards, he shared some idle banter with the young Bioem. By the way, why don't you wear a hood? The other tutors were all wearing one. Are you perhaps learning something like a spell that lets you befriend dragons? How old are you? Maybe you're younger than me? The young Bioem appeared to have a lot of questions. After starting to talk once, she continued throwing him questions so the conversation was very one-sided. B.O.M. asked, and he replied. B.O.M. would think of the following questions while calmly listening to his response. Although he was still not a master of daily life, he was used to dealing with a child's mood. It was an ability he gained by aligning himself to the emotions of four very different children for five years. Therefore, Baby Bomb felt very comfortable during her conversation with him. It's interesting. I wonder how it would feel, to be free. An abrupt question from her made Ugd realize that the young Bill M had a yearning despair for freedom. At the same time, he realized that this was a small opportunity. That thing on your wrist. This? Clank Bill M shook her wrists. Isn't it uncomfortable? Hmm, well. According to the young BOM, it seemed that those chains connected to the far dimensions through the fissures were there to bind her so that she wouldn't be able to escape from the tremendously painful lessons. I'm not even going to run away though she grumbled. This too was a device that displayed the extent of her curriculum. I'm sick of it. They go super long. I have to be chained wherever I go, and they never come off. Although the ends of the chains looked like they were connected to the wall, it was a dimensional fissure that they were each connected to. Because of that, Baby B.O.M. always had to be accompanied by those chains and those fissures wherever she went, in addition to being restricted from going too far. Can I have a look? Why? He laid his hand on the chains of hell that were connected to the handcuff locking her hands. Since he had been using chains of hell for dozens of years, he was able to untangle and reattach them without leaving any trace behind. Noon got rid of these for you before, have they? N.N. My mum's the one who arranged it so who would dare do that? Chains that had never been untied ever since her birth, that would stay that way for a long time. When Ujidi touched it, a miracle started to happen. The chains were slowly loosened and the handcuff linked to the end of the black chains were separated from her thin wrists. Ha! Huh. Her eyes widened in real time as her body straightened back up. The change in her expression was even more apparent because of the previous exhausted look on her face. Uncontrollable curiosity was in the eyes of the young BOM. H, H, how did you do that? It's a secret. Baby BOM touched her wrists and rubbed the skin which was reddened due to the chains. She then slowly moved her hands up and down. As if she was intrigued by the non-existent chains that should have been swaying, she looked at her light wrists with wide eyes. The young Bill M stole a glance at Ugidi. She looked at her own ankles before turning her gaze back to him. He knew what that expression was. It was the same look Joel had when requesting gummies. It seems those are quite bothersome as well. I've never been to a place I want to go. 
Come here. Really? Yeah. But we can't get caught so just for a while. I know that. She pushed her feet at Ujidi. As expected, because of the shackles that were constantly holding onto her ankles, her skin was always chafed red and was unable to be fully recovered. His hand slowly headed to the ankles of the child as her eyes slowly widened in hope. In her life ever since her birth, she had never been to a place she wanted to go. The restrictions that had been confining her were about to be released by Ujidi's fingers but it was then. Young miss. It is time to go to the banquet hall. Ah, n, n, n. A voice echoed from outside. With a flinch, Bom shouted while glancing at the door. Then, she pushed her wrists forward at him as the voice echoed again from outside, young miss. Bom hurriedly replied, I, I know. I'm going soon. Before whispering to him. Hurry up and tie me again. Please. It was a short escape from reality but that short amount of time was enough to frighten the young BOM. Even though he found her pitiful, he still applied the chains back on her wrists. Now, it was time for that incident to occur. Beneath the dark sky, the land was achromatic despite the shed of light. A man stepped foot on the distorted desert path with deviated time and no sign of life. He had been wandering for a while and at last came across a meaningful building at the end of the desert. Standing quietly, the man indifferently gazed at the building, the palace. It was definitely this smell. It was there. Power had an endogenous origin and in a world interpreted into a concept, that inner origin of power was intensified even more. So although he could sense that someone was nearing the palace, Ujidi could not find any evidence to support his claim. But occasionally looking outside the banquet hall, he felt a peculiar sense of deja vu. There were relatively large stars embroidered on the jet black night sky. Even before the interpretation, the background was probably as dark as this when he was destroying this palace. Say hello. This is my new tutor. In the banquet hall filled with groups of black dragons, BOM took Ujidi and introduced him to her relatives. Ah. Yeah. Hmm. So you're the new tutor. More importantly. The black dragons disregarded Ujidi. Even though baby BOM was emphasizing the introduction as much as possible, they were uninterested because in the eyes of dragons, he was nothing but a petty human. However, the thing called magic became like an archipelago of different cultures across all the dimensions, so they were simply assuming that he must have researched some unique magic. Was our princess working hard today as well? Yes. Look at all this blood. How arduous must it have been? Around that point in time, Ujidi's attention had been shifted away from them. He carefully observed the palace interpreted by conceptualization. In the past, there was a building in Mayu's inner world and there was also one in Vintage Clock's conceptual world. Except for the clock tower, all of them were sloppy and weak buildings. And as for the ground, it used to be as soft and crumbly as cream. The world analyzed by conceptualization was quite feeble in general. However, this place was different. Ujidi tried knocking on the pillar with his fist. Kung Kung. It was tough. Let alone the pillars, the ground and the ceiling were all the same. As if the entire building was made of actual cement, it was very tough. Why is this the case? You don't remember anything, do you? That's always how it is for the assailant. BOM was right. Since he didn't assign much importance to his crimes, he had easily forgotten about those trivial matters. In truth, he couldn't remember anything on whether this palace had a unique power or not. In any case, this building was very tough. It was to the point that if a black dragon was to ram its head into the pillar, it would be the head of the dragon that breaks instead of this building. Even though it was obvious in the real world that the head would be the one breaking when driven into a rocky wall, it was not obvious in the slightest in a world interpreted by conceptualization. Raising his head, he looked at the vast interior of the palace and came to a conclusion. This palace was one huge weapon. Say hi. He's my new tutor. That was when BOM introduced Ujidi to a group of kids. Unlike the adult dragons, the baby dragons waved their hands at him with a smile. Is he a human? 
One of them asked. Yeah. He's a human. Interesting he looks super weak. But it's okay. You'll be safe with us. Right, my mum is super strong you know. Hee <laughs> hee. They chuckled out loud but on the other hand, there was someone who frowned from the introduction. Say hi. She's my little sister, and he's my tutor. What happened? You're introducing someone that's going to disappear soon, Mew jeered. He's probably going to last longer. How funny. Weren't you always hiding the other tutors from me because you didn't want to show them to me? Well that's because you keep on. Whatever. So noisy. Mew showed her tongue before turning around with a flick. Bill M pouted a little. You know what? Ignore her when she talks to you. Why? She keeps on going up to my tutors and acts cute with them, telling them to play with her instead. Back when he didn't know B.O.M. was a black dragon, she told him that she had a doll stolen by her younger sister. The young B.O.M. glared at Mew. However, it didn't seem too serious or anything, and looked like a small strife between kids. Their eyes met when Mew turned around, but Mew flicked her head away with a humph. In response, B.O.M. also scoffed and grumbled in a voice loud enough to reach her. I don't like her. Why? You should be nice to your sister. She's very weird. I don't like her. So don't be too close to her, okay? UGD nodded back. Sure. Until then, the banquet hall looked very peaceful. The ones drinking alcohol in their own groups were peacefully chatting to each other, while the kids were constantly running around everywhere under the pleasant music of the musicians. Their conversations were generally on the continuance and peace of the Black Dragon race. That was what everyone here was hoping for. They hoped for a ray of light to shed their nests that were unfortunately buried in the shadow, and their return to a hopeful life. Meanwhile, Eugidi slowly stood up in nervousness while observing the surroundings. It was about time. Her Majesty is coming in. Before long, Lojiathan came into the banquet hall. Though I may die, I long for our children to be happy at their new shelter. She shared her blessings and raised the glass of alcohol in her hand. Cheers. When the black dragons followed suit by raising their glasses into the air, an odd sound started to reverberate outside the window. Sheik. It was the sound of something striking through the air. The moment he heard the noise, Eugidi confirmed the direction of the sound, the angle, and the time, before embracing baby Bioem and throwing his body under the table. Immediately after that. Kwong. A tremendous explosion came to the banquet hall. A large ember flickered. The thing analyzed as a missile was the cluster of killing intent personally shot by Eugidi of the sixth iteration. There was also the principle of spatial severance embedded inside. A translucent frame of killing intent appeared inside the banquet hall that physically blocked every door and window. The inside was in chaos. Tables went flying and walls were broken. Flames that began from the explosion were scorching the carpet. Some were injured. Children cried in shock while adults shouted with a pale countenance. Eugidi looked at Bioem. Due to her surprise, she was grabbing her chest, anxiously looking around with her widened eyes. Overall, she looked okay. Fortunately, there was noon dead yet because Lojiathan instinctively reacted in time at the moment of the attack to embrace the missile with an alternate dimension. However, that was just the beginning of the attack. Soon, those guys would probably show themselves. If he told them about this beforehand, it would have been possible to stop it from happening. However, there was a reason why Eugidi had to defeat Eugidi of the sixth iteration. Should he escape this place, his plan would definitely end up failing. Not only would he not be able to defeat Eugidi of the sixth iteration due to his lack of strength, after being recognized by him once, he would end up being locked in the circulation of his authority. Regression After desperately begging the white bird, Eugidi of the sixth iteration had earned the ability to use one of Vintage Clock's abilities that shouldn't have been possible. It was the ability to set a starting point of his time regression in an outer dimension with a reigning sovereign, and return to that point with death. This ability to choose the starting point was the greatest weapon contained by Eugidi of the sixth iteration. At the same time, 
it was the one Ujidi was the most cautious of. Soon, black figures appeared behind the window while covering the constellations at the back with their bodies. Humans with wings wielding swords, spears and bows began to break into the palace. Punishment of an Archduke SS This was one of the three authorities Ujidi stole by killing the demon Archduke. It was an authority that became stronger by temporarily taking the power away from the true body. He didn't like it that much and it was thus one he didn't use very often. Even though each of those entities actually gave off a tremendous dignity, they were only interpreted as winged humans in this world. Intruders. Damn it. Flee the kids. In suit, the black dragons took out their weapons and dashed into the fallen angels. Meanwhile, he gazed outside the window at the things approaching from a distance. He had to be ready for Ujidi of the sixth iteration to come in any time. However, it seemed that Ujidi of the sixth iteration wasn't able to come to this place. To be exact, Lujayathan had made the large black barriers even stronger to stop his approach. Great Barrier SS. He squinted his eyes. Off in the distance amidst the darkness, outside the black walls surrounding the palace, he saw a human figure. It was him. What in the world is that thing? Lujayathan uttered a shout while activating the protective barrier. She seemed fairly surprised by the extraordinary strength of her opponent. Is it a sovereign? No your majesty. It's not a sovereign. It was then. A misty cloud of mana explosively appeared behind his right arm. That was probably shapeless sword. Ujidi watched with his eyes squinted. In the distant past, the weak Ujidi needed more tools to defeat his opponents. Because of that, he gradually increased the number of blessings and authorities under his belt. From five, to ten, hundred, five hundred and a thousand. However, even though he was able to use thousands of abilities and authorities, at one point he dropped all those tools and no longer used them. After obtaining one perfect tool, all his other superficial tools became useless. Shapeless Sword SS Fourth Form It was the authority that had crushed the head of the demon Archduke. God Slaying Form A power strong enough to divide the world into two struck down at Lujayathan's great barrier. Qua That ear-splitting roar shook the heavens and the earths. Mana traveled faster than sound and pushed away all the moisture in the air with a white aftershock. Kohak. Lujayathan tightly gripped onto her chest in pain. Our king. Are you alright? I am fine. You hurry up and repel the intruders. Nonetheless, she used to be a sovereign of a world in the past, and was now the chief of a dragon race. Her great barrier was standing strong. Ujidi looked at the guy. Standing in front of the dark dimensional barrier, he was tapping the half-broken dimension with his hand. The enemy wasn't flustered by the unbreakable wall. He was simply contemplating whether he should break this and go in, or go back and restart from the beginning. He would not be able to enter the palace in his first iteration, and things were about to go back in time soon. Ujidi turned his body and looked at the banquet hall. Die. The chaotic room was ruined due to the fight between the fallen angels and the black dragons. In the conceptual world, he could see black flames trying to devour the fallen angels while a spear had followed the sharp wind to stab one of the arms of a black dragon. Screams. Furious shouts. Commands. Tears. It was when Ujidi was looking for the young Bom. What are you doing there? Hurry up and come here. Instead of him, it was she who managed to find him. She had placed a large table sideways and was hiding behind it. He went to her side and lowered his body to find baby Bom healing the wounds of other injured hatchlings. We could not leave the palace. That was to be expected. And it would have been a problem even if they did break it, because breaking the spatial severance would send information about the breaker to him. He was ridiculously thorough when fighting against an enemy. Once he had access to one piece of information, that would snowball in the next iterations and create new variables for Ujidi. N. Nuna. Over there. Your sister is. That was when one of the hatchlings shouted out loud. Sister. Ujidi turned his gaze and found the young Mew who had yet to evacuate properly. 
Although Noon was targeting her as of yet, she appeared to be in a perilous state. W, what should we do? Ill bring her here. B.O.M. was about to dash out on reflex but one of the injured hatchlings held on to its stomach while groaning in pain. H.K.K. There was a broken piece of metal stuck on the child's stomach. Ah. Wait. Saying that, B.O.M. stopped her feet that were about to dash out and focused on healing the child. That was when Eugidi raised his body but the young B.O.M. reacted by grabbing onto his arm with a flinch. Where are you going? Don't move for no reason, and stay here. Her tiny fingers grasping onto his sleeves were shivering. I'm done healing. I'll go. Even though she was frightened, she was still trying to protect him. But her pretense started to crumble when one of the fallen angels started walking towards her. It, it's coming. Stay behind me. Her voice trembled as the enemy drew near. In that instant, Eugidi kneeled next to baby B.O.M. who was tightly holding onto his arm. Girl. Give that sword to me. Come on. Pass it to me. He had set this place as the battlefield due to an unavoidable reason, but that didn't mean he should look away from the needless sacrifices. It was becoming increasingly worse for the dragons. A new command must have been given to the fallen angels kill as many dragons as possible. It meant that he had predicted the failure of this iteration and had entered the process of gathering information. Eugidi was now going to save as many black hatchlings as possible without getting discovered by him, even though it might all be rendered meaningless the moment time traveled back to the past. Jay, just hide here. You'll die if you go there. The fallen angel started walking faster and soon, it was evidently running with them as the target. Shaking his head, he reached out to the sword in her hands. She was still reluctant and held firmly onto the sword as hard as she could, thinking that a mere human wouldn't possibly be able to beat a dragon in strength. That was why. When Eugidi snatched the sword away from her hands all too easily, her eyes widened into circles. I want die. Leaving behind the astonished Bioam, Eugidi carried the sword. Power had an endogenous origin and was not fully revealed until it was consciously used by the user. On the other hand, it would be fully revealed the moment it was used. He slowly unsheathed the sword. Shring. At the same time, his presence and his killing intent rushed out from within as the air turned excruciatingly heavy. Running towards the one who was dashing at him, he went past it with a swing of his sword. In just one strike, the fallen angel lost its head. The head dropped on the ground as blood gushed out from the wound. After killing four fallen angels, he saved baby Mew and brought her to the safe area behind the table, and also sneakily saved a few of the black dragons that were close to dying. That was when Lejiathan suddenly dashed up and took the young Bioam away. It was to be expected, considering how her eyes had constantly been monitoring Bomb the whole time. Lejiathan hid her behind the throne and covered her with the veil. That was the non-providential world of primal time that Bioam had been staying in. Baby Bioam did not try to go in. Only after getting slapped by her mother did she enter it alongside Mew. It was when the fight was reaching the end, when the black dragons had killed almost all of the fallen angels. Suddenly, the world started to slow down. Eugidi opened his eyes with a glare and identified the exact point in time. After slowing down, the world came to a complete stop, before starting to rewind back. The sword was plucked out of the fallen angel that was dead and its body rose back up on its own. Time went backwards through all the chaos and fight, as fragments left each and every part of the banquet hall to gather into a dot. Then, it shattered the window and flew outward. This phenomenon could be explained with one line. Just then, he had killed himself. Turning point regression. He had rewound time through suicide after gathering information about this failed iteration. After being completely wound back, time finally started flowing properly again. He checked the time. The time fixed as the turning point was when Eugidi met the protector. It was right before the start of the banquet, and when the groups of black dragons were sharing light conversations and drinks. Eugidi was the only one who wasn't affected in that room. However, he merged into the shadow with certainty. He headed to the veil behind the throne and walked inside. Baby Bioam was there. 
she wasn't swept away by the reverse time flow either. Seeing Yujidi, her eyes that were trembling from anxiety widened into circles. Why, you? I'm sure you're confused. But you have to come to yourself as soon as possible. We don't have much time in our hands. W, what are you talking about? And what was that thing that just happened? Things henceforth were very important. It took about 5 hours and 30 minutes until the first attack, but the second attack would probably come in about 5 hours. However, Yujidi couldn't fully stop him by himself. He needed the help of the young Biyuan. Listen carefully. Yujidi confessed a lot of things to the young Biyuan. A devil would be breaking in very soon, and the devil's ability is to rewind time. Impossible. There's no way that's possible. She had already received a general education about magic from her mother. She was diligently trying to refute his words using her knowledge as the basis so Yujidi opened the veil and showed her the proof. Baby B.O.M. was frozen stiff. Dragons were in groups happily sharing glasses with each other. The chaotic banquet hall was now nowhere in sight. The young B.O.M. gazed at them with a stupefied look on her face before turning towards him. Then, you. I came here to save you for a reason, and I need your help to deal with this situation. That was what he told her. Her question was justified. Why would you save me? In response, Yujidi almost spouted a lie due to his habit. However, he did not want to lie anymore. It is a bit tough to share the reason. Do you still want to know? Please tell me. It could be quite shocking to you. More so than what you can imagine. But, I think you're a good person. Yeah. Right now, you are seeing me as a good person but when you see these memories, you might be greatly flustered and there's the off chance you will hate me. Do you still want to see them? The young Bilem closed her eyes in thought. You need my help, right? She asked. And there's also a reason why you have to help us. That is also correct. The fact that you came here to save me, means nothing will change without you. It couldn't be changed even with my ability to send memories right. She realized the core point, that nothing would change without Yujidi. It was true because B.O.M. could not change anything by herself despite 170 opportunities. Then it's fine. I won't look at it. Good choice, but can you tell me why? Everything would become a mess if I did start to hate you, right? It was a rational reply. It appeared that she has had this side to her ever since this point in time. But tell me one thing. Which one? If you really have to save me, then there are going to be emotions about me, yes? Please send me those. So that I don't doubt you. That was nothing difficult. He reached his hand out as the young B.O.M. grasped his fingers. Out of the emotions he felt for the adult B.O.M., Yujidi filtered those that were unsuitable for the young child. Romantic feelings, passion and sorrow from her death after excluding all of them, what remained was a pure sense of goodwill. Their innocent yet deep connection that was powerful enough to distort his thousand-year-long dream of death traveled through his fingers into the young B.O.M. Her eyes looking into his eyes widened into circles. Is that okay now? N.N. All right. That's good. We don't have time. Let's chat later when everything's over, and for now, let's talk about what we have to do. Yujidi explained his plan. Firstly, the devil looks very similar to me. But you'll be able to tell who is who by looking at the expression. N.N. The devil's target is your mother. It is to break the core in her fong and obtain her authority. He has the power to reverse time. It is by suicide, and is possible because of a transcendent authority. So there's no way for us to stop the regression itself. Got it. There is both an advantage and disadvantage for us. The advantage is that the devil doesn't know about my existence, and the disadvantage like I said before is that he regresses without an end. Why is that a disadvantage? Through repetitive regressions, the devil learns about the situation. He gets rid of mistakes, takes control over variables and observes the enemy's weak point. Based on that, in the next iteration he gets rid of his mistakes, avoids being pulled around by variables and attacks the weak point. 
so we cannot make even a single mistake. One mistake and that will forever be our weakness. That's a scary ability. Do you understand so far? And then. So, the mistake we can make against that devil, is letting him discover your existence right? Because he will start preparing against you next time. That's right. You're very clever even though it's a difficult concept. Eugidi thought of several images in his brain and sent them to BOM. Now, I want you to get permission from your mother and head to the treasury, and bring me nigh perfect truth. You mean the one that changes your appearance? Is that to hide your identity from the devil? Yeah. And we need to borrow one more treasure on the way. Is there a treasure in the treasury that coerces the movement of your race? Coerces movement? Yeah. Like how all the adults group up and attack when a baby dragon dies. Do you have something similar to that? Hmm. Baby BOM replied while scratching her hair. No. Is that so? Ugd heaved a sigh. This was quite unfortunate, because he wanted to send as many dragons out of the banquet hall as possible before killing Ugd of the sixth iteration at the hall. Because otherwise, they would all be caught up in it. It wasn't like the dragons would listen to him telling them to leave a fair amount of black dragons will die and although he might save Lejiathan and Mew, the countless deaths of her relatives would have a negative impact on the young BOM. He was reluctantly heaving a sigh when she opened her mouth. Actually, there might be one. The method doesn't matter right? In the end, we just have to make everyone move right? Yeah. There was still a serious look on her face. However, she had her head slightly lowered whereas her eyes were faintly gazing up at him. This was an expression Eugidi had seen multiple times before. We have this big treasure, you see. It was when she was feeling mischievous. According to her, there seemed to be a treasure among the black race that should never be broken. It was an artifact that would be used as the final key when accomplishing grand schema in the distant future. Demonic Sword of Grief that was the most important item alongside the young BOM to the Black Dragon race. There is a spell cast on this one, and if it gets stolen, all the dragons have to chase after it. Eugidi gave a hazy smile. That is a great idea. But you see. NN. If there was such a convenient method, there was no way he wouldn't have used it. He could say with certainty that he knew nothing about such an item existing despite 170 attacks on Lejiathan, which in turn meant it was an extraordinary treasure. How would Baby Bomb be able to take out something so incredible? Ah. I have the key. She said while taking a key out of a dimensional storage. This too was beyond his comprehension. Why was Bomb holding the key to such an important treasury? This is not the treasury key. This is for my mum's room. Where did you get that from? She gave it to me. She told me to come to her room anytime, if I feel like dying from the lesson. Bioem said with a calm voice. Adult dragons sometimes fell into a deep slumber and that seemed to be why she was given the key. It was when he was quietly keeping words to himself from how pitiful she was. Then. What do we do after that? She asked. Right. Let me finish the explanation. If we label what we just went through as the first iteration, then the devil will appear in the second iteration. Because he learned how to come inside. Ah. When the devil shows up in the second iteration, I will go up and act like a fairly strong guy to make myself his target. Target? Why? Won't he discover your identity then? I can hide that by changing the basic mana attributes with nigh perfect truth. I will buy some time and later, your mother will retaliate by attacking him back, and he will give up when all the dragons run up to him. Will he die if we all attack him? He will die, but that will be by killing himself. Even though he can run away. A death like that was not much different from a suicide, and would not let them fully kill him. In order to completely get rid of him, they had to put a complete stop to the regression. It's too hard. Think simple. We just have to make him act the way we want to. How? By using a very sweet bait. Is that you? What are you going to do? That's for me to take care of, and you don't need to worry about it. What's important is your role. Okay. 
Baby Bomb quickly understood his words. Her malleable state and easy acceptance of information was probably another important element of her growth for the grand schema. Soon, their strategy meeting came to an end, and the young BOM understood exactly what she had to do. There were now three and a half hours left. Outside, the protector was reporting to Lujayathan that BOM had disappeared. It's about time you went out. It'll be back soon. BOM did just as he expected. In fact, she performed even better than his expectations. It's here. This is nigh perfect truth. Thanks. Ujidi took the mask from the young BOM, placed it over his face and edited a part of his appearance as well as the mana structure. What about demonic sword of grief? You said we will use it in the third iteration right? I checked how to take it without being found out. Ah, uh, and this. What's this? She handed him a necklace. In the middle was a small jar instead of jewelry, inside of which was a dry flower petal. It's a petal of the ever-fragrant flower. It will smell a lot when you open the jar. What's this for? I thought about it on the way to the treasury, and I thought it would be better for you to be more eye-catching to the devil to be a sweet bait. You mean, I should engrave the scent into his brain? He recalled the words B.O.M. had told him in the past. It was that when giving compliments to a young child, he should compliment the result by lowering the threshold of a compliment. But there was no need to even lower the threshold for this. That is a great idea. She nodded back. If you have that smell, the devil will keep targeting you. There was faint concern in her eyes. You don't need to worry. Because I won't die. Even so, she still looked uneasy. You saw me right? I'm quite strong. He reassured her. Yeah. I didn't even know that and. She appeared embarrassed by the fact she said something like how she would throw him away if he was useless. What should I do now? You can go take your sister and other hatchlings outside. They don't have to participate in the banquet anyway. Okay. And then? And then? It might be somewhat cruel, but he had to say it. You need to mentally prepare yourself. Some will get hurt and some might die. A lot more than before. However, the young Bilem bravely returned a nod as if there was nothing scary for her. Don't worry. It came. In the previous iteration, he had sent fallen angels into the initial gap that appeared in the Great Barrier the moment it was bombarded by the missile. That was to scout the area. But this time it was different. Immediately after a large explosion, fallen angels appeared at the banquet hall, and while the black dragons were having a messy fight with the fallen angels, Lujayathan shouted with her dragon voice. Be careful. Her shout shook the entirety of the banquet hall. In that instant, the fallen angels stopped fighting and distanced themselves, as the black dragons also turned their gazes to one place. Like an infection, it made everyone look outside the window. Something was coming. The air was pressing down on them like heavy lead. Those sensing that presence were appalled as the unending flow of killing intent suffocated their lungs and suppressed their pulses. Soon, the figure of a man appeared behind the window that was broken from the missile. Slowly, he showed himself. A tall height, wide shoulders, an indifferent expression and an even more apathetic gaze. Wearing a large coat over his shoulders, Eugidi at last showed himself. In that split moment, his pupils moved. The gaze like that of a beast or a monster scrutinized the banquet hall. Was this how it felt for others to meet his gaze till now? Thinking that, Eugidi squinted his eyes. Even though it was his first time seeing his other self of a parallel timeline, his sharp instincts were violently ringing alarms in his head. Telling him, that he was dangerous. The banquet hall turned mysteriously silent. Mere existences could not raise their voices, just like how a mouse would not growl in front of a lion. Although the fallen angels started running towards them again carrying spears and swords, the dragons could not focus on their enemies. Their minds were on the beast. In the battlefield, the beast moved its gaze. The man saw through the room in one glance, identified the location of his enemy in the distance, as well as how to get there. Before long, he started to move. Heading towards Lujayathan in a straight line, 
the beast lunged forward. S. Stop him. Block him. Several black dragons raised their swords and tried to stop him to protect their leader. There were five of them. In that instant, black aura exploded out of their body. In a world that was not interpreted as a concept, they would have dispelled their polymorph. Even though it was his first collision against them, he did not waste any opportunities. He already identified and remembered most of the black dragon's abilities and their strength from the previous iteration. The man crouched down in the middle of his march. The shapeless sword hanging in his right hand started to increase its size and at last became a large and heavy greatsword reaching at least seven meters in length. Cook. D. Five adult black dragons were running towards him as the man straightened his body back up. Then, he opened his eyes. His body rotated heavily from his tough waist. The trajectory of the enormous shapeless sword swallowed its surroundings like a storm as it reached further out. Quagwagwagwa. The storm of killing intent shredded the bodies of the incoming black dragons. The dragons collapsed in pieces as blood surged out like fountains. I, impossible. What kind of? That overwhelming might frightened the dragons, and halted them in their steps. The mightiest strength of dragons lay in their ridiculous vitality. In the real world, they would have taken at least a few hours to slice to death and yet here, they died in just one strike. That was the difference in strength between him and the dragons that was interpreted by conceptualization EX. Even though it might take some time, there was no way an adult dragon could ever fight against him. How dare you bring a sword into my palace? Infuriated like never before, Lojiathan personally carried her large chain sickle and ran towards him. A chief of a dragon race was on the stronger side even among sovereigns. The chain sickle left a tremendous roar in its path as it attacked the man. Kang! A shockwave was created from their strike, which trembled the banquet hall and shattered several glass ornaments and chandeliers. Meanwhile, Ujidi also opened the necklace and mashed on the ever fragrant flower petal. It was about time to move. Picking up the long sword of a dead dragon, he aimed for his back. What he saw just then was the first iteration. Back then, he would have realized that the sovereign Lojiathan was in this place, and must have been contemplating on how to ambush it. He was able to copy one piece of information or ability when killing, or being killed by someone else. Although it wasn't always fixed, it was generally the power of will that was copied when being killed, and authorities or abilities when killing others. So in this second iteration, he must be thinking of how he should kill Lujiathan to obtain conceptualization. Ujidi knew the method. While Lujiathan was screaming out loud, her left fong inside her mouth faintly vibrated. That was the core carrying Lujiathan's vitality. So it would have taken him 170 fights and massacres to discover that, and completely crush it to obtain conceptualization. However, Ujidi was now going to make the guy focus on him instead. Here. Look at me. With a shout, Ujidi stabbed at his back at a speed that would frighten dragons. Ting. However, he slightly dodged the attack and easily parried the sword. Ujidi widened his eyes as if he was surprised, before fiercely stabbing at the enemy's head again. It felt like the dimension was being sucked into his sword, but it was futile. Ting. Kong. He easily blocked and parried his attack. One stab resulted in a strong aftershock that flew across the banquet hall and destroyed the walls and the sculptures. However, it was useless no matter how strong it was as long as it didn't connect. Next, he swung the shapeless sword down at Ujidi. Kwang. The entire floor of the hall echoed and bounced, creating a gush of wind that rose to the ceiling like a tornado. Ujidi had raised his sword to barely stop the attack, but was now being pushed down onto the ground. In that bout of strength, he suddenly gave a frown. While Ujidi was one-sidedly being pushed down, one of his authorities twitched and the guy had definitely sensed it. It was none other than conceptualization EX. The moment he realized that, the guy glared daggers into Ujidi's eyes. At the same time, the tip of his nose twitched as if trying to remember the scent of ever-fragrant flower. It was to identify Ujidi as the next target. As the fight continued on, Ujidi was gradually pushed back. Kook. 
letting out a groan which he usually would never do, he let his enemy push him. The enemy was indeed monstrously strong. The lowered shapeless sword reached his forehead and began digging into his head from the nose. Blood gushed out of his wound. How dare you turn your back against me? It was then. Flying in like a bolt of lightning, Lejiathan severed one of his legs with the chain sickle. Although blood was erupting out of the clean cut on his thigh, the enemy gave little regard to Lejiathan who was slicing at his body and fixed his gaze on Ujidi. After a lengthened battle, the fallen angels weren't able to deal with the black dragons like the first iteration. In the remaining time, he also refrained from acting rashly and taunted Lejiathan with his stabs. It was a type of experiment, so that things would be easier in the next iteration. Meanwhile, Lejiathan's chain sickle sliced off one of his arms and dug deep into his head. However, he did not die and paid no attention despite stumbling everywhere, as if there was no such emotion as fear. At last when almost all the fallen angels were about to die, he jumped out of the palace. Chase him! Lejiathan furiously shouted. Meanwhile, Ujidi got up and poked his head out of the window. He, who had been constantly pushed back in the fight while screaming in pain, looked completely different. With this, it should have been engraved properly into his head, that an enemy I can beat easily is a holder of a tremendous authority. He gazed outside with the gaze of a beast. Ujidi had commanded the young Bom to stealthily take her sister and the hatchlings out of the banquet hall. Even though that was partially to protect Mew and the hatchlings, it was more because he didn't want baby Bom to see this tragedy. This was very, very important. Just like how the memories of the young Bom crossed through the parallel timeline to reach the adult Bom, all the things she experienced in this parallel timeline created by the Transcendent Authority would all have an effect on the future Bom. If she had a horrendous experience here that was similar to before, Bom might not be able to survive in the original timeline. After the war, when spatial severance was crushed, he heard the clanking noise of chains in the corridor. Baby Bom was hurriedly running back to the banquet hall. The banquet hall was in a mess. It was like a sea of blood and amputated limbs were scattered around everywhere. Their weapons, sculptures protecting the banquet hall, the beautiful chandeliers and artworks were all shattered. Sixteen black dragons had been killed. They were all relatives of the young Bom. Worried, he blocked her vision with his body but as if it was a meaningless concern, she shook her head and replied, I'm okay. Why didn't you wait for them to clean up a bit more? he said to her. I'm used to seeing blood. Despite saying that, she locked her hands as if she didn't want him to see her shivering fingertips. More importantly, your face. Ujidi's face that was drenched in blood due to the wound going down from his forehead to his nose made it feel all the more realistic for Bom. I'm fine. He shook his head. Princess. You cannot stay here. Soon, a protector came and tried to look after Bom but he couldn't allow that to happen. While the dragons were still in a chaos, Ujidi followed after the protector and gave it a knife hand strike to the back of its neck. Taking baby Bom, he took her to the room, primal time, hidden behind the veil behind the throne. This jet-black dimension of the non-providential world, was like Ujidi in Bom's hideout. What happened to the devil? Why isn't he going back in time? Bom asked a question that had been haunting her the whole time. If time didn't go back, then her relatives would all stay dead without coming back to life. He gathered information and now needs time to analyze them. You don't need to worry about it, because time will rewind back for sure. And then. To sum up, the second iteration went according to plan. The guy clearly perceived me. In response to his words, the young Bom suddenly turned her gaze to his chest. I used it. The ever-fragrant flower. Ah, uh, how did it go? It worked out well. He was smelling it and stuff. She nodded back, and looked slightly proud. The next iteration is the most important. Soon when we go back in time, you have to chase all the black dragons out of the banquet hall before he attacks. But, I don't think I can move far because of my handcuffs and shackles. Of course he'll open them for you. And they'll be taking the chains of hell. Ah. Can you do it? The lives of the dragons are all in your hands. 
you must take as many black dragons outside as possible. The child nodded with a stiff look on her face. I can do it. Closing his eyes, he thought for a bit. So far everything was going according to plan. It was almost perfect. At this rate, he would be able to expel him from this place without any problem. It was when he returned to the banquet hall with baby B.O.M. after finishing the strategy meeting. He was met with a variable that was totally out of his expectation. A very annoying variable. Outside, the furious Lejiathan was wailing in front of the corpses of her dead kindred. Shedding tears, she was grasping her heart and the moment she saw B.O.M., she came up and kneeled to hug the small body of her daughter. My dear daughter. Were you surprised? M. Mum. I'm sorry. It's all because your mother is incompetent. My heart is being torn apart. I truly feel like drying. Amuteteron. Liba Mukha. Carlita Poin your mother's brothers and friends, more important than my flesh, have died and yet I do not even know who the killer is. He has nothing to do with me. Until that point in time, Yujidi was looking at the two of them with a myriad of emotions but Lujayathan's next words immediately made him scowl. Have a look. At my memories. Endlessly shedding tears, she sent memories to her daughter how he massacred the black dragons. Seeing that, Yujidi was startled. He almost even ran up and separated Lujayathan from the young Bioem. My daughter. Why do we have to suffer like this? It's because we were expelled from Escalifa. It is because we were discarded by the dragons that we have to deal with such humiliation. There is no shelter for us and noon protects us from danger. That is the miserable state we are in. He felt stifled. The scenery that he was trying his best to hide from her was being conveyed directly to BOM. Do not look away from it. The humiliation we have suffered. My daughter. Do not ever forget what happened today. Vow to yourself. That our children that will be born henceforth, will never have to suffer like this again. Hearing the sobbing voice of her kneeling mother, and seeing the disastrous scenery replay itself vividly in her mind. The young Baum's face turned deathly dark. He cleaned up the corpses. Even though everything would go back to the past with a regression, Yujidi helped baby Bioem clean up the dead bodies. Her fingertips were trembling as she cleaned up the corpses, and there was an absent-minded look on her face. You are. I'm the tutor of the princess. Some dragons were displeased by the existence of a human but they didn't bother telling him off. There were instead some that were surprised because they saw Yujidi step up to protect Lujayathan. It was all going according to his plan, and this was all part of what he had expected. However, what happened just then was completely unexpected. He hadn't expected Lujayathan to grab her daughter in the midst of her dead relatives to send their dying memories. Her obsession with the grand schema was a lot greater than what he had anticipated. But anyway, that wasn't the biggest problem. Stop. You stupid fool. That will kill you for sure. Why can you not make a compromise? Why are you standing up for that sinful child who tried to deceive you? The last shout of sin that told him he would definitely die echoed in his ears. All the atrocities committed by Yujidi of the sixth iteration here were no different from his own past. He felt like someone was pulling out his past which he wanted to hide as much as possible to flaunt it in front of him. It was painful to watch, and was even frightening. You will definitely die. Besides, Sin was perhaps correct. He might really die. He knew that ever since he came up with the plan and in truth, Yujidi long knew how he was doing something very paradoxical and hypocritical. But as a sinner, he was simply hoping for atonement. Won't everything be fine anyway? Won't I, definitely become happy? After cleaning up the corpses, he realized the regression would begin very soon. He hurriedly took the young Bioem away like a kidnapper and headed back to the room behind the throne, primal time. Girl. Are you alright? At last when there was nobody near them, baby bomb crumbled with her two arms wrapped around herself. Girl. And then. Her voice came out normally but her head was lowered and he thus couldn't see the look on her face. Have you calmed down a little? Are you okay? I'm fine. 
I was just, a bit surprised because it was my first time seeing something like that. She was still lowering her head as she dusted off her trembling arms. Was she really okay? Ujidi reiterated the plan while she was sitting there in silence. We don't have much time. The regression will begin very soon. Let's talk about the next iteration. The next time he rewinds everything, I can take responsibility and end his regression and his attacks. You remember what you have to do right? Yes. So before the attack, you have to make it as if the demonic sword of grief had been stolen to get as many dragons away from the banquet hall as possible. Or how about we run away together? Without caring about what happens here. Girl. Ujidi called the child. Perhaps she had been living with so much burden on her shoulders ever since she was tiny, that she was used to saying I'm fine. Pull yourself together first. You don't need to worry too much. They'll all come back to life very soon. Drip. Something started to drop they were her tears. And then. I'm fine. Only then did baby B.O.M. lift her head to look at him. As her head moved, the tears filling her eyes began traveling down her cheeks. She clenched her lips, as those lips were soon tainted in red from the oozing blood. B.O.M. had a tendency to bite her lips out of habit whenever her heart was shaken. H.K.K. This time it was him that had to feel miserable. Baby B.O.M. was having trouble breathing. It was the symptom of hyperventilation that she showed whenever her emotions were out of control. Girl. You have to calm down. H.K.K. Hulk. Calm down. If you crumble here, the same thing will happen in the third iteration. N N N a huck. It was then. Time started to rewind itself. He must have committed suicide after finishing his calculations. Look. HNN. It's all going back. However, it seemed that his words had failed to reach the young BOM. She tightened her heart and continued sobbing. After a while, she raised her head back up with her face no longer being able to hide the signs of tears. I'm scared. Her soft voice spread like ripples. The child who had been acting mature ever since their first encounter was starting to crumble. It's, too scary W, what if I d, do something wrong? She covered her eyes with her palms and started sobbing out loud. There were only approximately five hours left now. Ujidi took a deep breath in. He was in a very big hurry and had a lot of things to do, but the situation didn't allow him to rush the child. It was natural for her to be scared. Even though she had been taking lessons that were close to tortures, B.O.M. in front of his eyes was still just a very feeble and young existence. Baby Bomb stopped her tears. Now wasn't the time to do this and she knew it. S. Sorry. I know we don't have much time but I think I have to calm down a bit. Can you give me some time? After somehow stopping her tears, she asked her tutor. He nodded back as the young B.O.M. pulled the veil slightly to the side and gazed outside. B.O.M. stayed like that for a few minutes with her eyes fixated on the stars outside the opened window. Her tutor curiously asked her. What are you looking at? Stars. Stars? Why? Hmm. The place I get trained directly by my mom also has a window. There are always stars in the sky. Baby B.O.M. collected her breath and continued. Mom told me to look at stars if it was too tiring. She said that's where our homeland is. However, her breath wasn't returning to her. Those astonishing memories surged back up in her mind. The death of the old lady that used to take good care of her and the young man who always gave her deep bows, as well as many others. Her heart started to ache. The pain continued to her fingertips and made them shiver out of control. Tears budded in her eyes again. Even though she wasn't a kid like her sister, she still couldn't hold her tears in. But, I don't think that's very helpful. Since it felt like she would crumble to her knees and weep out loud if she continued breathing, the young B.O.M. held her breath. However, the tears instead formed a lump in her throat without going away. A hand large enough to cover her face landed above her head. She slightly turned around and found the tutor right next to her pointing at the window of the banquet hall. Look closely. 
His finger was pointing at the stars which she had already been looking at. What about that place? It's not that helpful. Despite thinking that, she followed his words and looked at the sky again. There were countless dots of stars in the black space. To baby B.O.M. who wasn't very interested in emotional sceneries, it just looked like sparkling things. You see the big star in the middle. Connect that big star to the big one on the right. That creates a line, yes. Let's connect that to the big star at the bottom, and to the three diagonal ones on the left of that. The young B.O.M. obediently did as she was told. Lastly, let's connect that back to the first big star and have a look. What does that look like? An arrowhead? Arrowhead. I can see that. Baby B.O.M. was a little displeased by his words. Was this like a play for kids? What meaning was there to connecting a few dots and seeing that as a picture? Staring at the stars, her tutor continued. The ones that used to use sorcery in the past connected stars like what we did just then and thought of them as one big picture. It wasn't very meaningful. And then. However, things were different when those weak humans went out to the sea. Ah, uh, do you know what a sea is? I do. They said it's a place with a lot of water. Yeah. Humans can't fly like you dragons, and did not have the technology to find the right direction nor could they use mana. However, they still had to proceed to the sea. It was a technical and not an emotional story. Baby B.O.M. was still young and was distracted fairly easily. Although the astonishing scenery was still glimmering in her mind, she was slightly intrigued by his story. And? Back then, it was impossible to even think about going off into the distance. It was at least better off when they were close enough to see the land, but what would it be like during the night? Saying that, her tutor used those large hands to cover her eyes. Even though she was a little surprised, she stayed still. How is it? Can you see? No. It was probably the same for them. When the sun sets, it becomes very dark and humans have trouble seeing what's ahead of them. They must have been afraid and concerned about whether they were heading down the correct path. The only source of light was in the sky so they would have looked above. And this must have been what those humans saw back then. Her tutor created a small gap between his fingers. What do you see? A part of her vision that had been blocked returned to her. What her eyes spotted was the black sky, stars, and the few stars that shone brighter than others. It had a shape that now seemed obvious after perceiving it once. An arrowhead? Yes. They saw the things that always stayed there to find the direction. Humans call them constellations. Baby B.O.M. widened her eyes. The shape is not important, and it's up to you how you label them. There is no system you just connect them the way you want and accept it. When those trivial dots get grouped into one, they lead a ship to their destination from the darkness, and guide the lost crew back home. She imagined his words in her head as something magical began to happen. Surprisingly, Baby B.O.M. felt her heart being a little more relaxed. He did not rush her and instead, he quietly waited for her to calm down. When she managed to collect her breath, he asked her. Do you remember what you have to do? And then using the demonic sword of grief to take as many of my family out of the banquet hall as possible. Yes. Taking the sword and heading outside the palace is probably the safest method, yes. And then. I think that's what he'll do. All right. After you leave the palace, if you feel too nervous then turn to the sky. If you don't know where to go, run towards the arrowhead. His voice was soft and dry. It was powerless and fatigued. Then no matter how shaken and hopeless it might seem, you will be able to reach your destination. But it nonetheless strongly echoed in her ears. Baby B.O.M. gained courage. After going outside for a bit, B.O.M. took the two treasures, ever fragrant flower and nigh perfect truth and gave it to him. Those were the ones that had disappeared from his body due to the regression. In response, Ujidi got rid of all the chains of hell that were entangling her wrists, ankles and her neck. Off you go. Baby B.O.M. was about to raise her body and go outside, but suddenly stopped and turned around. You are going to be okay, right? There was a scar on his nose that had yet to heal properly. 
He returned a nod. You're not going to die or anything right? Yeah. I won't die. Okay. Don't die. Leaving those words behind, the young Bioem teleported away. The fact that she was able to use a dimensional movement spell even in a world interpreted by conceptualization proved her proficiency at it. It was probably at her mother's level. However, the trace left behind after her movement was very coarse, and it was hardly a skill that could be used with ease. Eugidi stared at the chains of hell that were left on his hands, before pulling them from the dimensional fissures that used to move around with BOM. They were longer than he expected so he had to pull them for a long time. They were long enough to reach her no matter where she was in the palace. After taking those chains, he also lifted his body. There wasn't much time left. He checked the interior design again. This banquet hall which was located at the very center of the large palace had four pillars supporting most of the weight above. He would come in from the second window from southwest, at the bearing of 225. The first missile would be coming in from the same place. The great barrier flowed like an ocean wave and there were constant changes to the hard and soft areas of the barrier. The missile had been fired at the opportune timing after calculating that gap so the attack would always be coming from the same direction at the same time. Since he would be moving based on the memories of the previous iterations, the man would come in without even bothering to check the inside. Because to an existence that forever regressed to the same point in time, there could be zero variables. In turn, the moment he discovers a variable in the iterations, he will begin to doubt everything and be more meticulous with learning the situation. Eugidi took a deep breath out. That was why he had only one opportunity in his hands. It was becoming harder for him to breathe. Since he had always been living a life that had a next time, he was never nervous about anything, but this time around, he couldn't settle his heart. Calmly he waited for the signal. As he was sitting in the corner with his legs crossed gazing at the banquet hall with a hazy pair of eyes. Quang! Lujayathan pushed the door wide open at the other side of the banquet hall and walked inside. Like an angered lioness, she shouted. Our demonic sword of grief has been stolen. Yes. It was here. As soon as she finished her words, 80% of the black dragons in the banquet hall stood up in alarm. W. What? Your Majesty. When was this? Just then. Hurry up and find it no matter the cost. After the shout, she turned around and jumped through the dimension as adult black dragons began leaving the banquet hall like a tide on the ebb. Demonic Sword of Grief was the greatest treasure the black dragons had. Such an item being stolen meant there could be an attack or a systematic infiltration and thus the hatchlings were also guided to a safer area. As such, only the Grandmaster level protectors that guarded the banquet and Lujayathan were left behind at the hall. Who might you be? One of the protectors who had been doubtfully looking at him the whole time came up and asked him. Tutor. He gave a curt reply before standing up. SHRKK. The second signal echoed in his ears, followed by a large explosion. Because there were no dragons here unlike the previous iteration, the commotion created by the attack was nowhere near that. Furniture was broken and glass ornaments were shattered but there were only protectors inside the room. Entering the building with the shapeless sword in hand, he immediately looked for Eugidi. The fallen angels that entered with him halted. As immediately, his gaze changed. Even though he had definitely attacked under the same condition, at the same time at the same place, there were no dragons in this place. Eugidi gave a faint smile. After noticing a variable in the regression, he was about to quickly escape this place. Spatial Severance S. But the escape was made impossible due to Eugidi activating what he had prepared beforehand, as an invisible wave traveled down the walls of the banquet hall. It was obvious that Eugidi could also use the authority which he could use, but he seemed quite flustered as the one on the receiving end of it. Because Spatial Severance was an ability that was gained by hunting a sovereign, his eyes turned ferocious. There would probably be hundreds of hypotheses surging in his mind. Soon, the man opened his mouth. Who are you? Eugidi's fingertips answered his question. Shapeless sword. Grasping on the handle of killing intent, Eugidi dashed in like a lightning bolt. 
their strength had already reached the limit of an existence. Fighting method, manipulation of mana, number of authorities and abilities and their usage all those elements had reached the limit within providence, and they were at a level where learning other things in the world would not result in any increase in their strength. The only difference between them was the possession of conceptualization after killing Lugiathan, and whether they still had all the killing intent or not. Because of that, the fight between the current UGD and UGD of the sixth iteration was that of two killing machines heading to ruin with every variable restricted. They attacked with the shapeless sword. Block and that would increase the duration of the battle, and not blocking would require both of them to sacrifice their flesh. In order to get a bone, one also had to give a bone. His shoulder turned hazy. Following that, the shapeless sword that was now as big as 10 meters drew a perfect line aiming for Ujidi's chest. Even if you were to dodge it, the shapeless sword would immediately change its shape and try to skewer him like a fishing hook. Therefore, Ujidi parried the attack with all his might. Quang! Indescribably enormous killing intents collided as sparks flickered from the strike. Like the crash of two electric chainsaws, excess killing intent bouncing off the strike splattered to the surroundings and scratched the hull. Each and every strike created large claw marks on the floor and walls of the banquet hall, but the overall damage to the weapon-like building wasn't too big. After dozens of clashes that went nowhere, the enemy roared like a beast. Who are you? Without replying, Ujidi simply attacked back. Shapeless Sword SS Second Form he shifted it to the form that crushed the main gates of the demon archduke's castle. Chainsaw form. The killing intent formed into chains followed the blade and began rapidly turning itself. Ujidi jumped through the air in the blink of an eye and aimed at his head. Because of the shout, his reaction speed had been slowed down by a fraction of a fraction of a second. Kigajing. His killing intent was milled. A wound that was seemingly created by a saw was made all the way from the wrist to the shoulder. While bleeding an armful of blood, he attacked back. Shapeless Sword SS Third Form Forked Lightning Form In an instant came thunder. The will to tear something to pieces without stopping at cutting them changed the sword into lightning forks. Like how electricity traveled through the atmosphere looking for the best path, it seeked for the path that would allow a complete destruction of the enemy. They were too close, and it was impossible for Ujidi to avoid it completely. Kajik. One of the lightning bolts struck his shoulder, erupting his muscles, the bone and the flesh. After seemingly seeing that as an opportunity, the man ran in carrying the shapeless aura in his hands that could dare suppress the heavens into a dot. Shapeless Sword SS Fourth Form. It turned into the form that ended the life of the demon archduke in one slash. God Slaying Form. He was trying to bisect the dimension Ujidi was in into two vertical pieces. Ujidi had to raise his sword to stop it but there wasn't enough killing intent. A deafening thud shook both the ground and the air. The leftover killing intent that he couldn't completely block created a cut going down one of his eyes to his cheeks, and also created wounds on his neck, collarbones and his chest. However, his arms were still there and that was more than enough. While his enemy had yet to fully recover his posture, Ujidi gripped onto his neck despite the buckets of blood leaving his body. Kook. Then, he gathered killing intent into his right hand. The remaining killing intent that he still had was about 900. By permanently sacrificing a half of it, Ujidi added immense power to his attack. Shapeless Sword SS Fifth Form Final Form The emotions of innumerable existences that wished to die, to kill, or to end the repetition of life was interpreted into a spear at his hand. That was the final form of his shapeless sword. Punishment. Ujidi stabbed the spear forward aiming at his heart. An exploding aftershock echoed the banquet hall once again as a hole appeared in his chest. It was such an intense attack that it ended up breaking half of the spatial severance as every window inside the room shattered down. An amount of power that should be unable to exist in a world interpreted into a concept reached thousands of meters beyond the boundaries of the palace and shook the world. Cook. There was a large hole in the enemy's chest and his dangling jaws were barely holding on. However, he was still not dead. 
Even though it was an attack that could have killed Lejiathan in one strike which was obvious because Ujidi had permanently consumed his strength for the attack it was still not enough to completely kill him. What are you? Drenched in blood, he shouted but Ujidi remained silent. In a hurry, he grabbed him by the neck and pushed him into the primal time located behind the throne. He tried to retaliate by not going inside, so he kicked him by the head and shoved the man all the way in. It was just to buy some time. After soon recovering himself, the man would crawl out again like a cockroach. Then, Ujidi who had consumed 450 desires to kill would be helplessly slaughtered by him. He knew that, and that was okay. What he needed was this short moment for him to be neutralized. All Ujidi needed was time. He checked the surroundings. Most of the protectors had been defeated by the fallen angels. Taking out the chains of hell from his chest, he began to walk. But suddenly, his feet halted to a stop. Something strange had entered his sight. Why was she here right now? Girl. After stealing demonic sword of grief. Baby B.O.M. realized while running around everywhere that she was surprisingly not that anxious. It might be because her first ever freedom upon leaving the palace just tasted too sweet. Actually, she did feel slightly nervous thinking about being told off after being caught, but she recalled her tutor's advice whenever that happened. Looking at the constellations, she hardened her heart. This was to save her race. Carrying the sword she diligently escaped as her mind calmly ruminated on the situation. The young B.O.M. tilted her head from a strange line of thought that suddenly struck her mind. Her tutor had definitely said that he was weaker than the devil. But didn't he say the loop of regression had to be cut off to completely kill him? Cutting the loop of regression would be done by shoving the enemy into the non-providential world. It would be physically pushing the devil into primal time, but how was he supposed to stop him from coming out considering his lack of strength? She thought of multiple hypotheses but could not come up with anything decent. The best of the best would still be dying together. Thinking of it like that made her heart drop an inch. Even though she had just met him today, she was greatly fond of him and desperately wished he would stay alive. That was when suddenly, the young B.O.M. remembered how her tutor had taken the chains of hell. And also remembered how he had constantly been staring at the pillars of the banquet hall, calculating something. Ah! She felt goosebumps crawling up her skin. Baby B.O.M. realized what her tutor was trying to do. Why in the world are you here? W, where is the devil? He's stuck inside the primal time. Hurry up. Leave. You have too many wounds. Leave. He ferociously roared at her as blood dripped out of all of his wounds. Feeling like she would faint, the young B.O.M. looked into his eyes. I can help you. I learned a lot of magic. I don't need it. Can't you tell? You are helping me by getting away from this place as much as possible. He shouted like there was now a problem in his plan. Baby B.O.M. knew that she would be a hindrance to his plan if his plan was the same as what she had thought of. Everything was a part of his plan so she shouldn't obstruct him, but she just could not leave. You, you are trying to die. It was because she realized her tutor's goal. Why would I die, huh? Why? He yelled back as the child began to cry. Think about it again. If you do that to cut off the devil's timeline, you won't be able to live. How is that related to you? You're also doing this to save me who has nothing to do with you. Bomb. Grabbing her shoulders with his hands soaked in blood, he shouted. Only then did the young B.O.M. realize that the name of herself, whom he had met at a different place was B.O.M. Stay outside. We don't have time. You have to survive and achieve the grand schema of your race, right? But. He grabbed her with the might of a giant. The young B.O.M. just could not retaliate against him as he sat her down on the windowsill that hadn't crumbled down yet. You will die at this rate. For sure. After resolutely shaking his head, her tutor said, no before whispering to her. I will not die. It was the voice of a man who had given up on something but baby B.O.M. couldn't persuade him anymore he pushed her out of the windowsill and blocked the window with spatial severance. While shouting, the child struck the dimensional wall with her fists. 
Yujiri turned around after pulling the curtains over the window. However, because his mind was at a different place, he appeared to have missed the hole in the curtain. Baby Bomb covered her mouth. The moment he turned around, she saw more than ten arrows and blades stuck in his back. Those were the weapons of the fallen angels. Soon, Yujiri moved as she had predicted. Taking out the chains of hell, he started tying them around the large pillars supporting the banquet hall. Please don't do that. As if he couldn't hear her shout, he ignored her and silently surrounded the four pillars with the chains. He then stood at the middle of them all, as his chest caved up from his deep breath. Standing still, he closed his eyes and took a deep breath out. The young Bioem felt goosebumps. His hands started to tremble, as if his determination had been shaken. Please, stop. Yujidi did not want to die anymore. He wanted to live. He wanted to be happy. However, what he was now going to do was unfortunately not much different from the last word Sin had left him. The moment the four pillars supporting all the weight crumbled down, it would destroy the ceiling above the banquet hall. This weapon of a building that could crush a dragon's head according to the interpretation of conceptualization would magnificently cover the primal time, and remain firm until the debris gets removed. Eugidi of the sixth iteration will in fact not die even though he was locked in the non-providential world. Since there was no way Vintage Clock would discard its keeper, he would somehow be returned to the Earth's timeline. Originally, Vintage Clock was very opposed to the idea of Yujidi heading to the outer dimensions, so Yujidi had to stubbornly persuade the White Bird. Even though the White Bird was also extremely against his idea just like the main authority, the bird couldn't help but listen to his request after receiving his fierce temper. Back then, he had fought a lot with the White Bird. Since he was experiencing such a mishap after leaving like that, Yujidi of the sixth iteration would not be able to return to this place ever again. Lujayathan, B.O.M. and Miu would come back to life. It was thus a perfect plan. Except for his own death. Killing intent was creeping out of the veil. He was drawing near. Ever since he came up with the plan to this day, he did not doubt it a single time. He was aware that he would definitely survive and be happy. But now that he was close to the very end, cunningly so, like a human, his heart started to waver. You will regret it. Sin's curse echoed in his ears. You will definitely die. Will I really die like this? He was scared. Eugidi didn't want to die. He wanted to see Joel. If that precious child called him daddy, would he dare be able to call that child my daughter? He wanted to hear Kao's giggling voice. He wanted to see her smile and chuckle that used to brighten up Unit 301, and wanted to buy her more delicious food. He wanted to give Yoram a good present to make up for her hard work. He wanted to teach her how to play with a comfortable heart instead of worrying about fighting all the time. He wanted to draw a happy future with B.O.M. who would soon come back to life. Even if those romantic emotions were to become fake in the new timeline, that was still okay. He simply wanted to live with her. As such thoughts appeared in his mind, he started to hesitate. Even though the enemy was slowly drawing near, his heart started to waver like crazy. The umbrella shared together in those rainy streets, sweet desserts, shared concerns, warmth of touching skins, chuckling voices and crying gasps. Those existences that needed him, and those children that taught him so many things he missed their faces so much, and wanted to live. He wanted to live, do everything he couldn't do and become happy. However, he had to stop his line of thought. Raising his head, he gazed outside the window. While remembering the last words of the white bird that he would definitely become happy, he etched the constellation made by baby Bioem into his eyes. You will. Definitely. Become happy. He. Finally. Pulled his mind back together. Each of his hands gripped onto the chains. He consumed all the leftover desire to kill. Slowly curling his body inward, he pulled the chains. Although the pillars had been weakened from the constant powerful attacks, they still tried to withstand his pull. The pillars were staying still so he clenched even harder. Fallen angels with crushed legs twitched and wriggled, as if they realized what laid in front of them. Those large pillars that looked immovable slowly began to curve. A girl who was watching all that happened sobbed out loud. 
Her small fist struck the severed dimension until they bled. It happened in an instant. The huge pillars slowly started to crumble. As the pillars supporting the weight above wobbled near the ground, the ceiling of the large banquet hall of the palace started to crumble down. Falling down, the large weapon covered everything inside the hall. The big banquet hall was thus reduced to the ground. Great hostility is eradicated. A black dragon that had been straying near the outer dimension slowly began to open her eyes. The power of the restrictive transcendent authority was transmitted over to her, and the parallel timeline where she had killed herself was already long gone. When the memories and information stemming from the modified providence started seeping into her head like a wave. And when all those memories with him were conveyed to her brain. Bill M. crumbled down on the spot. The amusement came to an end. After returning to Escalifa, Jill returned to the region of Blue Dragons. There, Jill came across other adults of the Blue Race. Her relatives asked her about the content of the revelation she received, how she performed with the revelation and then explained the identity of the forefather she met. They asked whether she successfully executed her mission or not. I don't know, Jill gave a curt reply. We're not that curious either. They were also curt. After that, her family gave her a place to live in, and explained how she should live there as well as what she was supposed to do. Protect your territory and prosper, they said but it went through one ear and out the other, because Joel had no plans of living here for a long time in the first place. She was only thinking about quickly turning twenty and going back to meet Eugidi. That was why the adults of her race felt like very strange outsiders. Some of them introduced themselves as acquaintances of her parents and sent memories of her parents, but Joel skimmed through them. Oh so it's them that was the end of her impression because her true family was somewhere else. Phew. When she was finally left alone after sending the adults of her race back, Joel scanned across her nest. It was decorated nicely. Leaving the house, she could see her nest the icy cave that had fancy ornaments. Staying here relaxed her heart and it was a relatively good place to stay in. Until going back, that was. Five years old. Joel was nearing the end of her fifth year in life. Hello. She called the protectors that were closing their eyes in wait at the corner of the nest. Among them was also a wise goblin wearing a monocle. Jill asked them to find a way to return to the alternate dimension of Earth, and told them to have a look at the dimensional cruise because there should be traces left behind on it. I understand. My lord. After sending them off, Jill thought to herself. She was five years old. There were still fifteen years left until she turned twenty. Fifteen years. Fifteen years. For Joel, fifteen years was a very long time. The amount of time she had lived for was already fairly long, so how was she supposed to wait for another fifteen years? Ewing. Wait. What if I find a way to go back to Earth before that? Like, if I find that when I'm seven, do I have to intentionally wait for thirteen years? Joel was confused. She was obediently staying still because there was no way to return yet, but would she be able to make herself stay even after finding the way back? Her eyes became wide open. That's no good. Joel used her brain. Fortunately, hatchlings generally shed their skin again when they were around 10 to 20 years old. That was when they entered puberty as a hatchling. After shedding her skin, Joel would look similar to how Yoram and Curl looked when they first met Eugidi. She should look a bit more mature. It should be fine to simply say she was twenty. Kohihi. While giggling, Joel leaned on the soft bed. Whatever the case, she wanted to quickly find a way to go back. Thinking that, she decided to wait. She waited for one day. That day, Joel stayed on the bed the whole day and went through her past memories. Thinking of Unit 301 where Eugidi would be at, she recalled the piggy bank and the large fish tank in her room. It should be fine right? That fish tank was amazing. At night, Joel got up for dinner. And upon realizing that there was no kitchen, she laid back down on the bed. Same thing happened the next morning. She got up to head to the kitchen as a habit and halted her feet. There must be something wrong with the nest. How could there be no kitchen? Thus, she ordered the protectors to make a kitchen. 
A kitchen fitting that of an Escalifan aristocrat was soon created but it looked very strange in Giles' eyes. Where's the microwave? A micro, wave, is it? Ah. After some thought, Joel decided to create the best kitchen she could make. She ordered them to make every single thing that was in her head. That night, they managed to make something that although sloppy resembled the kitchen in Unit 301. But she was so engrossed in making one that she belatedly realized the obvious. What she needed wasn't a kitchen. Joel spent the night sitting by herself on a chair. She waited for a week. From time to time, blue dragons came looking for her but she didn't really like that either. Even though she could feel them treasuring her, Joel couldn't help but think of them as strangers. This is no good. Muttering that to herself, Joel stood up from the bed. Although lying down on the bed and going through her memories was good, it was time to go outside and do something. Joel was a hatchling and as a hatchling of the blue race, she was able to cross the boundaries of other dragon races by using revelation as the excuse. If someone said something to her, she could say, I'm here for my revelation. There was no Unit 301 now. But if she talked with her unis, wouldn't that fill her empty heart a little? Thinking that, Joel left her nest with a backpack to see her other sisters. I'm sorry, but my child is busy right now. However, she was forced to stop in front of Cowell's mother. A dragon as tall as the sky said while looking down at her. Her lesson as a guardian deity has begun. It is the most important part of education to us, and she will be ruling over a small village of gnomes now. Can I talk to her a little? Sorry. I'll contact you when the lesson is over. Okay. In the end, Joel couldn't meet Curl. The next week, she wanted to meet Yoram but this time, she was restricted by the adult blue dragons that were protecting the boundary connecting to the red race. Child. You cannot go any further than this. I have a friend there. Ah, so you're Kuna's daughter that recently went on an amusement with a red dragon right? Even so, you can't. Cross the border and those barbaric red dragons will attack you. Can I see her for a bit? She's precious to me. That was when another adult dragon bellowed at her. Girl. Stop saying nonsense and go back. How can anyone of the red race be precious? They are nothing but disgusting and nauseating pieces of trash. EY. Calm down. Joel replied with a pout. You don't even know anything. This brat. Go back right now. Unless you want a big scolding. After being told off, Joel empty-handedly returned to her nest. She wasn't even able to go near Bilem. Going around everywhere, Joel asked how to head to the territory of green dragons, but none of the adults replied to her. She met all sorts of dragons during her search, and even met a male adult blue dragon who had married a green dragon in the past. However, even he didn't tell her how to get to the green dragon's territory. Oh yeah, by the way, things are not looking too good on that end right? Dejectedly she was walking back when someone opened their mouth. Did you hear that too? Seriously, I guess it was unavoidable. Those lunatics. Staying quiet for 20,000 years was, I guess, fairly patient for them. Blankly standing there, Joel widened her eyes. Lunatics. 20,000 years. Did something happen? Joel was lending a close ear when an adult who had just woken up from a long hibernation asked a question. What is this about? You know, the Quans. That name was something Joel knew about. Quan was the martial race that dragons detested. They were the monsters of Escalifa who used weapons and spells with six arms. They were a race that could live for thousands of years, and there was a long history of strife between Quans and dragons. Their hatred was mutual. TCH TCH. They're doing this because the old lord is about to die soon. That's why we should have wiped them out with Karl Galakwas when we were cleaning up the ancient forest, so that those insects stop acting up. It's all because of that. I heard a few of the green dragons were killed, right? Joel felt her heart sink. There was war happening in Bomb's territory. NN. Why are you still here? One of the dragons asked Joel who couldn't help but ask with concern. Is it dangerous? 
for the green dragons. Very dangerous. It's probably going to be the biggest war in the history of green dragons. But the dragon lord is probably going to do something about it. On the way back, Joel panted out of worry for Bioem. In the end, without being able to meet any of them, she had no choice but to wait by herself. She waited for a month. The protectors were unable to find the way back to Earth. Joel waited for three months. The protectors were still unable to find the way back to Earth. One of them even told her that there was no record of such a thing happening in the history of blue dragons. Joel couldn't believe it. Then. I think you would have to see a black dragon, but I believe that would also be difficult. Not only are we on bad terms with them, they are also hard to find in Escalifa. That can't be. Even after waiting for another six months, she could not find a solution. A year went by. Joel could not find a way to return. That was why she started looking for a method herself. No matter what cost and no matter who she had to meet, she searched for the method. She needed to study in order to view the complicated records and understand them, so Joel began learning magic. However, the protectors were not wrong. After waiting for three years and earning enough knowledge, Joel went through the library of blue dragons, the Akashic records, and the countless technique preservation devices including memory crystals, but could not find any information on the equipment required to return to Earth, or anything about their coordinates. She didn't even know where to begin. She had to cross an ocean. And yet the only things recorded down were a canoe and tiny paddles. Even so, Joel did not give up on studying. Five years went by. Joel could not find anything. Seven years went by. Joel wanted to become an adult. She wanted to quickly be acknowledged as an adult by her race, and wanted to confidently gloss over it with Eugidi upon going back, that she was already twenty. That desire affected her mana and her heart. Because mana was the manifestation of will, Joel felt her heart ache all of a sudden. Since she didn't have parents, she had to alert the elders of her race but Joel did not do so. She simply went into the depths of the icy cave and closed the door. It was her second time shedding skin. It hurt just like before, and Joel had to suffer from the pain by herself for a whole week. Was it okay to hurt this much? Feeling her body crumbling down to pieces, Joel panted for breath. Thinking of how it would become even more painful after a few hours frightened her tremendously. Stuck in a crystal of ice, Joel thought to herself. She remembered the large fingers that she gripped onto when her body was in a lot of pain. She also recalled the slow shiratori she did with the owner of those fingers. Gorilla. Anaconda. Anaconda. I already did it. Anaconda. Hi hi. She wanted to see him again. Fifteen years went by. She turned twenty as she had promised. But Joel was unable to return home. Fifty years went by. The large planet was under a blizzard. In the world filled with cold hails and endlessly stacking piles of snow. The blue-haired girl sitting on a large tree turned her gaze towards the sky. Staring at the three moons in the sky, she heaved a small sigh. Joel still could not find the way to return to Earth. Two hundred years went by. Usually dragons from five hundred to one thousand years old were treated as adults, so Joel was considered a hatchling even though she had already lived for almost three hundred years. And every hatchling had to leave on at least two amusements. Unlike how other hatchlings tried to leave on as many amusements as possible, Joel did not want to leave and had been postponing it over and over again. But after delaying it for centuries, she was at last visited by the chief of the blue dragon race who came and scolded her. Telling her to experience the world immediately, the chief ordered her to complete her second revelation. Joel ran her fingers through her long blue hair. She did not need to experience the world. She didn't get a second revelation. Instead of saying that in return, she replied to the infuriated chief. In a certain dimension close to Escalifa, in the lands of a certain kingdom was a small village near the lake. Walking up the slope, instead of the pathway, of a mountain full of precarious-looking cliffs was a half-destroyed four-legged machine. Its spinning cogs clickered with the sound of rubbing metal. That was a cleaning machine, which would have been cleaning the streets of a city until recently. 
Now, it was just a stupid machine swinging a piece of wood in the air. The dustpan had been scorched and its body was half destroyed by the explosion. The device that changed sunlight to electricity was still working and that was how the machine was able to crawl into the mountain away from the city. That should be the case. Staring at the machine from a distance, a young boy thought to himself. A few months ago, there had been a war against a nearby village. Cannonballs were flying everywhere and the burnt smell of gunpowder was persistent. He had to watch his house burn down to the ground with his own eyes, and walking outside he had found the clock tower, the pride of their village, broken down to the ground. Guns were noisy and bullets took the lives of his family. A lot of his friends had disappeared and were unable to be spotted again. At the end of the war, the twelve-year-old young boy had to become an adult. It was because he had a younger brother who was three years younger than himself. Gijik, Gijigik. That was why finding that piece of scrap metal was a very big fortune for him. If he took off the power system on the head of that scrap metal and handed it over to the junk shop, he would be able to get about 50 roots. With 50 roots he would be able to get medicine for his brother who was suffering from a stomachache and fill their bellies for the next two weeks. Buzz. It was then. The boy widened his eyes. He didn't know when he was looking at it from a distance, but now that he was close enough to see it properly, he could see it sparking near the power system. No wonder. There was no way he would be this lucky. It was impossible that Noon had discovered it till now. Stories about people that were greatly injured by getting electrified by a machine flashed past the boy's head. One of them was the grandpa next door who couldn't move his legs and limped all the time. Even so, the boy couldn't go back. He remembered his brother who was suffering in the back alleyway using a sack as a blanket. During the war, the nearby village had used sorcery on them. It was his fault for feeding him a fish that was lying dead in a polluted lake just because he was pestering that he was hungry. He heard a long time ago how cooking for a long time could get rid of poison but it was stupid of him to do such a thing. His sense of guilt became bigger. The boy looked at the machine it was a chance which would never come again and he couldn't run away from it. Fifty roots. In front of his eyes were fifty roots. Picking up a piece of stick, the boy lifted his body and vigorously rushed into the machine. Buzz. He felt a bomb exploding in his body, and the boy fell unconscious. When he came to himself, he was in a certain building. Opening his eyes, the boy glanced around and saw two tables and four chairs. Overall, it was a small and quiet building. This is. That was when he felt a scorching burn in his hand. Suddenly remembering the thing that just happened, the boy looked down at his hand in surprise but. Surprisingly, it was very normal unlike what he thought. It seemed that the burning heat had just been an illusion. Tap, tap, tap. That was when he heard a tapping noise from nearby as a salty, savory and oily smell scraped past his nose. Gulp. The boy couldn't help but salivate because he hadn't eaten anything all day. What was this smell? Carefully, the boy raised his body and looked at where the smell was coming from. There was a woman. Mysteriously, her hair had the same color as the ocean. She looked around fifteen or twenty. The woman was cutting something on the chopping board with a knife. Seeing her, the boy flinched. She was the infamous Blue Witch. The lady who one day built a small restaurant at the end of the village and sold food. Even though she was exceptionally beautiful, she almost never talked and had a somewhat scary atmosphere that deterred people away. It seemed that he was at the restaurant of that blue witch. Was I abducted? By the witch? Remembering the rumors about the witch, the boy was rolling his eyes when she turned around and looked at him. The moment he saw her expressionless face, he felt breathless from her dazzling beauty. Did you wake up? A voice clearer than his expectation left her mouth. It was a pure voice that was mind-numbingly nice to listen to. S, sorry. Ah. The boy was flustered. Wasn't which a bad word? Should I call her Nuna? More importantly, why am I here? It was when he was thinking to himself. Come. Her voice had a mysterious power inside. The boy carefully stood up, approached the table and unknowingly sat on the chair. 
All of his previous thoughts became meaningless because of the astonishing smell coming out of the dish in her hands. The blue witch handed that over to the boy alongside a spoon. Here you go. Even if it had poison, this smell was just unbearable raising the spoon, the boy began eating. The soup was dense and rich with flavor. There was a bunch of something underneath all the rice, and surprisingly, it was all meat. Meat. A salty taste and an oily fragrance. All of those merged in harmony to give off a flavor which was so fantastic that it almost made him faint. The boy absent-mindedly emptied the bowl, without even realizing that the roof of his mouth was all grazed. Quietly, the blue witch remained sitting on the chair looking at him. Could she even be called a witch at this point? Thank you. He carefully conveyed his gratitude as she returned a simple nod and took the bowl away from him. You finished it. Ah, um, it was very delicious so. But I d, don't have money sorry. Is that so? I'm sorry. But I won't go like this. Is there anything you want me to do? I can clean, and I can gather firewood. You don't need to. The woman gazed down at the boy. Once, there was a heavily drunk man who came in and asked for food. She remembered how she was met with the muzzle of a gun instead of money after making food for him. Because that was just how things were in this era, she just punched him a few times and chased him out. More importantly, why were you hurt? Sorry. Ah, um I was trying to do something but I made a mistake. She was silent. The boy thought that she must be a quiet type just like the rumors. It was a bit scary when she was silent but she didn't seem like a bad person so he tried speaking a little more. Um I think I heard some wrong rumors. Nuna, you are not a witch right? I'm not. Ah then do you know me by any chance? Really? I go to the village sometimes. Didn't you have a brother? Yes. My brother. Brother? He felt the distant sense of reality creeping down on his skin as the boy suddenly felt goosebumps. How long has it been? What happened to his brother? I, he'll be on my way then. The boy ran out of the restaurant as if he was being chased by something. Soon, the woman walked out of the store. Pulling the small chair that was nearby, she sat down, twisted her legs and gazed at the back of the running boy. There existed an era, which fatigued and injured a lot more people than usual. Innocent people tended to be hurt even more during those times. Just like that boy. The woman Joel blankly sat there in place. Since she was a blue dragon living an amusement to follow the revelation given to her, her second amusement without any revelation was an extremely boring one. The first amusement tended to be focused on enjoyable memories, whereas the second amusement was focused on having various experiences. She already had plenty of enjoyable experiences. The most joyous and happy first experiences were already filling her brain, and was more than enough to last her entire lifetime. In this amusement which she had been forced out to, Joel thought that she should spend time by herself instead of adding any meaningless experiences to the mix. That was why she had created a random restaurant at a place people wouldn't visit, and was living a half-hearted life while giving average food. So her role was over when she gave food to the boy who was lying unconscious in the mountain. People like him were fairly common in this world after all. He'll be all right by himself. Muttering that to herself, Joel stood up and returned to the restaurant. It was indeed a heartbreaking thing. Murder and robbery was very common near here, and there were also those that deliberately chose kids for human trafficking. Thinking about that did put her in a bad mood. But whatever it was, it had nothing to do with her. There was no reason for her to needlessly be sympathetic to them. Thinking that, Joel laid down on the bed. It had been a while since the last time she worked, so it was now time to take a little rest. Slowly, her eyes came to a close. However, she couldn't sleep for long. Later if you see a child that needs your help. It was because someone's voice suddenly rang in her ears. Uck, uck. His breath was turning more and more rapid, and his dark sunken eyes looked even darker today. The boy shook the body of his younger brother and called him by his name. There was a bottle of water that he had scooped up from a fresh puddle of water on the way here. Lifting the bottle, 
he poured the water into the mouth of his younger brother, who spilled half of that precious water. Normally he would have told him off but today, he was grateful that he was even having half of it. Hyung. That was when his younger brother opened his mouth. Huh. Yeah. In here. I, want candies. In spite of the situation, he was saying he wanted to eat something, even though he was like this because of food. But who was it that fed him? The boy suppressed his tears and opened his mouth. Do you know how expensive candies are, you idiot? Candies I want candies. Pestering won't get you anywhere all right. That's super expensive, and they only sell it at the village chief store. You know that too. HKK, candies. Candies. His brother sang candies. That's stupid candy. Candies were ridiculously expensive. Each of them cost five roots. With five roots, they could buy plenty of corn batter or potatoes for them to enjoy for at least two days. There was no way he would have that much money. Candy's huck. But seeing his brother who cried without any tears due to dehydration, the boy remembered something. That cleaning machine. Even though he failed last time, wouldn't it work if he was a little further this time when taking out that power system? His knees wobbled even now when thinking about how it felt to be electrocuted. It felt like his entire body had been struck with a large club but there was no way he could buy candies without that. His hesitation didn't last very long, because his brother's voice that was singing candies was becoming fainter over time. The boy opened his mouth in fright. Oi. Oi. I'm gonna head outside again, okay? I'll go buy some candies. Do you have money? Don't worry. I buried some under a tree in the mountain, alright? It shouldn't take that long. So you. You stay here without moving a single inch until I buy some candies from the chief's house. Okay. Yes sir. His brother suddenly stopped crying. He then replied clearly as if he had never been sick the whole time. He was showing off that he managed to obtain what he wanted. In times like this, the boy used to flick his brother's forehead but today, he couldn't do so. Seriously. Acting smart and stuff. His younger brother powerlessly smiled, thinking that his act must have been a success. Not knowing that his chin was shivering from lack of nutrition. It began with him taking off the power supply system worth 50 roots from the machine. Using a long wooden stick that was as long as a pole, he ran up and smacked the robot on its head. Hitting it once wasn't enough he hadn't eaten much and was thus very weak. Even he found it strange during his sprint how his body was so slow. Even so, the boy tried again and this time, he felt the stick pierce through something along with a thud. But he screamed immediately after that. The friction had caused splinters from the wooden stick to stab through his palms. Regardless, the boy managed to separate the power supply system after many twists and turns. On one side of the device which was the size of his palm was a panel that absorbed sunlight. Despite stopping its operation, the panel still glinted under the sunlight. The boy gave a bright smile. That bright panel appeared like the future ahead of him. However, he perhaps shouldn't have cried in pain from the splinters. Someone appeared from the other side of the bush. It was a man with a face full of beard. An adult. The moment their eyes met, the boy quickly turned around and hurriedly walked down the mountain while hiding the device behind his clothes. His heart began to thump. After the war, adults became a very dangerous existence to all the boys and girls left behind at the village. He had to go to the village chief's house as quickly as possible. Everything would be solved the moment he arrived at the chief's house. The boy was walking down the mountain with that thought in mind, while also pretending to have not noticed the adult following from behind, but that was when the sound coming from behind him fluttered his heart. He could hear rapid rustling noises of grass the adult was walking faster and faster. Therefore, the boy walked even faster. At this point, although he was still not running, it was evident that he was in a hurry. Wondering if they were just coincidentally walking down the same path, the boy slightly deviated from the main pathway. He knew everything about the mountain because this had been his playground ever since he was young. In front of him there would soon be a steep slope, below which was the village and the village chief's house. 
he walked while holding his breath. Soon, he slightly turned back to have a look and was suddenly met with a pair of eyes that were right in front of his face. At the same time, a roaring voice entered his ears. Hey! Startled, the boy threw his body down the slope. He rolled and his chin ended up hitting boulders at times but was still able to move after opening his eyes. The village chief's house was right there. I'm alive. Joel walked. Although she rarely ever went down to the village apart from shopping, her feet were in a hurry this time. A strange ominous feeling was hitting her heart. When facing something that they were trying to look away from, people tended to become more rushed the longer they had been turning away from it. Her feet were as light as a breeze but she was faster than a sprinting beast. After arriving at the village, she went through her memories. The place the boy and his younger brother was always at was an inhabited alleyway far from the center of the village. She knew exactly where it was and there was nothing stopping her feet. But when she got there, she couldn't see the older boy. The younger boy was lying down gasping for breath as if he was about to stop breathing any time soon. Joel kneeled in front of him and closed her eyes. She then used the healing mana of a dragon to cure his body. Then, she took out the porridge she had prepared before coming here and sent it down the boy's throat. He ate it quite well as if he liked the taste. Soon, the boy came to himself. W, who are you? Where is your brother? Sorry. Where is your older brother? The boy looked nervous. After being pestered by Joel, he reluctantly opened his mouth. He's probably at the village chief's house. Joel blinked her eyes. Then, she repeatedly swept her hair with her fingers and sighed. Why did he go there? To buy candies because I said I wanted to have candies. Candies? Yes. It was very painful, but I suddenly thought of candies, so he went to the chief's house. A deeper sigh left her mouth. Like I said, why? Her ominous feeling became reality. The chief's entire family died in the war. Uh. The boy widened his eyes. The village chief's house was like heaven to the boys because his wife was a proficient baker who made and sold snacks. But today, it looked different. The signboard at the front was turned off. That was understandable because electricity was now a very precious resource. However, being met with six menacing adults after opening the door was completely unexpected. Hume. Who the hell is that? It was even more unexpected to see those swords and axes next to the moy. Grab that kid. Ah, uh, Huck. Startled, the boy turned around and tried to run away. He was so nervous that he couldn't even utter a scream. No you don't. Someone threw a sickle that dug into his leg. Huck. The boy fell on the ground with a scream. His skin was ripped as blood oozed out. Drenched in fear, the boy tried to raise his body but his efforts were in vain his legs failed him. Even so, the boy managed to stand up with a stagger and took out the sickle that was digging into his leg. Despite bursting into tears, he shouted. D, don't come here. Don't come. It'll kill you all. Swinging the sickle left and right, the boy threatened them. That was when someone suddenly appeared from behind, grabbed onto his wrist and wrapped a tough arm around his neck. Kook. The sickle dropped from his hand as he instinctively realized that it was the man who had been chasing after him in the mountain. Bring him in. Yes sir. Well done buddy. I would have been happy with a rabbit, and yet look what you brought for us. What should we do with him? Is that even a question? His face looks pretty neat. Wash him clean and take him to Baron Collison. To that fat old man again. Who else? He gives the most money. Anyway you go wash him nicely and make him into a teddy bear. He knew what a teddy bear was. It was making a person into a toy for those perverted nobles by cutting off the knees and elbows. He had retched so much when he first heard it because of how disgusting it was. Was that going to happen to him? A loud warning alarm dizzied his brain. Feeling stifled, the boy closed his eyes and struggled. L, let go. As soon as he was able to breathe again, he shouted as loud as he could. 
The man behind him released his hand and covered his mouth as if he was finding it noisy, as the boy instinctively bit down on the closest finger. Uck. The hand was removed from his mouth but it was not a good sign. This little rat. His ears picked up the enraged voice as he had to gasp for breath again. Holding on to the boy's hair, the man turned his body around and his fist as big as a rock turned solid. The man raised his shoulder with fury written all over his face. The boy had to close his eyes from the immense sense of fear. It was then. Clomp. A soft sound echoed across. It sounded like a footstep. The man's body froze stiff as the boy also stopped retaliating. The footsteps echoed yet again as they turned their gazes to look at the source of the sound. Underneath the long watercolored hair. They saw eyes bluer than the hair. Clomp. The blue witch showed herself. In front of the aura of a mature dragon, the men holding weapons were nothing but insects. W, who are you? shouted a courageous one. Even though he was looking at a girl smaller than himself, he thought he was in front of a large statue. When she turned her gaze towards him, he thought a sculpture was turning its head in front of his eyes. I'm asking you who you. His breath stopped in the middle as if a huge fist had gone down his throat. Who do you think you are? Her voice that sounded clear in the past was different this time. The air settled with a chill. Looking at the ripped leg of the boy, she opened her mouth. Who are you to do this to a kid? Her voice was cold enough to pierce through one's skin. Without listening to their response, she drew a magic circle on the ground. Chalk. Hundreds of ice thorns soared up and stabbed through all the human traffickers in that place. It happened in an instant. Some were pierced multiple times in their stomach, some had holes in their head while some were skewered all the way from their ankles to their stomachs. However, not a single scream was heard. Because they had all died in the blink of an eye. After that, Joel took the two boys to a nearby territory. Making a connection with the lord of that territory was nothing difficult. Everything she had learned throughout her life was from Ujidi, so she followed his method. She took a small treasure and handed it over to the noble. Give these kids a house to live in. The noble was frightened by how all of his trusted soldiers had immediately fainted, but realized how great the treasure was and accepted her request. Like that, the kids gained a house and a housekeeper. There will be a day off for the housekeeper, so you can come play. Saying that, Jill returned to the mountain where her restaurant was. For the next ten years, until the boys became young men, they came to the mountain restaurant every weekend and ate the food Joel made for them. We are here, Miss Benefactor. Welcome. The boy who used to be twelve years old, met a partner at seventeen and got married. From a point in time, he began visiting her with his wife. In addition, the younger boy who was nine years old grew so tall that he was now bigger than his older brother. He used to love candies in the past and was now even operating a candy store. Something interesting happened. The belly of the wife kept increasing in size and next year, the number of people visiting her increased from three to four. Can you please give her a name? It would be a great honor to receive her name from you, benefactor. Joel turned them down. Parents should be the one naming the child. Even though the boy who was now an adult himself was disappointed by it, Joel remained firm. That was when his wife cutely came up and handed her the baby, asking her to carry and bless the child. It's okay. Please. Don't say that. In the end, Joel had to receive the tiny baby that was wrapped in a blanket. That little baby looked up at her with its squinted eyes. Seeing that, Joel felt a very deep and intense emotion. Joel aligned her forehead with the baby's. She then blessed the child, hoping for a healthy and happy future. Just like what someone had done to her in the distant past. Her amusement came to an end. The boy who used to be twelve was now thirty. He wasn't a boy at this point. They were now full-fledged adults and even their children looked to be around the same age as Joel. It was unknown how they noticed it but on the night Joel was about to leave, the two families came to her and bid farewell. She lightly returned the greeting, and told them to stay safe. Benefactor. Thank you for everything you've done. The boy, 
who was now obviously an adult with that thick beard, gave a deep bow to Joel with budding tears. Before you leave, there is something I would like to ask. What is it? Before, we were puzzled and sometimes we thought it was natural. However as we turned older, we realized that was not the case. It was something I had been wanting to ask the whole time, but couldn't dare ask you. About what? Why were you so nice, benefactor, to us two dirty brothers? The boy solemnly asked a question. Joel blinked her eyes because she hadn't been expecting to be asked such a thing. After a short silence, she opened her mouth. When I was young. Lifting her head, she looked at the sky. Her sapphire eyes glistened under the moonlight. There was someone who did the same to me. He gave me delicious food, a warm bed, and treasured me without wishing for anything in return. Reminiscing in those memories made her delightful, yet bitterly homesick. Joel whispered as if she was in a dream. He said he had a similar benefactor when he was young. And there was something he requested of me. There was a gift that once began as an encouragement to life. That was conveyed down from a certain middle-aged woman to Ujidi and from Ujidi down to Joel. Later if you see a child that needs your help. Help them out at least once. And now it was Giles' turn. Her gift had been conveyed down to these boys. In the future, if you see children suffering from hunger and pain. Then please be nice to them without asking for anything in return. They replied with falling tears. We will etch it into our souls. The gift will continue being shared down. Into the distant future, to children Joel did not know of. Come here. My babby. Crow gave a bright smile. Today was a special day. N.N. Uni. It was because Joel came to visit her. Curl ordered the protectors of her large palace-like nest for her favorite dishes. She told them to make all the things that she used to ask for over the past 300 years. Although not perfect, the table was filled with dishes from Earth specifically the ones they had usually eaten at Unit 301. Braised pork, instant noodles, dumplings, burgers, fried chicken, pizza, red velvet cake they looked slightly different from the ones in their memories but it was nonetheless true that staring at the food was enough to make them smile. On top of that, they prepared some fairly strong alcohol. Clink. Curl and Joel clinked their glasses. How was your amusement this time? Joel blankly looked back at Cowell's face which was exactly the same as how she looked when they first met. Even though all the good moments were living and breathing forever in her memories, she still needed someone to share them. For Joel, Curl was that kind of person. Well, just. She briefly explained what happened as Curl listened carefully with her eyes forming circles. I see. That's what happened. I guess that would have brought back a lot of memories for you. Clink. They bumped their glasses again. Joel bitterly stared at her glass before pouring the alcohol down her throat. I haven't found a way to go back yet. Ah. Yun. Actually, I don't even know if it exists anymore. It might be impossible. Joel, do you still want to go back? She took another sip. With her head tilted down and her chin resting on her hand, Joel swirled the leftover alcohol inside her glass. Her next words dug deep into Cowell's heart. We were, really happy back then. Curl nodded. Yes. They were happy. So happy that it was now bitter. We had no idea how priceless it was to live without any worries. Yun. Sorry. It became depressing for no reason. It's fine. I think the same. The two of them stayed silent for a while. Ah, by the way Uni, have you heard anything about you Yoram? Yun. How is she these days? Noon tells me anything no matter who I ask. Curl laughed. That makes sense. Yum Yoramani needs to have a big fight against her oldest Uni. You mean the selection ceremony? Un. That thing. But that oldest Uni or whoever, is apparently still sleeping. Sleeping for 300 years is quite long. Yeah. I looked into it because I was curious. It seemed she was enlightened or something before Yoramani came back and entered a deep sleep. She won't lose right. 
there was a faint concern embedded in Giles' question. The red race only kept one entity per generation. This was the choice of the red race to nurture the best warriors with their limited amount of resources. And that was the purpose of the selection ceremony. The loser will die just like Yoram's youngest Uni. Ah, of course she won't. Is that even supposed to be a question? Joel took another sip. And, the money. She tried to change the topic but this made her heart even more uncomfortable. The war of green dragons after 20,000 years of peace and the assault of a warring race. Close to 10 green dragons had been killed during the war and it seemed that 30% of their territory had been destroyed alongside the lives of countless organisms. Joel turned teary. Although Curl and Yoram considered BOM as a friend, it was slightly different for Joel. There was a more delicate link between the two. She had been with BOM ever since she opened her eyes. They slept in the same room every day and woke up together in the morning. She learned how to speak from BOM, and all of her precious first experiences had always been accompanied by BOM. That was why for Joel, BOM was like another UGD. Her green race was at risk right now, but the blue dragons that liked keeping to themselves were unwilling to help the green dragons. Actually, Joel. There is this rumor that I heard which was quite difficult to believe. A rumor? Curl hesitated for a bit before adding more words. You know how the sacred territory of the green race had been taken recently, right? Ah, uh, NN. Ruin Peninsula right. Thinking about that still gives me chills. That place was the birthplace of the current dragon lord, and was considered by the green race as their capital. I heard they succeeded in recapturing that place. Really? But there was something strange about that. What is it? Curl continued speaking despite still finding it unbelievable herself, wondering whether it was even possible. Apparently, it was a hatchling that was in charge of the operation. They continued drinking. After talking about their two worrisome friends came a topic which the two of them had been consciously avoiding till now. I miss Earth so much. Completely drunk, Joel said with drops of tears dripping from her eyes as Curl gave her a hug. Since she could completely understand Giles' feelings and was also thinking of something similar every day herself, Curl could not dare try to console her. Do you think we can go back to that time? And that was something which Curl had also been desperately wishing for. At the end of their drinking party, Joel dropped a statement like a bomb before going back home. I'm going to sleep for a while. For how long? Maybe a thousand years. That was the end. Curl sent her off and gazed outside the window all by herself. Outside the window, it was pouring. It was a night that called for an umbrella. Curl returned to her place. A guardian deity could not leave for long. Inside the territory of gold dragons was a village of a race called gnomes. These gnomes were fairies of the ground that were as small as a palm. They were a lot smaller than dwarves, could move freely underground, and they lived by forming a village. On the outside, they looked very cute. Because they were fairies, they were all cute regardless of their gender and age. Their head was a third of their total height, they were tiny but had deep and shiny eyes. Hellu. Miss Guardian Deity. Hellu. Miss Guardian Deity. The little ones jumped up and down and welcomed her as she smiled, hee hee and held on to their small hands. Curl was living as the guardian deity of these gnomes as part of her lesson from her mother in preparation for her eventual reign in the human world. You're doing very well, my daughter. Her mother once said to her. I wasn't expecting you to do it so well. Actually I was quite worried. Ewing. You were worried? Of course I was. My daughter, because you are incomparably more delicate than other dragons. Curl blinked her eyes. You're always worried about a reed breaking from a small breeze and feeling hurt from a cautious stroke, aren't you? Kids who think like that are delicate but at the same time it's easy for them to feel hurt. Unlike her concerns, Curl was growing exceptionally well. No matter how I see it, your first amusement is very suspicious. Her mother asked Curl with a warm smile. How long are you going to keep it a secret from mum? Yun, it's a secret. That makes me sad. Coming back, 
she had promised with others that they would keep the amusement with Yujidi all to themselves without telling anyone else. However, no matter how well she was performing, there was no way that protecting someone would be easy. Simply protecting them from external attacks was not difficult, but stopping the problems that came up within gnomes was difficult. In the grand scheme of things, fairies weren't very different from humans. They needed to trust, they needed their hearts to be put at ease and needed food. At times, they needed clothes that would make them either warm or cool, and needed a private shelter to rest in. That was already difficult but that wasn't the end. They needed a workplace, education and also needed help with enjoying their appropriate hobby life. And as such, strife was inevitable as their living standards improved and as their ideologies broadened, because there were always limited resources. Whose land is this, and whose flower is this? The gnomes were always bickering about such topics whenever they had time. Curl had to spend a lot of time to calm them down. During all that, she started to realize wholeheartedly. That raising someone responsibly was an extremely difficult thing to do. It was when she was living as a guardian deity. One gnome became pregnant and got a big belly. Despite usually giving birth to at most two, there were four babies in the belly of the pregnant gnome. Curl looked after her with utmost care. A few months went by and four babies were born. It was the birth of many lives. Curl looked at the adorable baby gnomes that were the size of a thumb. They were a quadruplet and looked very much alike. However, a problem slowly started to appear as the baby gnomes grew up over time. The three other gnomes were living fine but there was one specific gnome who started acting strange. He looked very dangerous, and even threatened his brothers in front of food by raising a small pebble with his hands. It was cute when he was young but it no longer looked like a prank as he got older. What is wrong, child? Yun. Don't do that. He didn't stop there. His antisocial side turned even worse over time. He would snap others' flowers for no reason while walking next to it, and even stole a leaf from a nearby gnome. Child. What are you doing? Curl was flustered because he ignored her even when she asked him. She had never heard of such an audacious entity existing among the gnomes. She asked her mother but was told to do it her way instead of being taught a method. In the gnome society, he was soon labeled as a problem child and after a conference, they decided to teach him a lesson. It was futile. He immediately raised a stone and threatened them when another gnome approached him, and if they came in groups, he would suddenly smack his own head with the rock. That act of self-injury was in fact very threatening. They couldn't kill their kindred so the other gnomes had to give up on educating him. Instead, they repeatedly went to Curl and appealed to her. They requested her to please do something about him. For Curl it was a very difficult task. Why was that one kid doing such a thing even though everyone else was living fine? Curl could not understand what was going on with him. One of the gnomes asked her to put him in quarantine forever, but Curl decided to be prudent with her judgment. Simply abandoning him didn't seem like the right solution. She constantly tried speaking to him. She gave him food and even gave unique presents to persuade him. However, none of that worked on the gnome. Ah whatever. Why is it only me? Seeing him locked in the underground prison due to another mistake, Curl heaved a deep sigh. She felt slightly irritated in the depths of her heart. What was wrong with him? However, Curl settled her irritation. She felt depressed. It was as if she was speaking to someone who had their eyes closed and ears clogged. Was there even a solution to a problem like this? Maybe it's correct to just punish them the way she wanted to. But, that wouldn't be what a right guardian would do. Perhaps due to her recent conversation with Joel, a question butted in Cowell's mind. What would a Jussie have done in a situation like this? That one spark of thought was like a trigger. After that, Curl thought of him whenever something gave her a hard time. If it was a juicy. If it was Eugidi. Thinking about it like that, Curl started to see the state of this ill-tempered gnome as similar to that of her own. And Eugidi trying desperately to make sure she wasn't hurt in a world full of hatred, was also similar to what she was doing right now. In fact, guardians weren't machines and they were also people. They were just another living being who had more things to be responsible for. 
If a child cried on repeat, the mother would feel tired. A father might feel annoyed by a child who constantly whines and gets mad. Some parents might get emotionally upset with their kids. That was the state Curl was in right now. Gnomes had been in disharmony for a few years by now and she was feeling annoyed by a lot of things. But what about a juicy? What did Ujidi do? Closing her eyes, she looked back and remembered how she had been whining like crazy every day. I'm so stupid. Why is there nothing good about me? You also think I'm pathetic, right? At times she reproached herself. I think I just can't. Maybe someone like me should just stop. That's just what I am I'm sorry it turned out like this even though you were trying to help. And sometimes she was about to give up. Although that might have been an honest expression of her feelings for Curl back then, it must have been very painful for the one listening. Despite that, Eugidi had never gotten mad at her imperfection. Even though he definitely should have felt annoyed on the inside as a human, he had never shown even a sliver of it on his face. Now, Curl knew how extremely, extremely amazing that was. That day, on the way back home after finishing her work as a guardian deity, Curl stopped in the middle of a street. She started to realize the kind of love he had given her during the most unstable times of her life. Her heart was aching. At the same time, Eugidi's actions became an indicator for Curl. Like how he had protected me, I should also be able to protect someone thinking about it that way gave her courage. Soon, she turned her feet and returned to the village of gnomes. She called the challenging gnome and quietly talked to him. I wonder who put our little boy in a bad mood. Her words were a lot more cautious than before. Do you mind telling me? The size of the umbrella had to fit the size of the person. What was important was matching herself as a guardian to the ward. It was just like how Eugidi, who at a glance was extremely different from her, tried as much as possible to align himself to her. Whatever. They're making me upset. The gnome exploded in rage at the beginning, so Kirk carefully raised him into her arms. You were upset, hun. I see. She wasn't just coaxing and calming the child. Instead she was starting a conversation. Who was it? Who did it? Her soft voice started flowing into the firmly shut steel gates of the gnome. Kobeing. Kobeing did ITT. She keeps telling me to stay still. Kobeing was the name of his mother. Why did Kobeing tell you to stay still? I don't know. It's weird. She always leaves in the morning, so I wanted to go with her. She takes everyone else but not me. Egu Egu. I see. Curl tapped the gnome on his back. It seemed that he had been wanting to leave with his mother but was refused because she couldn't bring the most renowned problem child of the village outside with her. In the end, it appeared that the problematic gnome just wanted to spend time with his mother. Strangely enough, after dropping her prejudice, thinking of the gnome as another person and deciding to calmly talk it out with him, she realized that the solution was quite simple. You wanted to leave with your mother in the morning, right? I don't want to. She never takes me with her. Do you think your mother hates you? Yes. Kobeing hates me. I hate Kobeing too. Let's go talk to her. Un un. Why? Are you scared to do it by yourself? Then he'll come with you. Let's go together and tell her what you think. Something remarkable happened after that. The problem gnome sloppily expressed his honest thoughts while looking away from his mother's eyes, and the mother who had been feeling exhausted due to the temperamental actions of the child was also shaken. In that place was an apology and a forgiveness. The next day, the two of them went outside early in the morning. It was a success. Aya. That's pretty good. Not bad, my dear daughter. Curl hopped up and down after bragging about it to her mother. That wasn't the end of everything though. Due to all the time that went by, the crack had been deepened and the improvement in his relationship with his mother was just one of the problems that had to be addressed. What was fortunate was that the problem gnome always came to Curl and prayed to her whenever there was a challenge in his life. Curl had to listen to his story and empathize with him whenever the gnome was feeling challenged. And when he was feeling better, she also had to suggest a solution. 
At a glance, that seemed like an ideal relationship between a guardian and a ward, but on the other hand, Curl felt slightly fatigued over time. There were in fact almost 500 gnomes living in the village, and there were quite a few of them who complained about their hardships in life. She was already feeling tired with how everything was and now there was one child who leaned on her every day, so Kul had to firmly hold her ground. The issue was in her personality of deeply immersing herself into others' problems. She was sincerely upset when others were angry, and sincerely sad when they were sad. When it was frustrating, she felt suffocating as if there were dozens of potatoes blocking her throat. All of that added to the lassitude she was feeling in her heart. Once, her legs even lost power on her way back from the village. However, Curl had to persist. Curl knew that it would be the end for both the baby gnome and the village the moment she faltered. She also remembered his back when Yujidi was trying to leave the house after feeling crushed for some reason, as well as her voice that stopped him in his tracks. Maybe he was feeling exhausted just like her. Everything she learned about a guardian was from Yujidi and he was a successful figure in her mind. Didn't I grow up fine just like this? So I can do the same as him. Curl was able to persist by thinking of it like that. Rather, she thought she was able to hold on. That was until one day a gnome hung herself by the neck. Fortunately, the gnome didn't die thanks to Curl who happened to be nearby rushing in and cutting off the string. She wasn't dead, but was instead greatly hurt. Even her life was at risk so Curl took the child away from the village and brought her to her nest. Curl earnestly looked after the injured child. The little gnome was hovering between the boundaries of life and death and Curl thus could not sleep for almost an entire three weeks. The pain appeared to be very intense around her neck and the gnome couldn't easily fall asleep. Curl stayed by her side, worried that something wrong might happen to her and anxiously watched her go to sleep. For her, the gnome was like a thin marble of glass. She was scared it might break. Meanwhile, the gnome village searched for their guardian deity who did not come to them, so Curl had to rush to the village when the gnome was asleep to listen to their requests. It was excruciatingly exhausting. She did find it worthwhile, and seeing the little ones relying on her as a guardian deity and looking at noon else but her, Curl realized that she couldn't crumble when they were leaning on her. She had to become a thicker pillar and needed to have a wider hug. But as those agonizing days continued without an end, the guardian deity also wanted to rely on someone. Maybe I'm still too young. Curl bitterly smiled to herself. After dealing with her task at the village, Curl returned to the nest and checked the state of the child. She looked after the baby gnome who was still suffering with constant irregular breaths, all throughout the night. Fatigued from all those tense moments of care, her eyes were slowly and unknowingly coming to a close. She met Yujidi. The background was very hazy, but it was probably Unit 301, and she was probably in her room. There was a time when Chirpy the baby chicken had almost been taken by the people from the Spirit Beast Breeding Center. Curl attacked them with a startled heart. It was fortunate that she had missed because otherwise someone would have died there. It seemed that she had gone back to that time. Curl, who had been burying her head into the pillow, raised her head and saw Yujidi's face. He was using his large hand to caress her head, the little strands of hair near the boundary of her forehead and her hair. She blankly looked at him as he asked her a question. What's wrong? Curl shook her head. She simply realized something. Ah, it's a dream. She had been thinking about him a lot recently. During the first few years after her return from the amusement, she had thought about him even more. Back then, she had been complaining to him in all of her dreams. Ah Jussi, there's no pork cutlet here. They don't know how to make macarons. But more importantly. I miss you. Those were the dreams she used to have quite often. She didn't know they were a dream back then, and she was thus a little depressed after waking up from one because of the thought that she might not be able to see him ever again. However, he was now here in front of Curl. His large and slightly cold hand slowly went through her hair. It had been her lifetime question. How did Yujidi know where she liked the most? That she felt comfortable when he caressed the area right above her forehead? Do you feel like going to sleep now? He asked. Resting her hand on top of his, Curl shook her head. Please stay here a bit more. 
All right. Yujidi followed through with what he said and stayed there. It was okay even though she knew it was a dream. Curl wanted to remain in this moment a bit more. His chest that she always comfortably leaned on whenever she was tired his feet that used to tread with her when confronted by a crossroad his hands that held her whenever her heart was quivering and his voice that consoled her when she was sad. Now that she was an actual guardian of someone else, there were so many things she wanted to share with him. Even though it might be a dream, she still wanted to talk to him. Have you been well? Curl opened her mouth. Of course. I've been fine. Anything go wrong? Why would anything go wrong? I see. That's good. He started moving his hand again and resumed caressing her hair. That's not like you. Yun. Asking something like that. Curl grinned. It was a really vivid dream. I missed you. We see each other every day though. Yun but still, I wanted to see you. And you know, I wanted to say thank you. You see, now that I actually became a guardian of someone, I realized how hard it was. Is that so? Curl talked about the things that recently happened to her, carefully, so that he wouldn't find it odd. Must have been rough. And after being acknowledged by him like that, Curl smiled with her eyes closed. I'm sure it was more rough for you, she added. At least you know it. Yujidi faintly smiled back. So let me have some rest today. Yeah. Rest up. Listening to his voice and feeling his hand, she closed her eyes. If this is a dream, I hope we meet again after I wake up. Why? Ko replied with a powerless voice. Because this time, I can do better. After waking up from her dream, Ko saw the gnome restlessly tossing in her sleep. The pain was still stopping her from sleeping properly. That was the end of her short dream. It was a shame because there were still a lot of stories she wanted to tell him, as well as many things to ask. Although it was partially embarrassing that she relied on him even in a dream. On the other hand, it soothed her heart that she was able to rely on him at least in a dream. When she was back to reality, Curl was once again the guardian of someone else. This time, it was therefore her job to soothe this tired little child. With her beautiful voice that used to bring tears to the world, Curl sang a lullaby. Child you pretty child. And she caressed the gnome's head, until the child comfortably fell asleep. Jules said she's going to sleep, said Curl. Really? Yoram on the other side of her, gave a fairly dry response, even though she should be fully aware of what she meant by sleep. What? Why are you so cold? Hmm. For how long? I don't know. But I think she's going to sleep for quite a while. Aha. Uh -huh. What have you been up to, Uni? Me? Well. Crossing her legs, Yoram placed a cigarette between her lips. Raising her fingertip, she lit it on fire and took a deep breath in as the cigarette started to be tainted in red. A dense smoke soon left her mouth. Just, doing nothing much. Are you not going to do anything? Like going out on amusements and stuff? No. What would I even do there? Yum. Going to a casino drunk and high on drugs? Losing all your money and doing it with dozens of men? Kaya ha. The fuck, said Yoram while grabbing Cowell's hair. Ong. D, don't. Feeling like she would be seared with the tip of the cigarette, Ko had to quickly lower her head. What about you, asked Yoram. Yun. Are you not going out? You can do more amusements can't you? Yun. Im, well. I guess you and I are the same there. Yoram sucked in through the cigarette again. There was not a single gentle taste to it unlike the one on earth, probably because the chemicals hadn't been processed. Although either side would have their pros and cons, Yoram liked the cigarettes from earth a little bit more. But you've only been on one right? Even Joel went out on two though. Curl asked. I'm fine. I'll do it one day. Did the adults allow that? So what if they don't allow that, when I don't want to go myself? Curl smiled. It was exactly what Yoram would say. But even though Yoram was acting confident, she was in a fairly precarious position. 
She was simply keeping her mouth closed because she got annoyed by just thinking about it. Joel said she missed Uni. Ah, uh, that stinks like a lie. I'm serious. She was very worried as well. About what? Your selection ceremony. You haven't done it yet right. Far out. There's no need to worry in the slightest. Yoram said while shaking her hand. That was when a question suddenly popped up in her mind. By the way, is she taller now? Un un. She's about the same as us. And her body size? Curl knew what she was talking about. Size here meant her body size as a dragon. She's about one and a half times bigger than you, Uni. Hmm. Yoram nodded before biting on her cigarette again. What about her face? She looks the same as the Joel we know. But she looks slightly more mature. That does make me a bit curious. Show me your memories. Soon, Yoram grabbed onto Cowell's wrist as memories related to Joel were transferred over to her. Haya, this kid. Kohihi. How is she? She's grown up nicely right? She looks fucking egotistic. So much I wanna snap it. You'll lose though. Your attributes. Quang. I'm sorry. Curl crawled with her nose pinched. How was she exactly the same even after 300 years? Yoram curiously wondered by herself. After the conversation about Joel, the topic was naturally shifted to Bomb. You went to help the Green Dragons in the war right? Curl asked. Yeah. It was a mess. Those lunatics were really crazy this time around. I saw the head of a 7,000-year-old old man bursting from a large axe right in front of me we were close like how we're sitting right now. I could have died there as well. Wow isn't that too dangerous? I wanted to ask before but, didn't your parents stop you? You didn't know. My mum and dad have zero interest in me. But even then. Anyway it was chaos. Thousands of protectors died and three whole kingdoms were wiped out. Yoram described the atrocities of the Long War. The War of the Green Dragons against the Quans was still going on, and was expected to last at least a few more centuries. Listening to her story, Curl could not help but raise a question. What about the money? In response, Yoram turned silent. It was a question she had been expecting but was nonetheless a very awkward one to reply to. Do you want me to be honest? NNNN. Hmm. You Bioem. She. Yoram scratched her head, not knowing how she was supposed to explain the situation. Um, she's a bit, weird now. Like, she became super weird. How? While distractedly scratching her head, Yoram continued. So like, you know how she has control over the military now, right? She became literally weird after that. The way she commands the operations is strange, she doesn't sleep, her eyes are all red and she goes around everywhere all day. I've never seen her rest for almost two hundred years by now. Ing. What's wrong with that? I'm telling you she doesn't rest. I'm sure she does when you're not there. No that's not it. That's not the stuff I'm trying to say. Then. With her wrist cut off, legs crushed and one of her eyes and ears missing, she crawled into the ancient forest and tracked one of the Quan's great warriors for seventy-one years. We didn't hear any news from her so we thought she was dead inside but no. After tracking him for seventy-one years, she finally ripped that great warrior to pieces. That you Bioem. I was there when she returned with his head. And you know what? Her face. A bizarre look appeared on Yoram's face as she cast her memories back to that time. The way she moves the troops around is also weird. She is in charge of three troops, and two of them have green dragons inside. She moves three times more than others while commanding them all the time. Wow. Curl couldn't find any other words to say. After opening her mouth once, Yoram continued pouring out all the words that had been holed up inside her heart due to having Noon to talk to. That's not the end. I found this out later there's another troop you BOM is in charge of, and she herself is in a squad that protects the Dragonlord. After her work ends in one place, she teleports to another place and fights there. 
After that's over, she goes to the dragon lord and reports to him. Five troops does this look normal to you? There was an undisguisable look of shock on Cowell's face because that did not sound normal in the slightest. Even though Yoram was worried that Curl might mistake her intention, she couldn't help but say it. You Bioem. She's completely gone crazy. That was her conclusion. How is that possible? That's what I'm saying. And that's exactly why I'm saying she's super weird. Dragons lived for a very long period of time, and thus entered a hibernation regularly to organize and tidy up the experiences they had earned with their unforgetting memories. Excessive burden to both the mind and the body was obviously a threat even to a dragon. Moving for 300 years without sleeping for even a second? According to Cowell's memory, there had never been such a green dragon in the annals of history. On one hand, Curl was slightly disappointed. She had been contacting Yoram and Joel quite regularly and they had even played sometimes with her at the center, but Bioem did not answer any of their calls. Even when Yoram was at a nearby squad, she had requested several times for a faceta face talk and was constantly rejected. It was clear that Bioem was intentionally avoiding her. That was the same even to the others. Didn't they spend a happy amusement together? Couldn't she come visit them at least once in the past 300 years? Betraying their expectations, Bioem never looked for them. Not a single time. I don't like how I keep thinking about it this way either, but you Bioem that bitch, she might be living a completely different world from us. Curl widened her eyes into circles. The old man's about to go soon, right? You mean the Lord? Yun. He has been reigning for like 15,000 years, after all. Probably a few hundred years left for him, and at most a thousand. There's been a talk about that among the green dragons. What did they say? Yoram sucked in a deep breath through the cigarette and heaved a deep sigh. They said you Bom is a candidate for the next dragon lord. Maybe she doesn't want to be related to us anymore. Yoram said something which both Curl and Joel had also been thinking of in secret. She had been finding it strange for a long time, but if that was to become a dragon lord, then she could understand how Bomb couldn't live in the same world as other baby dragons like them. But that's, very sad Curl sighed with a teary look on her face. Bom was the one whom she had shared the most happy moments of her life with. In a world without Ujidi, there were only four existences that remembered him. Thinking of such an existence going further away to achieve her dream made her feel empty at heart. In any case, that was the end of their conversation. Before leaving, Curl said to Yoram, I'm going to take a nap as well, as Yoram returned a nod. Both Yoram and Curl had intentionally refrained from going to sleep ever since Joel said she would look for a way to go back home. However, now that 300 years had gone by, all three of them had half given up on it. I don't know when the selection ceremony will be held but. Curl left those words at the end. Please survive. Uni. Yoram put the cigarette out and replied with a smile. You can go to sleep first. Ima take a nap as well after everything's over. Yun. Later let's go visit somewhere together. Sure. Saying that, Yoram sent her off. In truth, Yoram thought the selection ceremony would be held immediately after her return from the first amusement. That was why she had been trying as if she would die during the amusement. But when she did come back, her oldest Uni did not meet her and postponed the selection ceremony to no end. The first reason it was postponed was for an amusement. Her oldest Uni was going to soon leave for her third amusement. Everything had been prepared already and there was nothing Yoram could do about it. So she had to wait for the oldest Uni to come back after playing for twenty years. The second reason was hibernation. After returning from the amusement, her oldest Uni said she was tired from a big enlightenment and entered a deep sleep which was irritatingly long. She slept for almost 300 years and woke up very recently, and seemed like she had zero regard for Yoram's existence. Ah, this fucking bitch. Bitch once and they're a bitch forever. That was Yoram's theory of bitches. A problem that had been a result of that was that Yoram couldn't prove herself during those 300 years. She couldn't even take the selection ceremony and had constantly been looked down on by the other dragons of her race. The red race respects the strong but ignores and persecutes the weak. 
Her strength hadn't been proven through the selection ceremony she was born especially late, had a small body, and returned in just five years without even filling up the twenty years of her amusement and Yoram was therefore treated literally like a piece of trash. Dude. There goes trash. Uck, is that a dragon or a lizard? Seeing young adults doing that for almost three hundred years every day, Yoram had to suppress her urge to run in and rip them to pieces. Out of those were also males who mixed their bodies with her oldest uni and they were even more annoying. When her oldest uni was scolded by the elders of the race for constantly postponing the selection ceremony, they even pestered her to shoot magic towards Yoram's nest to kill her. It was at least better off when her oldest uni was still sleeping but now that they began playing with her again after she woke up, their bullying turned even worse. Oi, you fucking caterpillar of a bitch. Go kill yourself. Kill yourself. Suicide. But one of their voices was especially noisier today. Suppressing the urge to kill him, Yoram organized her mana. During the three hundred years of her oldest sister's absence, Yoram continued training by herself. She trained endlessly and even attended the War of Green Dragons to distinguish herself in the war. When those achievements were heard by the Red Race, she thought her perception would increase by a little but no there was still doubt within the race. That's unexpected, that's surprising. Although reactions like that were still looking down on her, those were still okay. They were at least positive. However, most of the red dragons said stuff like, how weak are green dragons, there's no way that happened so she must have gone around giving them her body, and that's an exaggeration. Despite not even bothering to look into it, they were especially more noisy. Even in a situation like that, her parents did not stand on her side. Although her oldest Uni was postponing the selection ceremony every day, her parents were still on her side. Yoram understood it in her head. Because that bitch was a rising star and she was trash in their eyes. All she had to do was prove herself through the selection ceremony. It was when she was thinking along the lines of that. Kill yourself. A one, two hundred year old adult dragon was being very noisy. He was screaming while even using dragon fear, so the animals that were living near her nest either fainted or began running away. She had become used to withstanding insults thanks to her training with Ujidi. There was noon on her side so she shouldn't make the matter worse she had to first wait for someone to be on her side. That was how she was suppressing her emotions. Go somewhere out of sight and kill yourself before your neck gets snapped and your dirty organs fall like the fifth of your family. Yoram stood up from her seat. She questioned herself. Was she being led around by her emotions? No. She could sit back down if she wanted to. Did she hear an unbearable insult? Yes. Because Fifth was talking about the youngest Uni who Yoram treasured the most. Was she allowed to kill him? Then. Isn't it fine as long as he doesn't die? That day, Yoram left her nest and bashed the dragon up until he almost died. She crushed his legs and destroyed his guts. Using her tail, she hacked his body so that it would be hard to recover, plucked his eyeballs out and lastly destroyed his genitals with a sword and made it irrecoverable. Heal yourself and please come back again, okay? Darling? Soaked in his blood, Yoram growled. Because that will be your last day alive for sure. She then kicked him down the cliff. Although it would have been a shocking event for other races, it was nothing much for the Red Dragons. Besides, there were valid reasons and circumstances so she wasn't scolded by the adults either. They enjoyed hearing the news even. However, there was still Noon acknowledging Yoram even after that event. How weak is that guy to get bashed up by a bitch like that? What a weak male. Saying that, they instead defamed the male that lost to Yoram. It was fine. Yoram was not upset by the reality. Whenever her heart was in pain, she just had to recall the advice of her teacher as always. Feet on today. Eyes on tomorrow. Looking ahead into the distance, what Yoram had to do was not get angry at the ones that were making fun of her. She simply had to train as always. After another few years, her oldest Uni, who had completely woken up from the long sleep, visited Yoram's nest with her parents. Hello. With a voice that was always coquettish and lustful, she said while looking into Yoram's eyes. You were alive. I thought you were dead during your sleep. 
Yoram replied with a sharp voice, as her sister squinted her eyes in response as if she was finding her pathetic. I heard you hacked Fabio's genitals. She walked up. Being slightly taller than Yoram, she gazed down into her eyes. N.N. I did that. Why did you do something useless? Even if you cut his limbs off, you should have let that be. My precious toy became unsightly because of you. Although her words sounded prankish, embedded inside was a clear killing intent. She was hoping to rip Yoram to death. Yoram stared directly into her eyes. Unlike how she had to gasp for breath by simply meeting her gaze in the past, looking straight into her face was nothing difficult anymore. Uni. I'm really really sorry. That was why Yoram returned with a coquettish voice. Little Yoram did not know, okay? This time, her oldest Uni frowned instead. How could I ever expect my amazing Uni to go ang ang under a weak ass male like that? I thought it was just a rumor. What are you trying to say? There is no pretty dick anymore, but it'll give you something else in return. You UNN how about this? Yoram showed her her clenched arm. Instead, how about you jam this cutie Yoram's arm inside? Oops, Yoram widened her eyes. Or is it too small for your bottom hole? Ah, right. I forgot I was about to build my nest there last year. It was very wide and spacious. Her oldest Uni twitched her eyes and grumbled, this kid, instead of being upset by Yoram's coarse words, she appeared dumbfounded by how someone so vastly inferior to her was acting up to her like this. After walking to her side, she placed her hand on her head. You are now quite cocky aren't you? Mischievousness disappeared from Yoram's eyes. Her unforgetting memories still remembered the words this bitch had blabbered while grabbing onto the chin of her small body. Lucky aren't you? With the same face and same voice as back then, she opened her mouth. You were so little back then. Lowering her head, she brought her mouth to Yoram's outstretched fist and slowly, she took her tongue out to lick it. Thanks for a new toy. Later I'll cut it off and use it for myself. In the next instant, Yoram unsheathed her sword. Her uni slightly pulled her body back but the sword was not directed at her. Yoram brought the sword to her hand that was licked and slowly sliced the skin away for her to see. Traveling down, the dream eater sliced off the skin on the back of her hand like sashimi. Blood started to flow like crazy. Off you go, Uni. Unless you want to die before the ceremony. Her Uni took a step back with a faint smile. You'll regret blabbering like that. Leaving those words behind, she turned around. Her parents that came with her sister were still standing there so Yoram turned her gaze towards them. Are the two of you not going to leave? The amount of time she had confronted her parents was probably less than ten minutes throughout the period of three hundred years ever since her return. For Yoram, it was very uncomfortable to talk to her parents. Child. Do you think you can beat your sister? Unexpectedly, his voice wasn't that sharp. Yoram was skeptical. Because of the total lack of communication, she didn't even know what her parents were thinking about herself. Why wouldn't I be able to? What makes you think like that? Because I've been preparing. Preparing? Ever since my first amusement to this day, you two don't know how I've been training and what I've gone through. Her father indifferently gave a nod, acknowledging that he had no idea. I knew I was ungifted and tried very hard. To be frank, I even almost died a few times. So. Let me apologize to you two beforehand. Sorry if you've become attached to that bitch, but shall die by my hands. It's fine. Whoever wins and whoever dies does not matter. Only the strong matter to us. Yoram doubted her ears. Her father's words were still relatively gentle. How long had it been since she last talked to her parents like this? In fact, did that even happen ever in her life? That might be why it was needlessly giving Yoram a little sense of peace. It was because she had been too lonely for the last three hundred years ever since her return to Escalifa. But unfortunately. However, the expectation that was born inside her from a few sentences. We don't think you will beat her. Was crushed from one sentence. Yoram blinked her eyes. She needed some time to take those words in. 
W.H. what? We came with your sister because there was something to tell you. Even an immature child like you should know how lofty the selection ceremony is for our race, yes. We still remember the disgrace you showed after the last ceremony. A cluster of thorny words came wreaking havoc in her heart. With your chin grabbed by your sister, you pissed yourself. Being born late in the same generation and even pissing yourself in front of an opponent that you are supposed to kill. Yoram's old memories that she had been hiding because there was no reason to talk about them, were being trampled on. Do you know how much scorn our family had to suffer from others back then? Killing intent could be sensed from the voice of her father. To a red dragon who put emphasis on power and honor, that was an inerasable disgrace. If you are going to do the same this time, how about you give up on the selection ceremony? They'll try not to kill you then. I will destroy your heart and have you discarded at a distant place for you. Yoram felt her world turn dizzy. An unimaginable sense of betrayal was stabbing her head. In telling you ill win, she said. Stop blabbering nonsense. Didn't you see me trash on Fabio that fucking bastard? Who would have known he was so weak? He had an easygoing personality with little friction, and that must have been a mask the whole time. His family is being incredibly ridiculed right now anyway. Did I ask you that? Yoram slammed the ground with her foot as the mana reverberated with a loud thud. I. Will. Win. Yoram shouted while emphasizing each and every word. I'm going to win. Why do you look down on me so much without even verifying it? Did I ask for love? Or did I ask for something? Did I complain about you not saying anything to me after I came back from my amusement? Am I not your daughter? I'm still your offspring. What are you trying to say? I'm still your child. Can you not even trust me once? Her mother's next words crushed her last bit of expectation to pieces. Unfortunately, child, we did not care about you in the slightest ever since you were born late. Her mouth slowly came to a close. Yoram had a stupefied look on her face. Ill set the date of the selection ceremony, but Noon will be expecting anything from you. Sure. You can pee if you want to dishonor me. But your future. Go away. I don't want to hear it. Her parents left her nest without saying anything in return. Left alone, Yoram checked the barriers of her heart, whether they were still firmly closed or not. If those walls happened to crumble even once, Yoram felt like she would fall to an unbearable depth. Right. This was her life. A life that received no expectation and no trust. An exceptionally lucky entity who was living her life as a bonus even though she should have been dead already. That was her life. Yoram took out a cigarette with her bloodstained hand. Even though she intentionally tried not to think about anything negative, the few words of her parents were even sharper to her heart than the provoking words of her sister. Couldn't they just leave some words of expectation for the selection ceremony? Although we were a race that worshipped the strong, am I still not their blood-related daughter? On a day like this, she couldn't help but think of someone. The person who never doubted her a single time. Who always trusted her. Encouraged her that she could do it. And expected many things from her. The face of her teacher appeared in her mind. This was what Eugidi had always said to her. You can do it. Don't think you can't. Think positive and your attitude will continue to show it. And I also think you can do it. Yoram thought while sucking in a deep smoke. Revenge. Survival. Those two elements used to be the objective of her life. But now, there was one more. Yoram had to prove it in this selection ceremony. That Eugidi was not wrong for trusting her. Ever since her return from the amusement, Yoram had never visited her youngest Uni's grave. On the day of her death, Yoram pledged to herself that she would definitely survive, decapitate her oldest Uni and bring that head to her. That was why she shouldn't go to her youngest Uni's grave yet. However, Yoram headed to her youngest Uni's grave to remind herself of the pledge she had made in the past. To red dragons, a funeral was an act of carnivalism. They ate the corpse of their dead comrades and burned a part of it. That was why Yoram, who had been a baby back then, 
was the only one who contributed to making the grave after picking up a bone piece of an unknown part of her body that hadn't been fully scorched, Yoram had stuck it into the ground and buried it with the surrounding dirt into a round shape. And yet. The grave was ruined. The only remaining bone piece was scattered into fragments both broken and charred. Under a small cliff, this place rarely got wind and sunlight the ground was filled with ash, meaning that it was done very recently. Yoram felt like the world was crumbling down. She checked the leftover trace of mana, and realized it had been less than half a day. With a vacant look on her face, Yoram kneeled and collapsed to the ground. The chilly gaze of her oldest Uni resurfaced in her mind. You'll regret blabbering like that. Yoram carefully gathered the fragments of her youngest Uni's bones that had been broken once again. She gathered everything including the charred fragments but they only summed up to a handful. Gathering them to one place, she once again covered them with dirt. She then kneeled in front of the grave and stayed like that for a long time. Closing her eyes, she restrained her emotions that were threatening to explode. She quietly whispered. I am sorry for being late. It is almost over, so please wait just a little more. A selection ceremony was treated like a small festival because it was a proving ground for hatchlings to prove themselves by killing each other. This time around, the selection ceremony was even more special. Even though red dragons had an intercourse regardless of the gender and age of the opponent, even a place so crooked had feelings. The younger sister had pulverized a lover of her older sister into smithereens, so hideous that death might have been a better future for him. He had received every type of insult that a male could ever get, and the people knew how furious the older sister would be to have that happen to her lover. The red dragons wanted the enraged older sister to rip the younger sister to pieces as brutally as possible. And if the younger sister happened to tear her older sister to pieces instead? That would be even more thrilling. There were a lot of red dragons gathered to watch the selection ceremony with their blood boiling from expectation. The complexions of Yoram's parents turned worse as more and more eyes gathered at the arena. Yoram's father as a red dragon acknowledged honor and war. He was like that, his wife was the same, his parents and kids were also the same. Fighting and dying during a fight was their pride and honor. And yet one little kid had poured piss over the meticulously built tower of honor. That damn fool. That same little kid was at the arena of the selection ceremony, and even that was an irritating sight for the parents. A red dragon should be late if anything. Coming earlier than scheduled for an amount of time that would be enough to have one meal isn't that what those pretentious green dragons would do. Lifting her head, Yoram looked at the surroundings. The arena was made by cutting off an entire mountain range. Adult dragons were sitting on the high hills gazing down at her and each of their shadows were extremely huge. Normally, hatchlings had their selection ceremony in their dragon forms because they had trouble moving properly in human form but both Yoram and her opponent were over 300 years old, and were fairly old for hatchlings. If they fought with all their heart, it would destroy a whole kingdom. That was why they had to restrict their power by fighting in human forms, but that was instead a welcome news for Yoram. With her hand resting above the scabbard, Yoram waited for her opponent. But even when there was ten minutes and five minutes left until the start of the battle, the opponent did not show up. For Yoram, who had learned the concept of time on earth from Ujidi, it was something she couldn't understand. Why was she coming late on such an important occasion? There were three minutes left. She waited. There was one minute left. But she still didn't come. In the end, it was only when it was ten minutes past the scheduled time that her oldest Uni showed herself by crossing through the dimension. Yoram doubted her eyes. Her sister was half-naked. She was wearing a gown without anything underneath and her thighs were in full display. Black pigments were all over her lips and cheeks there were red flowers all over her body as well as other explicit traces of a sexual intercourse. Sorry. I was a bit late, right? My heart was so empty I needed some comfort. Yoram did not reply but it seemed that she had been copulating with someone. Her emotions that she had been controlling surged up again, because it meant she went mating immediately after ruining the grave of her youngest Uni. That made her think that she might be the only one that was serious about this event. Her sister was so arrogant that she wasn't even thinking of a defeat. 
Sorry, elders. Looking around, she pretended to apologize. She was received by jeers of the crowd and some of them did not disguise their ridicule and aversion. However, her action was not something disgracing their race, because a red dragon should have that much ambition at the very least. Tear her. Rip her to pieces. Hurry up and kill your younger sister. Shred her to pieces like your lover. The red dragons shouted. Soon, the supervisors of the selection ceremony, Yoram's parents, began praying to the first red dragon. A red dragon's prayer was the same as a war cry. The fear-inducing screams of dragons gathered to one and menacingly shook the atmosphere. However, Yoram felt the world mysteriously turning quiet in the midst of all that. Her feelings that she had been suppressing with difficulty were soaring back up from her heart like blazing flames. Yoram took in her oldest Uni with her eyes. The shouts of the praying one turned even louder as the two of them stared at each other. One of them raised the corners of their lips into a sneer but Yoram did not smile back. In a world tranquil like the time she was standing in front of an ocean with no waves, Yoram placed her hand on her sword. For her, there was only herself and her nemesis in this area. How long? Have I been waiting for this moment? Fight! Yoram dashed in following the shout of her father. An explosion at the bottom of her feet bounced her forward as wings of flame added momentum to her charge. Even though they were hundreds of meters apart, Yoram's sword was right in front of her opponent in the blink of an eye. Fluster appeared in the face of her opponent. Yoram's strike was a lot stronger than what she, or what anyone else of this place could have imagined. However, she did not fall back. By hurriedly taking out a large great sword from the dimensional storage, she retaliated against Yoram's attack. Mana condensed down as dimensions lengthened behind them. In a world with a distancing background erupted scorching flames. Quang Quang. The source of the shockwave trembling the dimension was at the place where their swords collided. She glared at Yoram. She could not believe that she was getting pushed back by each and every strike. Her wrists quivered with each clash of the swords. Another clash and it was her shoulders, and after that was her entire body that was shivering. Speed, power and accuracy. She was not Yoram's opponent in any of those aspects. She was dumbstruck. What was happening in front of her was so complex that she couldn't comprehend it. The little kid in front of her was a literally worthless filth among trash who was born a whole century after her. Didn't she pathetically piss herself from one sentence before? How could this? The battle went on. Flickering embers scorched her beautiful hair, and a sharp fear strike smacked her arm. She tried retaliating with a stab to the stomach but the sword could not pierce deeply through Yoram's fortified abs. Meanwhile, Yoram approached further in while twisting her body away from the sword and used her own sword to chop her arm off. Cook! The eyes of the crowd shifted and their gazes changed. In a fierce attempt to attack back, she stubbornly retaliated. Using the strongest flames among her thirty types of fire, she tried to scorch Yoram but she failed. Yoram squeezed in through the gap of the flames and stabbed the sword into her eyes again. Feeling a rush of pain, she decided to ignore the rules. Soon, her body was enveloped in a cloud of mana before gradually increasing in size. There was a subtle calculation behind her actions. It took time to cancel a polymorph but that had been concealed behind the cloud of mana, and it would be too late by the time the kid in front of her eyes realized it. After cancelling hers first, she would be able to rip her opponent to death before they cancelled theirs. The moment her polymorph was almost completely dispelled, she smiled because she saw Yoram widening her eyes into circles. For red dragons, ripping the opponent to death was more of an honor in the end and rules were not important. Is it unfair? You should have cancelled yours first then. However, it seemed that the young bitch was a lot more stupid than what she thought. Without even cancelling the polymorph, she ran towards her in human form. The struggle would be in vain. She opened her mouth wide open. Her huge body that reached 19 meters stretched its enormous mouth out wide, threatening to swallow Yoram in one bite. A sublime mana of fire gathered to her mouth. It was one of the greatest authorities of the Ancient One that could burn an existence off the face of the planet. Dragon Breath 
A red ray of light drew a clean cylinder behind its path as it swallowed up Yoram's small body. But that was when something that went completely against common sense started to unravel in front of her. Despite being struck by it hedon, Yoram did not avoid the breath. Instead, she parried it with her sword and came closer towards her. Her body was being scorched. Her clothes had long disappeared and even her skin was being charred black but Yoram did not stop. Only then did she finally realize it. They were in a whole different league. That ungifted piece of filth had reached a height that was incomparable to that of her own by the time she realized it. The polymorph that had been cancelled in a hurry failed in the middle due to the dragon breath that she had formed with haste. Unable to properly return to dragon form, her body turned small again. Breaking through the flames, Yoram ran in with her body scorched all over and grabbed her by the neck. A sword came flying in and created a deep wound at her cheek as blood bursted out. Yoram did not stop. This time, she drew a line from the forehead and chopped her ears off. Her nemesis struggled and wriggled in pain. Lastly, she formed a fist with her hand holding the sword and smacked her opponent at the mouth. A loud slam echoed as her mouth, nose and jaws all broke together. The crowd of red dragons gave a thunderous roar. They were sending praise to the warrior but the ones at the center of the battle could not hear it. Yoram brought her face closer to the head of her collapsed opponent. She must have sensed death. Her face tainted with fear was an amusing sight for Yoram. You have no idea how long I've been waiting for this day. You fucking bitch. There were words that had yet to be conveyed. For a long time, Yoram had words in her mind that she had vowed to convey if a day like this ever came to her. You said to me I was lucky. The strong could control the life of the weak as they wished, like how her nemesis of an older sister had defined her life. That was why Yoram decided to define the death of her oldest sister, in the name of her youngest Uni. You were unlucky. Yoram then chopped her head off. Her oldest Uni was dead and Yoram was victorious. Thus ended the selection ceremony. Soaked in blood, Yoram turned around. She walked out of the arena filled with roaring shouts of red dragons, without answering their cries. Yoram was now the rightful heir to her parents. They will now erase their doubt and disbelief against her, trust her and flood her with unconditional support. However she did not take them. Instead, she went to the grave of her youngest Duni and kneeled in front of it. She stabbed the dream eater nearby, and placed the half-crushed head of her oldest Duni next to the grave and began wailing out loud. To her precious existence that provided her starving self with food and taught her stammering self words, who also protected her so that she wouldn't die in the hands of her oldest sister, Yoram opened her mouth. I achieved my revenge. I have, at last, accomplished my lifelong aspiration. After crying without an end for four days straight, Yoram stopped her tears and scorched the head of her oldest Uni into ashes before fluttering them under the breeze. It's astonishing. To think you were that strong. You made me see you in a different light. How unexpected. Why don't you come marry me? NN. Some dragons faced her with unwelcome smiles and words, as well as those who still showed a contemptible attitude. Fuck off. Yoram made them go away and mindlessly started walking again. Those were not the compliments she wanted to hear. Belatedly showing trust even though they had never trusted her before was nothing but a fake trust and a trash acknowledgement. The acknowledgement she wanted was different. There was one who showed her trust, back when she herself couldn't even trust her. It was because he was there because he believed in her that Yoram was able to trust herself, and that was why she was able to crawl through the narrow and frightening ravines to stand in this place and achieve her revenge. How amazing would it have been to share such an important moment with the one who allowed her to hold a dream. Even though she had already verified her life, Yoram wanted to be assured by him again. Because being acknowledged by the one who trusted her more than herself, would be the truest form of proving her life. Yoram unknowingly stopped in her tracks. Lifting her unfocused eyes, she stared into the distance and murmured. Did I do a good job? There is a grand schema in plan for you. Closing her eyes, she could remember her mother's voice, and the words that used to ring her ears like a lullaby. You will vent the grudge of us black dragons. 
It was that the future of the ill, injured and sick black dragons whose house had been taken away was on her shoulders. You must achieve this feat which Noon has been able to thus far. No matter how difficult and exhausting it is, you must continue to proceed without giving up, conquer and obtain it. That was what her mother used to tell her. Do not forget. My beloved daughter. There is a. She had a grand schema in plan. Her mother did. Ever since she returned to Escalifa, there had been twelve pairs of eyes following Bomb. These were eyes that others could not see, but BOM could close her eyes and inspect her inner world to see them clearly. In fear that a problem may occur to their grand schema, the twelve pairs of eyes encouraged BOM who had to shoulder the aspiration of their race, and monitored her. They rushed her, telling her to go achieve the grand aspiration. Their aspiration became an obsession. That was undeniable considering how the twelve adult black dragons had burned their physical bodies with black flames to simply monitor bomb. They were the ones in charge of the race that was destined to fall after being unfairly expelled from Escalifa in the past. For them, the betterment of their race was a lot more important than an individual's life and their remaining lives. Those were the gazes that were on BOM. BOM needed to go to places they could accept, and do things they could comprehend, and most of them were extreme yet efficient methods of becoming a dragon lord. Sometimes, her opinions differed from that of the spirits. Even though she considered something necessary, the spirits oftentimes did not. At times, underneath all the intense gazes that were falling on her, BOM had to calm them down. You don't need to worry about anything. Everything is for the grand schema. BOM talked to the eyes and ears inside her, and had to prove that her idea was better than what they suggested. Because otherwise, she had to go through a severe nightmare that was close to a mental torture. You trust me right? They'll listen to what you say. So please just watch over me this time. Lujayathan calms down the vengeful spirits. They only calmed down when her mother entered the fray. But for Bioem, it was just another addition to the gazes facing her way. The things Baum had to do in order to proceed towards the grand schema were as follows. She had to become part of the green race at the time of the current dragon lord's death. This had been arranged beforehand by her mother Lujayathan. She merged into the first amusement to show she was young. After returning from the amusement, her job was to distinguish herself as much as possible at a young age, and be acknowledged by the dragons of Escalifa, including the green race. It was because of this that she had been going through an intense curriculum ever since her birth, and was also why the advice and lectures of the vengeful spirits were following her. And she had to be selected as the next dragon lord regardless of the method. For that, she had to be acknowledged by the five elders and the dragon lord, and this was where her uniqueness came to play. BOM was a mutant dragon who had half deviated from providence. Because of that, she was able to disguise herself with complete falsehood. It was because of her uniqueness that it was possible for her to be acknowledged by the dragon lord and the five elders in spite of her fishy intention. After that it was simple. BOM would head to the temple of the dragon lord and stand in front of dragon's origin which protected the dragons. That was the true body of the small fragments protecting the hearts of infant dragons, the origin fragment. It was large and looked like a crystal gem, and it granted one's wishes. Standing in front of the gem, BOM could make an oath after being selected as the new dragon lord. All the authorities, justifications and powers of a dragon lord would then be conveyed down to her. That was what the black dragons were aiming for. On the day of her coronation as a dragon lord, BOM would be standing in front of the large gem, deceive all the participating dragons, and make this as her wish. I wish for the black dragon race to permanently reside in Escalifa. At the same time, she would use the greatest treasure of the black race, the demonic sword of grief. BOM would stab the demonic sword into dragon's origin. With that, the black dragon race will return to Escalifa, and all the dragons would have to accept the black race because of the oath because the black race had to reside permanently in Escalifa. Dragon's origin will lose its power and be unable to create a new lord for over 10,000 years but that was none of their business. Because the black dragons would be able to create a new order by then. Like that, the path in front of BOM was very clear. All she had to do was follow what they told her to do. However, 
BOM moved even faster to accomplish beyond their expectations. Seeing that made the vengeful spirit satisfied but they did not lower their guards. It was because sometimes, almost once every few centuries, BOM would try to go astray. It was when the war against the Quans was in a stalemate. After managing two troops for local battles without a single rest for fifteen years, BOM was able to tie a small knot to the war. When she was about to return to her territory to release all the accumulated fatigue, a protector walked up to her. There has been a request for a visit. She viewed the memories that had been brought over, as her eyes that had been soaked in fatigue stretched wide open. Please leave my head for three days. I want a full rest for myself. BOM asked the vengeful spirits rooted inside her body, but was met with an internal riot. I just want to comfortably rest a little. I'm not asking for a lot of time. How about two days? Or, even just one day? It was her first time making such a request. She tried to persuade them but they were suspicious about her intention. What ulterior motive do you have what are you going to do for a day after pushing us away? They asked. No. Nothing. I'm just asking for a rest, at a place away from everyone's vision. However, her persuasion did not work. Lujayathan gazes at you. The strict gaze of her mother strangled her. Lujayathan wants to persuade you. Lujayathan hopes for your rest, but wishes that to be after you become the Lord, or after the grand schema, is completed. Mom. Bom stiffened her expression, and the voice of her mother flowed into her head. My dear daughter. There is a grand schema for you. You may do as you wish after it has been completed. I know that. I've been doing it fine till now. She tried to persuade her mother but had to cower before her stern lecture. Wake up a little my eighth daughter. Do you need to be scolded? It is an opportunity that came after thousands of hard work. You know it yourself, do you not? N.N. How could you wish for your petty freedom at a time like this? Bomb stopped trying to persuade them, but had to pay the price for stirring up the vengeful spirits. They were suspicious. Listing everything she had done, they mentioned that she had never asked for a rest like this until now, and demanded she tell them why she was asking for one now. One of them viewed the memories of the visit request that had been conveyed over to BOM. Out of those asking for a conversation were also ones who had left on their first amusement with BOM. But Bomb shook her head. No. They have nothing to do with this. Dragons were by nature indifferent to other races, and were even exclusive. Because of that, the friendship between Joel and Curl, as well as the one including Yoram, was famous among the dragon society for being fairly unique. It was the first time in the history of dragon kind that dragons of other races were that close. That was something Bioem knew about, and the vengeful spirits obviously knew everything she knew herself. They demanded a sign which proved that her request for a vacation was really not related to these two kids. Bioem said they had nothing to do with it, and she needed to prove that in front of the eyes of the vengeful spirits. Protector. Yes miss. Don't report to me anymore if you get a visit request from these two kids. Specifically from these two, is it? Yes. Make it so that I'm not even aware of their request. You may take care of that yourself. I understand. How long should that arrangement be valid for, may I ask? The gazes of the vengeful spirits deepened as their suspicions were amplified. BOM gave the reply that they wanted the most. Forever. Only then were the spirits satisfied. Like that, BOM left on a journey to become the Dragon Lord. She belonged to countless squads, and had to shed blood every day in the war against Quans. The role of black dragons was to convey the memories of history to their descendants. Naturally, among them were also memories related to wars. In the grand flow of time, history tended to repeat itself. Under the command of Lujayathan and the vengeful spirits, BOM gave wonderful commands and led several battles to victory. At times, her loyalty was doubted, and she had to do things that were very cruel. The most horrendous of them was probably telling her who had her eye and ear ripped off, sliced wrist, crushed legs and opened rib cages, to cross the ancient forest to track one of Quan's great warriors. There, BOM constantly shed blood, 
breathed in the humid and sticky air while sweating profusely and vomited several times from the pain all the while diligently moving her legs, with nothing but one ballista in her hand. The ancient forest was massive. It was half of Escalifa's entire region, and was 2,300 times larger than Earth. In that place, BOM wandered endlessly and had to look for the great warrior over an unending period of time. Only after driving an arrow into the head of the great warrior was she able to return to the mainlands of Escalifa. By the time she returned, it had been 71 years since she jumped into the forest. Her accomplishment of tracking the great warrior by herself and killing him was widely acknowledged, her name value rose up tremendously and that was when her status also began to soar into the sky. She was even requested to have a personal conversation with the Dragon Lord. Because of that, BOM could not sit down and rest even after coming back. Her mind was worn down and crushed, and a part of her broken body was left as a disability due to not being healed properly but she continued moving. Sometimes, she had to lay her hands on the stimulant of the black race to clarify her broken mind. It was one that added power to the mind by ruining a portion of the health. That too was only possible after the calculation and guidance of her mother. BOM was unable to sleep and gain a mind that was always enlightened. But because of that, her body began to break down. She had a light seizure and a fit whenever she was a little relaxed. A permanent disability laid waste to her left arm and made it impossible to move properly. The disability came even to her senses and she could no longer taste, smell or feel anything. Later, even a part of her heart was permanently damaged, and her body became one that couldn't bear a child. That day, she collapsed and cried a little, in front of the eyes of the vengeful spirits. Even so, BOM had to move for the grand schema. And that made the vengeful spirits very content. Such times went on as 700 years passed after her return from the amusement. The tides of war shifted and the green dragons that had always been on the losing side were starting to push the Quans back. That was when the dragon lord secretly called BOM and sent her as a secret emissary. You go meet the Red Race, and have them attend the war under my name. Yes sir. BOM immediately came up with a plan, and shared her plan with the vengeful spirits. It was that she would go meet her old acquaintance, the only connection she had without bothering to go anywhere else. Didn't BOM wish to go astray in the past with something related to Curl and Joel? The unforgetting vengeful spirits showed a fair bit of discontentment again and started doubting her. However, her reply was very clear. You remember how she was dispatched to our squad, and constantly asked me to meet her right? Back then, I turned those down without even looking at them. That is my answer. There is no need to doubt me in just pursuing efficiency. The vengeful spirits gave the same reply as before. Prove it. Without saying anything, BOM moved. She crossed the boundaries and looked for Yoram's nest. Fortunately, Yoram wasn't sleeping. For the first time in 700 years, she looked into her eyes. Hello. BOM greeted Yoram. On the other hand, Yoram looked back at her with a bizarre look on her face. Why are you here? Yoram looked confused. It's been a while. How have you been? BOM returned an intimate reply as the vengeful spirits gazed at her with suspicion and displeasure. She persuaded them, saying that she and Yoram were still young dragons unlike them, and that Yoram would only open her heart and move proactively for her sake if she pretended to be nice. Can't you tell from how I'm still alive? Looks like it. You must have beat your oldest Dooney. That's great. It's been 500 years already. Congratulations. A deeper frown appeared on Yoram's face. Her reddened eyes and her frowning nose openly displayed her discontentment. Oi you Bioam. Don't you have something to tell me? Isn't there something you should say to me? Bioam touched her green hair for a bit. Something to say. Sorry for turning you down when you were looking for me. Yoram widened her eyes. So it really was you. I was too busy. You know how the war is going right now, don't you? Bullcrap. I know you were busy, but were you not even able to spare just five minutes for eight hundred years? Even though I ignored all the shit from my race and attended your war just to see you. Sorry. 
But, it really was impossible for me to see you. B.O.M. locked her fingers and slightly lowered her head. There was no such etiquette among dragons, and it was the one used by humans on earth. Yoram shook her head, before adding more words along with a sigh. So, why are you here? There must be a reason why you came here. I need to see someone with authority from the Red Dragons. Is it because of the war? All right. He'll introduce you to him. But in return, let's go see the kids together. This was something that had been outside of Bomb's expectation. Her expectation was something that was also viewed by the vengeful spirits, and what happened was therefore against their calculations as well. That's right now, I can't. However, there was an unexpected look on Yoram's face. She no longer looked displeased in the slightest. BOM scrutinized Yoram's expression and noticed it slowly turning brighter alongside a faint light of anticipation. They all want to see you. Dude. You have no idea how much they wanted to see you right. Fuck, you came right on time. Yoram. You turned down their requests as well didn't you? That's okay. And fuck, so what if you turn me down ten times? You're right here. I knew you were going to come back one day. She was completely misunderstanding her. Let's be real. You bothered coming here to ask me something like this for a reason, right? I know you're not very honest with these things. Of course I do. Ahaha. Ah, ha. ah. Fuck I'm so happy. The kids are all going to be super happy when they hear this. They're gonna like, jump around and stuff you know. Here. Come here you bitch. Yoram threw her arms wide open with a bright smile asking for a hug, not realizing the amount of internal commotion she had caused for Bioem. No sorry, I don't think I can do that. Her expressions were over the top this had been completely unexpected for Bioem. Instead of welcoming her this much, Bioem thought she would be slapped or something because that was the type of person Yoram was in her mind. But she could understand why she was like this. It seemed that Yoram had missed her for a very long time, and was worried about her risking her life during the war. There were roaring voices inside her, shouting at her to immediately leave this place. Almost twelve voices were yelling inside her at the same time and it was so clamorous that she turned dizzy. Ying. What's wrong with you? You feel super distant all of a sudden. No. I'm not here to see you guys. Ying. What's wrong, my darling, you BOM? Yuan. As if she couldn't believe her attitude, Yoram came even closer while acting cute. The internal roars became even louder the more she approached. They pushed BOM into a corner like they were in a seizure. No. Forget it. Let's pretend this never happened. Uh. Oi, you BOM. Bomb hurriedly turned her body but Yoram came closer in the blink of an eye and grabbed onto her wrist. What is wrong with you, huh? What? You came here to see me, didn't you? Don't do that. Like, you came all the way here already. Why are you so embarrassed and why are you trying to go back? Yoram. I have no plans of seeing them. What are you talking about? If you really didn't, then you wouldn't have come all the way here right? Ah, if it's because of the war, then don't worry. I can bring the kids over to your squad. We will make it quick. Just take a day off and we'll be all set. She showed more affection the more she was pushed. This was again out of her expectation. BOM was hurting her and yet Yoram was coming even closer, so she had no choice but to make her go back by hurting her even more. Stop. Stop. Please. Ego, come on, what happened to you boss? What should I do for you? I'm not joking. I, I know you're not serious. You're suddenly going to crack up and tease me or something, right you bitch? What happened next startled BOM. Yoram tried to hug her from behind while murmuring like the past, let's see. How has Aruni's titties been? BOM had to be resolute. Get away from me. Despite saying that herself, even she was surprised by her own cold voice. Do you think I cut my precious time off to come here and play around with you? Yoram's eyes widened in shock, unable to believe her words. However, 
B.O.M. continued saying such cruel stuff to convince the vengeful spirits inside her. How long are you going to stay indulged in playing house? Those words that seemingly denied their past turned Yoram blank. You need to do a negotiation properly. My time is gold, and I have many things that are cheaper than that. If you need those worthless conditions to help, then forget it. I wish you all the best and goodbye. B.O.M. turned away from her as Yoram was frozen stiff. She couldn't say anything in return. Only then were the vengeful spirits inside her body content. The chaos had settled and a few of them even gave her compliments for being able to differentiate private matters from the important ones. Bioam. My sister. But Yoram's words stopped her in her tracks. My friend. You fucking bitch. Her feet came to a stop. There were tears mixed into Yoram's voice. Although she was met with internal complaints again, Bioam couldn't help but stop her feet. What? It really feels like my heart is being crushed. Did you actually mean that? You don't know what the kids are doing right now do you? I don't know. They're probably sleeping, because they're around that age. No. They are not sleeping. The two of them left on a journey together 300 years ago to meet you again. B.O.M. couldn't comprehend those words. Why would they have to leave on a journey to meet her? We can't see our guardian anymore. They all accepted that by now, but to at least be able to meet you again, they think they have to be a high enough dragon. They think you're not seeing them because of how useless they are, so they want to come back useful. Because of that, they're not in a scalifa. They are going around the outer dimensions learning everything. You had no idea did you? Since you have zero interest in what the kids are thinking. Bomb's eyes turned vacant. You Bioem. You know what? I had no fucking idea that's how you thought of me and those kids. Yoram was on the verge of tears while saying that. I was delaying my sleep just so I could see you once but I should tell the kids now. To give up. Thank you for being honest, you damn bitch. At least we don't need to have any false hope now. After finishing her words, Yoram disappeared into the distance. Left alone, Bioem blankly stared at the ground like a statue. She couldn't even hear the commotion inside her. My dear daughter. Do you feel all right? However, the clearer voice of her mother still reached her ears. She was not trying to cheer her up that was a question of suspicion. Of course. I can't ruin the grand schema because of this. B.O.M. shifted her mother's suspicion with those words. Hmm, then the next red dragon I should talk to is. She carried her feet on despite the stagger. As if she did not care about Yoram in the slightest. It was already nighttime when she left Yoram's nest. Bioem stood still for a bit to turn her gaze towards the sky. She then looked at the stars. While remembering someone's voice. War. Blood. Pain. Despair. Frustration. Determination. And grand schema. Another two hundred years went by. The Green Dragon race led the war against Quans to victory. The vast continent was soaked in blood. Both flora and fauna were destroyed during the war the ground was desolate as if there had been a meteor strike, and a whole empire was turned into a desert. Air was filled with dirty germs and mana embedded with killing intent every water flowing above ground was polluted with poison with a portion of them flowing underground. It became impossible for lives to bloom in those lands for the next thousands of years. It was a long war that went on for approximately 1,000 years, and this was also very long in the standards of dragons. There was only 30% of green dragons left and the Quans had gone extinct. Those lands were called the Grave of Species by the dragons, because countless species of Escalifa's ecosystem had completely vanished during the war. Despite the aftermath of the war, time continued flowing and opened up a new era. The surviving green dragons had a party and noisily praised themselves for destroying their longtime nemesis. Hatchlings were not dead in spite of the long battle, and it was about time for the current dragon lord to step down from his position. Another few thousand years and a new era was bound to come to the green dragon race. The new era was ahead of them. Although Noon openly mentioned it, they were all aware of the upcoming change. 
And as for the one that would be the pioneer of the new era, they all thought of one specific dragon. To think we had yet to conduct a Kamingafitch ceremony for you even though you are already 1000 years old. I can only say it is our fault as the previous generation. The one saying that was an old man whose green hair had turned into white. It was rare to see dragons looking like old humans, but that was because he couldn't make himself look young with polymorph due to living for over 9000 years. He was an elder of the green race. What kind of problem will there be to not having a name? How can a candidate of the future dragon lord not have a name? The elder intriguingly smiled in response to the candidate's question, and looked at the young green dragon as if she were a precious jewel. Isn't there not enough time for a Kamingafitch ceremony? That is indeed a problem, but whatever the case, we still need a name. I see. The Lord will soon call you, so you must come up with a name before that. Otherwise, how would he call you? Ah. Decide on it right now. What do you want for your name? The young dragon squinted her eyes for a while, looking anxious as if she was exposed to a noisy song. She opened her mouth after a slight hesitation. Tuz de Rubomana. It meant my grand schema according to the continental language of Escalifa. The vengeful spirits inside her were pleased. B.O.M. also gave a hazy smile with black dead eyes. B.O.M. had a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the dragon lord. Because they would be exposed if they dare try to eavesdrop on their conversation, the vengeful spirits had to leave her brain during the interview. After the conversation, the twelve vengeful spirits poured out questions inside her head. You're back. How was it? Does the dragon lord look like he's going to die soon? B.O.M. calmly replied to each of those questions. Lastly, Lojayathan raised a different question. It seems each previous dragon lord requests for something during a coronation. My daughter, what did that old man ask of you? In response to that question, B.O.M. showed a strange reaction. A shadow was cast over her wasted, pale and exhausted face, seemingly as if the question was difficult to answer. I think the current dragon lord is already out of his mind. What do you mean by that? He wanted living sacrifices for his eternal sleep. Did that old man ask you for living sacrifices? B.O.M. mournfully nodded her head. She then added, that the dragon lord who had gone out of his mind due to the long war was asking for a living dragon. Hearing that ridiculous content, B.O.M. felt goosebumps. If the dragon lord was senile, that would be a problem on its own, but on the other hand, it would be an even more dangerous request if he was sober. Her true nature might have been exposed. Thinking that, Baum recalled the moment of her conversation. That can't be there is no way that old man would ever find out about you. What should we do? I asked if he could change his request to something else but he was stubborn. Did he really request a living dragon as a sacrifice? Then, how about you take a black dragon? Mom. Are you out of your mind? Bilm said with a stern face, questioning how she could sacrifice their own kindred. What? What is the problem? No matter how important the grand schema is, we cannot do that. How could you possibly think of using our comrade as a living sacrifice? How insolent! Her mother, however, replied with a strict voice. Do you still not understand? How much we aspire for the grand schema? Mom! Be quiet! How could the life of one or two of our kindred have any value at this moment? Do you not remember the things we had to suffer in the outer dimension? Innumerable sovereigns attacked us. My friends and families had to shed blood and crumble to death. Lujayathan sternly rebuked B.O.M. You keep your mouth shut. I will command my comrades to take a dragon touring through the outer dimension. However, B.O.M. shook her head. She persuaded her mother that this might be a trap if the dragon lord wasn't actually senile. It would seem strange to find a black dragon from the outer dimension for a sacrifice in such a short period of time. We cannot hunt other dragons, and cannot take our own kindred either. Then what are we supposed to? Her mother's voice came to a stop, as a sigh soon left her mouth. Ah uh, what came next was something Bill hadn't even expected. My dear daughter. Yes mum. You have truly done a great job working hard for such a long time. 
I know clearly what you, who I have given birth to with my life and blood, have suffered through in the stead of your worthless mother. I love you. My dear child. Hearing those unexpected warm words, Bom used her hands filled with wounds to cover her mouth. I love you too, mum. So please let me ask for one favor. Sorry. You know, for that sacrifice. She shouldn't have listened to the next words. How about you give your friends? B.O.M. defied her mother Heden for the first time in her life. The vengeful spirits scolded and her mother was also infuriated. They had a big and emotional fight. At night, her unsleeping body was forced into having a dream. There, Lejiathan showed the atrocities that had happened to the black race time after time to her daughter as a nightmare. In the end, B.O.M. could not defeat her mother. She could not escape her position nor get rid of the future of the black race that was resting on her shoulders. Ill do it. After that, B.O.M. looked for the baby dragons with an even more absent-minded look on her face. Surprisingly, Jul, Curl and Yoram were all in a deep sleep. Even though waking up a sleeping dragon was a very discourteous thing to do, it was related to the coronation of a new dragon lord and was thus excusable. Hello. It's been a very long time. B.O.M. woke the baby dragons up. I found out how to go back to Earth. Forcing a bright smile and with eyes full of tears, she started lying to them. So can you please come to my coronation? Those foolishly nice kids did not turn her down a single time in spite of the situation. All three of them said they will attend the coronation ceremony. The next day, B.O.M. brought all the baby dragons to the dragon lord. And after coming back, she looked for the stimulant. She swallowed a whole pill of the stimulant that could almost kill her. Lying down on the ground, B.O.M. wriggled her body while withstanding the pain. Her breath continued while threatening to stop time after time. B.O.M. spent a few days lying down on the ground with a crushed look on her face. Her vacant gaze was hard to see as that of a living being. Even though her mother belatedly apologized to her, B.O.M. did not reply. She was almost like a corpse. Before long, at the middle of a mountain range on the Ruin Peninsula, at the tip of Mount Cotorosis that was 98,000 meters above sea level, the coronation of the history's youngest and the most gifted dragon lord was held. Every dragon existing in the continent of Escalifa attended regardless of their race and territorial division. It was the first coronation in 15,000 years. Some dragons would not even be able to see one in their entire life. At the peak of the mountain covered in white snow, hundreds of dragons were gathered at one place stretching out their wings while gazing at the altar, creating a majestic scene that no great artist in existence would be able to even mimic. Standing in front of the altar was the current dragon lord who was at least twice as big as other dragons. Although he was very old and was waiting for his death every day, he was still a dragon lord. The old man gazed down the mountain range with his clear eyes and announced to the dragons the start of the coronation. After several formal procedures came the ceremony of oath. Heeding the incantation of the dragon lord, a large and glistening crystal appeared from the thin air. Dragon's origin. That was the greatest inheritance left behind by the first dragon, ancient one, for the dragon race. The future dragon lord, shall step up and stand before dragon's origin. In response to his words, an emerald-colored dragon opened its wings apart and flew into the air, before standing in front of dragon's origin. It was then. The sky opened as a shed of light brightened the crystal. At the same time, B.O.M. was also welcomed by the heavenly light due to standing right in front of dragon's origin. Because the dragon lord was standing nearby, the vengeful spirits and Lujiathan could not create any noise. However, despite not uttering a word, they shivered from the mental pleasure enveloping their existences like a tidal wave. Finally, after all that time, at last. Their thousands of years of history had led them to the end of their grand schema. The time for the black dragons to return to Escalifa was finally just around the corner. Lujiathan, while shuddering from the deathly pleasure filling her mind and soul, shouted out loud. Hurry up and take out the demonic sword of grief, and stab it into dragon's origin and make the oath, that you wish for the black dragons to reside permanently in Escalifa. Before we begin the ceremony of oath, there has been a request from the new dragon lord. However, B. 
bizarre words started leaving the mouth of the previous dragon lord. The vengeful spirits and Lejiathan who had been feeling immense pleasure and the satiation of their thirst could not understand his words straight away. It was thanks to the ones who had been together with her during her first amusement, that the new dragon lord, Tuz de Rubamana says she was able to become one. As such, she has requested that I personally to bless her friends. As he continued speaking, Lejiathan's mind slowly returned to reality. What was that senile old man blabbering about? Lejiathan checked Baum's heart and her expression in a daze. She was still expressionless. Her emotions were also tranquil. But when Baum's old friends started showing themselves one by one from a distance, which was something Lejiathan definitely did not know of, she started to realize that something was going terribly wrong. The future dragon lord, come here. It does not serve right to exclude you when blessing your friends. At last, the dragon lord even called Bom to bless her. Their suspicions were soaring endlessly when Bom drove in a nail with a small mutter. Sorry mum. Lejiathan and the vengeful spirits were about to faint from the shock. Her previous face that looked like a corpse was starting to be filled with life. Of course our race needs to come back to life. I think the same, but now is not the time. There is still the eighth iteration. I'll try my best for one thousand years again later. So please forgive me just this once. Murmuring as such, Bom received the blessing of the Dragon Lord. Soon, he gave the next command. The future dragon lord shall go make the oath for the eternal stability of us dragons. Standing in front of the large crystal, Bom looked back at the baby dragons. She then gave a small grin. Bom had a grand schema. That was different from the aspiration of her mother, and the project linked to the future of her race. It was her own plan that she had been carrying deep inside her heart ever since she perceived Ujidi's death. A dragon lord's oath was the only normal way for an existence to use the power of a transcendent authority. It returned every 15,000 years, and was the reason why dragons were able to survive as a prospering species until now, and was powerful enough to force the expelled black dragons to forever reside in Escalifa. In order to use that unprecedented power for her own plan, Bom had been running around like crazy for a thousand years, which wasn't short even for dragons. She had to thoroughly pretend like she was doing things the black dragons wanted to deceive her mother and the vengeful spirits. It wasn't easy. Her body had been completely crushed and her mind was also half crumbled. Her life had been put to risk dozens of times, and she even had to stop herself several times from wishing for death. Bom had to endure through all that. She withstood the crumbling of her body and the breakdown of her mind. Whenever she was about to truly fall from exhaustion, Baum reminded herself of her objective by looking at the constellations of the night sky. Doing that, she was able to strengthen her mind and remain standing. Bom had a dream. Living a life together with Ujidi in the distant future again. That was Baum's grand schema. Born as a mutant, she was able to lie without being caught out by anyone. Her saying that she would try her best for the grand schema of raising their race back up was a lie. What Bom wanted was Ujidi from the very start. Her saying that the Dragon Lord had been seeking for a sacrifice was a lie. What Bom wanted was a re-encounter with the baby dragons. Her taking the baby dragons over to the Dragon Lord was a lie. When her mother and the vengeful spirits cut off their connection from her, thinking that she was going to the Dragon Lord, Bom embraced the baby dragons and poured out her honest tears that she had been hiding for a thousand years. She then shared everything that happened with the baby dragons. It all began from the first event. An accidental landing on Earth from the distortion in Providence. Ujidi being broken from the repetitive regressions, and his grudge against dragons. The deceit he had been concealing against them, as well as the shocking event that had happened to herself. But Ujidi who started to dream of hope and atonement while living a daily life with them, and him dying due to the aftermath of killing Ujidi of the sixth iteration at the start of that atonement. And lastly. Guys. I found the method to go back. After hearing all that, the baby dragons hugged each other and it became an ocean of tears. Bom had only shared a portion of the things Ujidi wanted to atone for. Those were already shocking enough but none of the kids blamed him for what he did. 
for the happiness they had received from him was already far greater than that. As the tears settled back down, B.O.M. reiterated the reason she gathered them. Let's, go back. To our happiest days. Standing in front of Dragon's origin, B.O.M. thought to herself. He said his time of suffering summed up to around a thousand years. Coincidentally, she also had to spend a similar amount of time in despair and frustration. It was unclear whether his view on time as a human was exactly the same as her perception on time as a dragon. However, her thousand years at the war allowed B.O.M. to understand him a little bit better. What came as solace when she was about to crumble and falter from despair was the time she had spent with Eugidi. Her unforgetting memories endlessly revived her happiest moments, and how he had strenuously tried to save her. However, the old Eugidi wouldn't have had a place like that to lean on. How lonely would it have been? How exhausting would his life have been? Therefore, in the process of making the oath at Dragon's origin while sacrificing the demonic sword of grief, B.O.M. decided to take out a small fragment of her soul. The main body of her soul that contained the personality and memory would be sent back to the timeline where Eugidi existed with the baby dragons. And the small fragment will be sent to the young Eugidi, who was alone from birth and lonely with noon to rely on. It would become the friend of his lonely self and a teacher for the young and immature Eugidi. A lover that would give him a warm hug during his fatigue, and a family he could rely and rest on. And as a symbol of her desire and wish for his freedom, she shaped it into the form of a white bird. At last, as she neared the end of her grand schema, B.O.M. stood in front of Dragon's origin and gazed into the sky. I hereby vow, that we may go back to the happiest days we had spent with our precious one. She threw her arms wide open. Her eyes full of life were facing the sky as she whispered a prayer. And become happy together. In that instant, light flooded out of Dragon's origin and enveloped the baby dragons. It was immediately after he successfully crushed the pillars of the banquet hall. He tried to crawl out of primal time. Because his goal was to block the entrance to the non-providental world, Eugidi used every bit of strength he had left to fly towards him like a cannonball. Due to that, he who had been crawling out of the veil was sucked back into the non-providental world and the same had happened to Eugidi who was pushing him inside. The weapon of a building, Pallas successfully crushed the small room that served as the entrance to the non-providential world and completely sealed it. Because of that, Eugidi was pushed out of the providential world. It was the first time he was coming to the non-providential world. This place was a dark and cold place. Since it probably wasn't cold in the physical sense of the word, it was most probably a chill he was feeling due to his soul being shattered apart. However, the size of his soul that was built up throughout his life was too big, and he did not disappear with ease despite being crushed and shattered. It simply felt cold. The severe chilliness made him shrink his body. Because he had fully executed his mission, Vintage Clock did not look for him, and Key had no more business with him either. Besides, they were transcendent authorities that could only involve themselves in providential matters. That was why there would be Noon who could bring him out of this cold place. He could only shiver here for almost an eternity. The only thing he could do here was search through his past memories. Like a brain in a vat, he could do nothing but think. Is this happiness? Am I happy? He blamed his old friend a little. Wasn't I definitely going to be happy? Isn't that what you told me? Time flew by. Although he was used to waiting, waiting without any objective felt way too long for him. It was cold. Like an eternal winter. His blunt senses could not identify anything around him, but that was when some force stretched out like a hand and reached him. He widened his eyes into circles. That power melted his frozen body and woke up his sinking mind. Despite his soul being half-crushed, it was still alive and Eugidi was therefore able to wake up. It felt like it had been a thousand years. What's happening? The hand grabbed onto his body and started pulling him somewhere. By the time he perceived what was happening, he lost consciousness. When he opened his eyes again, there was a familiar street in front of his eyes. His flustered gaze scanned across the world. Roads covered in asphalt, buildings rising up above them and people carrying umbrellas in quick steps. 
Black and white cars dashed across as sounds of horns reached his ears and perhaps due to a recent rainfall, the sky was colored in a dull gray light. Within the world filled with achromatic colors, he was the only one with color. He gasped for breath, for he just could not comprehend what was happening in front of him. This was Nan Hyundong, and it was five years ago. This time and space was the starting point of his wretched life which he had confronted thousands of times. Did the eighth iteration begin or something? Since his will had been worn out over the long period of time, his mind wasn't back to normal despite returning to reality. Like a drunk person, he couldn't judge things properly. His phone rang in his confusion it was a call related to his work. Work? Out of habit, he first decided to move like the last iteration. 7 a.m. It was time to go to work. Wearing the police uniform, he went to work. Despite being early in the morning, Gangnam was filled with people. It was them living their everyday life, and he recognized it as something familiar despite his hazy mind. He traveled towards the portal bureau. By the time he reopened his eyes, an even more familiar sight welcomed him. It was the Academy City of Lair. The familiar scene of Haitling, and the familiar cadet uniforms. It was filled with things he was so familiar with, that he couldn't imagine any other place that he was more used to. Jita Sunbi, hello. Jidi's here as well. We had way too much drink last night yeah. But seeing his colleagues welcoming him after commuting to work, Eugidi felt strange. Ha. Huh. Don't you think Jita Sunbi looks a bit different now? Wait what? Was he always that tall? It was strange that his colleagues were one by one walking up to him. There were people he was used to that should be walking up to him for a chat, but these weren't them. Also, there was a place he was used to which was shared by all of them, and this wasn't that place either. Ha! Huh. Jita Sunbi. Where are you going? Eugidi turned his body and left the police station. Although his mind had yet to return properly, he hurried his feet. He couldn't move his body properly so he had to rely on public transport. Walking all the way, there were many things he felt familiar with, as well as things that felt foreign to him. Everything was the same as before, and yet he was considering them either familiar or foreign. What surfaced before anything else among his hazy emotions was that sense of familiarity and a habit. As always, his habit of thinking of the worst possible scenario reared its head. There were things that still remained in a corner of his memories and emotions. In fact, there were a lot of them so much that he couldn't count them all. It must be because all of those connections had snapped into nothing, that he was standing here. This felt as if the eighth iteration had begun. It was similar to his familiar experiences, of how everything that had been precious to him forgot about him, and went further away while leaving him behind. Continuing that line of thought made his heart crumble from the core. He had to confirm it with his own eyes. That was why he headed to Firenze, Italy to the road filled with buildings that seemed to be from the Renaissance period. He had been here often and thanks to his sharp discerning ability, he knew those performing street musicians were very familiar. If all the time that went by wasn't fake, then the one he was the most used to definitely had to be here. However, he couldn't find her. The conspicuous olive-colored hair, the face that exceeded the threshold of beauty and appeared repulsively beautiful, and the existence that naturally gathered attention wherever she went. He could not see her. No it wasn't Olive. Although it was slightly foreign to him, it was definitely black. After changing his mind, he once again scanned across the streets but like before, he could not find such a person. He stood still. Although it was too early to admit it, he felt his heart slowly crumbling down from its core. Because it was the first encounter which he had been so used to, he realized that the invalidity of that meant the disappearance of something that was the most familiar to him. But after blankly standing there for a while and slowly coming back to his senses, he found it strange again. The reason he was used to this first encounter, was because the opponent forgot about him. Now, that sense of familiarity was gone, and that meant. Tap tap. Someone tapped him on his shoulder. He felt goosebumps immediately rising all over his body. Slowly, he turned around. And found a black-haired girl staring at him. His gaze wavered. It was such a familiar face a familiar pair of eyes and a smile. 
He smiled back. He wasn't intending on doing so, but a smile naturally appeared on his lips. It was because he got the verification that all the time he had spent was not fake. Hi. He greeted her with a dry voice. Hello. For some reason, the voice that came back from her sounded as exhausted as his own. Even though there was a smile on her lips, there were beads of tears beneath her eyes. It was as if she was seeing him after a very long time. He wanted to ask what was going on, but she suddenly lowered her head a little and gazed up at him with uplifted eyes. She was trying to pull a prank. Why did you come looking for me? Ah, this scene. Feeling like he could remember this, Ujidi recalled the words he said to her. Because I have a business. So you came here knowing who I am. Damn it he wanted to stop this immediately. Therefore, he asked her. Who are you? A smile bloomed on her face like a flower. She cried and smiled. After being unable to control her own expression for a little while. At last to her lover whom she finally met again in a world without any scars, she whispered. Im your Bilam. Kidnapped dragons. The end. Bom opened the window wide open. Light from the warm midsummer sun showered in through the window. They were at the house she used to stay in, and this was also where they were going to bring the kids to for the time being. It was a great day with a refreshing breeze and not a speck of dust visible in the blue sky. Has sunlight always been so warm? Despite being in a setting that he had experienced countless times already, it gave him a completely different impression. Before long, Bom turned around and faced him. Slowly, she walked towards him so in return, he reached his arms out and bent his back. Standing on her toes, she wrapped her arms around his neck. He gave the child a tight hug as she took a deep breath out while feeling the arms pressing down on her ribs. That breath made it feel all the more realistic. What is going on? Why are you here, and what happened to this iteration? And how? Ujidi used to know everything as the one at the center of the regression, but now that he wasn't, he had no idea what was happening to him. Aha! Uh -huh. A teary look appeared on her face again. She started a short and brief explanation of everything that happened until now. One thousand years. Throughout that unbelievably long period of time, she suffered and was bruised until she was at last able to reach this moment. Her journey was conveyed with a small amount of her memories. Ujidi gave Baum another tight hug along with a deep sigh. He didn't know how he was supposed to console her. Although he only heard a portion of it, her story was shocking, astonishingly agonizing and that in turn made him realize how priceless and valuable this moment was. That was the same for Bilam. She squinted her eyes, and heaved a sigh while seemingly holding her tears in. Ah, I promised not to do this. Nothing. They were bound to be closer during a deep hug. He lowered his head as Baum lifted hers and looked into his eyes. There was something permeating inside in their distance of touching breaths. Supporting herself by resting her hands on his shoulders, she stood on her toes. The two of them brought their lips closer at the same time. Their mixing tongues conveyed the warmth that proved they were alive. HNN a small moan was heard as he bit on her lower lips. In that moment of long-awaited happiness, Ujidi slowly coveted her lips. At one point, the two of them separated their lips. Without even voicing it out loud, they both knew that staying together in such a steamy atmosphere might make them waste a few days. He slowly wiped the smudged lipstick on her lips with his thumb. He'll bring the kids back. Okay. In order to not ruin his reunion with the other kids, BOM decided to wait at home. However, Ujidi had to stop while he was in the middle of opening the door. BOM, who was behind him by the time he realized it, was wrapping her arms around his waist while leaning her forehead on his back. Don't be late. BOM said Yoram and Curl would be waiting at the same place as before. Dragons could remember something and never forget them in their lives. Because of that, standing in the same environment and comparing the scene to their memories to find differences was an enjoyable experience for them. It was slightly different from how humans tended to look for similarities by comparing their environment to their hazy memories, but it was apparently fun nonetheless. That was why Ujidi headed to Africa. 
walking across the desert under the scorching sun for half a day, he felt deeply fatigued and exhausted for the first time in a very long time. Due to his soul being worn out over a long period of time, his mana and body were both very weakened. A portion of his power had been permanently lost, but even the leftover remnant in his body wasn't being used to its full potential. He would have to train himself again. In any case, right now he was at one of the desolate deserts of South Africa. A red-haired girl was sitting on a large rock with some sloppily crafted wooden mask on her face. She turned her head. The moment his eyes met with the crimson eyes behind the mask. Yoram shot out of her seat and threw her arms into the air. U-J-I-T-A-E. She then yelled with a voice loud enough to make the desert cover its ears. He returned a bright smile while wiping the beads of sweat flowing down his forehead, and that was when Yoram jumped down from the rock and began dashing towards him. Soon, she jumped from a distance, wrapped her arms around his neck and grabbed onto his body like a koala. For a moment, he almost fell down, but he returned the hug after somehow standing his ground. It's been a while, you Yoram. Hugging her, he tapped her on her back. I really wanted to see you again. She, however, did not say anything in response. Cuddling onto him, Yoram stayed silent for a long time and what next broke the silence was her trembling breath. You know. While hugging his head as if it was a precious baby, Yoram added in spite of finding it difficult to collect her breath. Me too. There were a lot of things Yoram wanted to tell him. From the things that happened until now to how she had been longing to meet him again, as well as how everything she learned from him was able to change her. However, she couldn't do so because pouring her thoughts out right now might make her emotions explode like a bomb. Yoram found herself unbearably cringe from how teary she was getting. So, she gave a bright smile instead, threw her mask and shouted. I missed you so much. Dear. She then drove her head into his forehead as hard as she could. Slam. For some unknown reason, the sound was a lot louder than she expected and the impact was also far greater. What she saw next was Ujidi who had fainted with his eyes still open. Ha! Huh. Dear! Dear! His skin was swelling up in red. There was a bump on his forehead. Sorry! Yerim said but she did not look sorry in the slightest. Soon, she giggled, pfft, hop. It was probably because of the red mark on his forehead alongside the tall lump. You are seriously too much, Yoram. Ang. How can you try to break the head of a person you're seeing in a thousand years? I didn't know you would be so weak. Knucklehead little Yoram. Copying how she used to talk in the distant past, she even acted cute even though it now felt very awkward to do so. Acting as similarly to the past as possible that was the second agreement the kids had come up with, so that Ujidi would not feel a sense of loss from all the time that went by. And their first agreement was to not cry. If they all started crying, the several sorrowful memories would end up making them cry for a few days, and that would make him sincerely concerned. But this was separate from that, and it really was very amusing for Yoram. Meanwhile, he was dumbfounded. She should at least be holding her laughter in, but was pretending to apologize with a face that was threatening to erupt into a laughter. He was about to irritatedly run his fingers through his hair but accidentally ended up touching the bump. Seeing him frown, Yoram at last bursted out into laughter and rolled on the floor. Telling her he would be going to pick up Curl, he suggested they enjoy the reunion in full later, and only then did Yoram stop laughing and stand up from the ground. Wearing a bright smile on her face, she showed the thing that was on her right hand. You want the mask? On the way to meeting Curl, he stopped by a bakery. He bought all types of bread as well as macarons and sausage buns. It was because he heard Curl still liked bread and sweet desserts despite all the time that went by. According to B.O.M. and Yoram, it seemed that the kids had spent nearly 1,000 years at Escalifa. But for some reason, their appearances were the same as the one in his memories but he didn't ask why that was the case. He was now going to check it with his own eyes. Ujidi wanted to see the chattery Curl, and Joel who would now be an adult. Thus, he was in the rainforests of Amazon. Wiping the sticky sweat of the extremely humid forest, he was walking when a voice reached his ears. A juicy. 
It was the voice of a girl who found him before he did. That especially clear and pure voice was the same as Cowell's voice which he used to hear like a radio in his dreams while he was floating adrift in the non-providential world. Soon, Curl showed up from the dense trees of the forest. Her bright gold hair and bright gold eyes were the same. Although the naive and fragile smile was no longer on her lips, her face brightened immediately after seeing him. A juicy. I missed you Curl. Yun. Me too. Clenching her lips, Curl walked up to him. He reached his arms out to give her a hug but Curl flinched and stopped her feet. Ah, please wait. Wait. I haven't prepared myself yet, so you can't suddenly come up to me like that. With his arms still out wide, he slowly took a few steps back as Curl tilted her head and cleared her throat with a few coughs, Kuhum. She then opened her mouth while slightly looking away from him. Yum. Don't tell me you brought some bread again. How did you know that? I brought all sorts of them. I bet you will like all of them. Like, a juicy, do you think of me as a pig or something? How come you always buy sweets and bread all the time? Well, you like these don't you? But what if I don't want them? Listen. I've never seen these fail before. Wow. No. When I went back home, I made the chef cook it so many times. I had so many of them that, yum, I don't need them anymore okay. Sometimes, Curl tended to deny the truth like this. He grinned before swinging the bag of bread in front of her as the sweet scent of bread traveled across. So, you don't want them? Likey, ha, huh, seriously. She turned and started approaching him. Being always on the receiving end like this. Ignoring the bag of bread, she leaned her head on his chest. He gave her a confused hug when her voice left her mouth like a sigh. I regretted it a lot, you know. Her voice turned watery so Curl needed another empty cough to clear her throat. Hmm, Kuhum. Then, she whispered with a softer voice. That's why I tried preparing something in my own way. You did. Yun. This. Curl rummaged through her dimensional storage before taking something out. It was a bottle of alcohol. The only thing I saw you look for sometimes was alcohol, so. Oh, alcohol. That is very good. Ujidi was quite delighted. It was true that there was nothing else he really looked for except for alcohol. Really? Here you go. It's for you. It'll give you mine as well. I don't need the bread. There's Nutella and cream inside. Don't need them. There's two slices of cheese on your favorite sausage bun as well. Wah. I'm telling you it's fine. They shared their gifts. Despite heaving a sigh, Curl took in a sneaky smell of the bread before taking the bag of bread and placing it inside her dimensional storage. Let's go back home. Okay. After saying that, Ujidi asked about Joel. Hearing his question, Curl who was looking half dejected until now, suddenly giggled with a bright look on her face. You know what? Joel is actually very mad right now. Joel is mad. Yun Yun. She's saying it's very unfair. Ah, right. How old do I look to you a juicy? Dunno. You look the same as before. Right? I was actually more of an adult than this, but I came into this body. And it was the same for Joel. That means Joel is at. Kuhihi, with a giggle, Ko pointed at her neck at the necklace with a downscaled dragon egg. Yun, she's here. He took the kids to Bomb's house. The house was fairly big, and had three rooms. When he saw B.O.M. again after bringing the kids back, her hair was no longer black, and looked as if it was slowly turning to a bluish-green color. The roots of her hair were bluish green while the rest was slightly darker. Welcome everyone. She had ordered all sorts of dishes, from spicy chicken feet to jock ball, fried chicken, two pizzas, Chinese cuisines including sweet and sour pork and stir-fried vegetables, several types of burgers, ice creams, noodles and street food like tekbaki, fried dumplings and odin. Yua. That smells crazy. For some reason, they all looked quite familiar. Huck. Don't tell me this is sweet onion bomb chicken. 
It smells exactly the same. And then. And the one next to that is chili mayo sauce. They sell it separately but I tried buying it. What do you think? You are amazing, Uni. Are you like Mrs. Edital? The next one to comment in surprise was Yoram. Ho. Is this what I think it is? N.N. Spicy chicken feet. It's your favorite, right? How spicy. Inferno 7 apparently. I asked the owner to make it a bit more spicy. Wow. I missed this quite a lot. Feels great to have this again. Yoram and Curl said with sparkling eyes. But that wasn't the end. Placed in front of Ujidi was a very familiar burger. This. It's from back then. Do you remember it? Of course I do. I made that myself. Ujidi smiled seeing how thorough Bill M was. The burger she made looked exactly the same as the one he got from his benefactor back when he was young. She appeared to have used the burger they made during Jiol's school election in the past as a reference. Byom. Yes. Thank you. This makes me very happy. Byom nodded with a smile. Sitting at the table full of food that might even cause the legs of the table to bend, the four of them waited. They weren't praying or anything. Usually, Yoram would have picked up some food to mark the start of the meal while throwing out some words like, thanks for the food, but today, none of the kids were keen on eating anything. It was the same for Ujidi. Even though he had his hands on the burger, he couldn't eat it. Sunlight was casting shadows inside the house. Delicious food was in front of them, and they were with their precious ones. Having a nice meal together, they would share the trivial things that happened to them that day. It was such a normal moment. It was nothing but one of the countless insignificant moments that were so common that it didn't even leave any significant impression on them in the past. However, it was now different. How many things have they gone through just to reobtain this experience? What kind of life did they have to go through just to feel this small happiness again? Remembering all the things that happened to them, Curl could not readily bring the drumstick in her hand towards her mouth. W.H., what's wrong with everyone? Hee <laughs> hee. But something like this was not what Curl wanted. She awkwardly swung the drumstick like a cheering stick. Uni. Hello. Let's hurry up and eat. Yuan. She shook it once to B.O.M., and once to Yoram. Same with you a juicy. What is wrong with everyone? The food's going cold. Then, Curl shook the chicken in front of Ujidi. Like, seriously. Boonies. You didn't forget that did you? Wake up, all of you. If we meet him again. Then let's push aside all the sorrow, have a relaxed conversation like we always used to and share what happened until now. Let's open up to him everything that happened to us, without making him feel burdened. That was what they had agreed on, but it seemed that the kids couldn't control themselves anymore. Bringing her hands that were grasping on the spoon to her forehead, Baum deeply lowered her head and began silently sobbing to herself. All the blood and tears she had shed her suffering in times of despair reappeared inside her head. Before long, Yoram covered her face with her hands and started crying as well. Her fully capable memories had been endlessly drawing her most precious relationship in the world in her head regardless of the time. Yoram had missed him tremendously. She missed the one who gave her her future, hope and trust. Ah, what are you guys all doing you're the one who said we shouldn't cry. Throughout the not so short period of her amusement, Ko had only been on the receiving end. Recalling the unfathomable regret she had felt after the farewell upon belatedly realizing that she couldn't return any of it, she followed her sisters and began weeping out loud. Someone said in the past. That people smiled when they're sad because they remembered all the happy times that went by. And that people cried when they're happy because they remembered all the hard times that went by. That day, the dining table became an ocean of tears. It was because everyone was now happy. A regression in the providence of time was an extremely exhausting experience for an existence. Since the kids cried for hours despite all the accumulated fatigue, it was natural for them to become lethargic afterwards. However, they still wanted to eat the food so they heated the food back up and ate everything before going into their own rooms. 
they all wanted to have some sleep. Yujidi was also tired and was not in a good state, but he didn't go to sleep yet. It was because the dragon egg that had been separated from Kao's necklace was placed in the middle of the living room, on top of Baum's flower pot. He sat next to the egg and stared at it. Closing his eyes, he could feel the vitality inside the egg. Although she hadn't hatched yet, she was definitely fully born and could break out of the egg any time soon. When the kids were pouring out buckets of tears, Yujidi sensed something twitching inside the egg. What did Crow say again? Jul said it was, like, different from what she heard. And that it's unfair she said her hands were shivering and how she wouldn't be able to trust green dragons again. Saying that, she chuckled. Kao's laughter always put him in a good mood. Floating a small smile, he placed his hand on top of the egg and slowly caressed it. That was when he felt something strange. Kong. Something tapped the shell from inside the egg. Ho. There was no way he was feeling things. He carefully lifted the large egg and placed it on his lap, before caressing it again. This time, it came twice. Kong Kong. Yu Zhou. Are you there? While thinking of how this was similar to prenatal education, he opened his mouth again. Why are you still hiding there? I missed you so much. Didn't you tell me you'd come back as an adult when you're twenty? Look at you rather than an adult, you became a baby. He caressed the egg with a smile. Like a mother talking to her unborn baby, he quietly talked to her, and explained how much he missed her as well as how happy he was to meet her again. Then, he unfastened his watch and placed it above the egg to play some bright and exciting music. Even though he didn't really know why, he knew this was what people tended to do for prenatal education. He'll be waiting for you to come out of your egg. It probably won't take that long. It's your second time so you know how it's supposed to be done, right? Kong. Don't be in too much of a rush though. Your soul did come here but your body is still that of a baby, so you might hurt yourself if you try to rush things. Kong Kong. All right. I'm sure you are also tired from the regression. Take a good rest. He placed the egg back on the flower pot and was about to go into his room when the egg suddenly turned noisy. Kong Kong. It seemed that she was telling him not to leave. Therefore, he carefully carried the egg, headed to the bed and lied down next to Baum who was quietly letting out a snore. It was time to have some sleep. He closed his eyes inside the blanket with the egg next to him. Meanwhile, Joel inside the egg was very disappointed. Her sisters had already met Yujidi and were talking about this and that and yet she was stuck in this place without even being able to see anything. I have to hurry up and keep my promise. Thinking like that made her once again feel how unfair everything was. After being suggested to go back to the past, she naturally thought she would be keeping her body but she was suddenly placed inside an egg. This wasn't what they had agreed on. How long had she been longing for this moment? It was 300 years 300 years she had spent with her eyes open waiting to meet Yujidi again. And yet now that she was back, she was locked inside an egg. There were two problems. One was that she still needed some time to hatch from the egg. And the second problem was that someone found out how depressed she was the next day. Egu. The moment she heard that voice from the other side of the egg, Joel had a hunch that something extremely infuriating would be happening from now on. What should we do about our poor little Joel? And her hunch was not wrong. The owner of that voice was the garbage dragon Yu Yoram. We had a meal with our dear Ajusi yesterday, and now we're going to go out on a walk, and come back at night after buying some clothes. What should we do about Joel? Should we get a hand to help her hatch? Kwang Kwang. Joel smacked the egg with her fists as hard as she could. However, the tough shell of the dragon egg stayed firm. Oi you Joel. Listen up. I'm going to have a meal with my dear darling, watch a movie, play games, ask for instant noodles and go slaying together. Uni. Stop. She's gonna cry. Go to an amusement park, a cat cafe, go to a Donburi restaurant together, and have a super special do not do not time with the three of us including Curl. Of course, that will be without you. Wah. Just stop, you devil. 
Joel was so frustrated that her hands shivered and she felt like bursting into tears. I guess I'm the winner for being born early. Ah, fuck. Forget what I said. Suddenly, she walked away while sounding dejected for some reason. In any case, Joel had to suppress her fury. She was no longer young enough to be provoked by something like that. She wasn't a baby anymore, and had lived for a thousand years just like Bjorn, Yoram and Curl. Although she stayed away from needless experiences as much as possible to keep her existing memories as special as possible and was now in the body of a baby, she was still not a child. At least that was what Jill thought about herself. All she had to do was hatch from the egg. The moment she hatched, she would also go shopping, go on a walk, play games, and ask for noodles. Go slaying together. The Duna Duna Super Special Edition. And calling you Jidi by a different name as promised. Oh my, dear. Can I call you Appa from today? She would be doing all the above. Or maybe uncle. I can do everything. If you don't like any of them, then. What about the? Stop. You crazy woman. But after breaking out of the shell in a few weeks time, Joel became even more depressed. It was when she polymorphed into a human form after hatching from the egg. She had no idea how this could possibly be happening, and wondered if the entire world was trying its best to tease her or something. Joel, who wanted to say something to Eugidi, soon heaved a sigh with a gloomy look on her face. Oh wow. Look at her mumble. She couldn't speak. Yua. Seriously, Joel is super tiny so adorable. Baby Joel heaved a deep sigh as she constantly ran her minute fingers through her watercolored hair. Oh no oh no. She looks mad. They said as if they were watching a monkey at the zoo. Guys. Don't be too mean to Joel. I'm sure she's very stressed out from turning smaller, said Bioem. Giles' eyes turned into a glare after hearing those words. Whose fault was it that she was in this state, HNN? As expected, BOM was also grinning, and it was obvious that she was teasing her. Do you see this? This kid so short-tempered. Please, I hope you just go away. Instead of saying that, all she could manage out of her mouth were a few mumbles, and the kids bursted into laughter as if it was funny. What? What do you want? I'm in a super bad mood, okay? She tried to protest, but her mouth could only form incomplete sounds. It was only adding fuel to their laughter. It was still too hard to control her body. She couldn't speak properly, and couldn't make delicate movements either. Even though she wanted to write letters, they were always crooked. Come here. Let's go to sleep. Mumble. Joel opened her mouth in reflex but Eugidi tilted his head so she gave up on speaking. She instead decided to express it with her body. Yun. I see, I see. Are you hungry, little Joel? Curl said as if she would give her food, so baby Joel placed one of her hands on her hip and shook her other hand to shoo her away. What? Say it properly if you want something. Joel drew a line across her neck with her thumb while looking at Yoram who was trying to pick a fight. She was telling her she would kill her one day. In the end, she decided to show off her mature side. At night, she sat on a chair to read a book and had some warm black tea on the side. However, what Joel didn't know was how she would appear to the others when toddling to the kettle, carefully pouring hot water, flipping the pages of the book with her tiny hands while looking at the words with her circular eyes. Ah hi Joel is so cute. Ah, she's being so damn cute. If only I could bite and swallow her whole. That was why her suffering knew no end. My little sister. I got something for you. One day, Yoram brought diapers, toys and nursery mobiles and handed them over to Joel with a wide smile hanging on her lips. Joel looked at her as if she was staring at trash before chucking her gift on the ground. Dude. How can you do that to my gift? Yoram protested. But that wasn't the end. Joel. I bought some too. This time, Curl came up while showing her a teddy bear and a pacifier. What? What do you want? Jill asked with her gaze but the look on Cowell's face was clearly not normal either. 
Until now, she had been simply enjoying herself, but there were now small fumes leaving her nostrils. Can you please put this in your mouth? Yun. While pushing forward the pacifier in her hand, Ko turned on the camera of her watch with her other hand. Wow. These guys. They must be seriously crazy. Thinking that, Joel quickly turned around and began running away but Yoram and Ko both chased after her. Kaya ha ha ha. Ang. Please, let's just take one photo. You look way too cute right now. No. Oi oi. You Joel. If you don't want that, how about my titties? Hell no. What type of nonsense is that? What's going on? What is all this ruckus for? That was when Eugidi left his room to ask the kids. Curl hid her hands behind her back and smiled hee hee, while Yoram also took her hands away from her breasts and gave an awkward smile. It was because he told them before not to overdo their teasing. Meanwhile, Joel gazed up at Eugidi as if she had come across her savior. They are like, teasing me. She mumbled while looking up at Eugidi, who replied to her with a faint smile. Do you want milk? Yoram and Curl almost rolled on the floor laughing. While Joel felt betrayed by Eugidi for the first time. Thus, he had to suit the child later. With one hour of Duna Duna. At the start, they were trying to imitate how they used to act in the past, but they were back to their past selves by the time they realized it. They were all quite surprised because of how their minds and attitudes changed because of the environment. However, they weren't exactly the same as before. One thousand years for a dragon was similar to ten years for a human, and because that was when they were acknowledged as adult dragons, they were pretty much like twenty-year-old humans in terms of their role in the society. Even the small Joel was a full-fledged adult inside. Thus, the usual topics of their conversations were also slightly different. During mealtime, they consistently talked about their plans for the distant future as well as the past. One of the things the kids were the most concerned about was how we were supposed to live from now on. Before coming back in time. Bomb calmly opened her mouth. There were people I lost in my past connections. She remembered how Li Hua left one day after bidding her farewell. That Taiwanese old lady found a trace of a sail Khalifa who killed her husband decades ago and left for her final revenge. And there, she died with a sail Khalifa. Granny wouldn't have died if I helped her back then. It was a memory she had pushed to a corner because of the myriad of thoughts in her mind back then. BOM was a little regretful after recovering her mind, because she had lent an ear to her stories and supported her when she was tired. But this time, I can help her. Curl nodded in response to her words. I also have to take Chirpy back, she said. Right? Yun. Chirpy would die without me so. That was what Yoram, who had to defeat her oldest Uni again, and Joel, who had given happiness and vitality to the boys at a certain dimension, all agreed with. Lastly, Yujidi was also going to form a good bond with BM and Myung Yanga. That sounds good. We will also have regular things to work on, then. Let's live a normal life and within the small gaps of everyday life, let us take in everything close to us that we were able to take care of in the past. That was the conclusion they came up with. They were all confident. It was something they had done already, and it definitely wouldn't be too difficult. After concluding that topic, the four pairs of eyes naturally gathered at Eugidi. How were we supposed to live now? An amusement was just a brief passing moment in the life of a dragon. That in turn showed how deep and intense the memories they had created with Eugidi were, despite how short it was. Their souls, memories and the power of their wills were all still here after the accumulation of one thousand years, but their bodies were still that of a baby dragon, and the formula of emergency summon and long-distance dimensional intersection would definitely be automatically activated by the origin fragment. In other words, their amusement would still come to an end in another twenty years. It meant they had to part ways with Eugidi once again. What's wrong with all of you? In planning on following you guys to Escalifa. However, Eugidi dismissed their concerns with a few sentences. There is no reason for me to stay here. Only then did the kids show bright smiles. A lot of time went by after that. 
This time, unlike the previous iteration, they did not enter lair because none of them were that keen on the life of a cadet anymore. However, they did sometimes sneak in to use the facilities as they wanted. Clank. Clank. After some time, the dimensions cracked open as protectors crowded in. BOM stopped three of them, turned them off and kept them locked inside an alternate dimension and only brought back the protector of the green dragons. Next was up to Ujidi. Even though he had lost his accumulated killing intent, he still had authorities of the demon archduke. Taking care of the protector was nothing difficult. When everything was over, Yoram returned to the house which was slightly messy from the uproar. Are you done cleaning? Kurok. She kicked a rubbish bin, as all the other dragons giggled with her. The protector had a puzzled look on its face. But after that, Yoram started picking up the rubbish with it so the protector's doubt deepened even more. The protector thought that they all had a screw loose or something. After a few more months, Ko brought Chirpy. Chirp, chirp. The palm-sized baby chicken finally appeared at their house and Ko vowed to take good care of the chicken until he had to leave. Me me me. I can do it very well this time. The number of spirit beasts she had raised for centuries while looking after the gnome village was at least several hundred, and Kao's method of caring for Chirpy the spirit beast was therefore on a completely different level. She healed the baby chicken who was injured and hurt, washed him clean, took a refreshing walk every day and gave him delicious food to healthily raise him up. Wow! Curl, that's really amazing! Right? Even though she said that, B.O.M. tilted her head. That yellow furry ball why was it so big? More and more question marks appeared above her head as time went by. And in the blink of an eye, Chirpy was as big as an average large dog. Ha! Huh. H.N.N. Wait a minute. Before long, her concerns were realized. Hmm. Curl. Don't you think he's a bit too big? After another two years, Chirpy was tall enough to reach Cowl's chest. Chirp. He let out a low and heavy growl as Curl awkwardly scratched her head. H, he's still smaller than me though. Isn't it strange to compare the size of a baby chicken to you? Is, is it? Then a horse. You can think of him as a horse. B.O.M. tilted her head, wondering what nonsense this was about, but Curl was unexpectedly very optimistic about it. After that, she started riding Chirpy. A baby chicken as large as a bear raced through the vast wasteland. Kaya. Vun. The world's biggest baby chicken was fluffy. It was a very comfortable ride. In between his everyday life, Ujidi tried his hardest to regain his lost power whenever he had the time. Honestly, there wouldn't be too big of a problem in the world for the time being even if he wasn't there. The association was a lot more powerful than demons and monsters combined. However, there were still times when he had to step up, and he thus needed to regain his strength. Ujidi scrutinized his body. His entire body was lethargic mana had been paved away alongside his soul the manipulation of mana was also affected because of his will being shaken due to staying lethargic for too long and his killing intent was pretty much all gone there were several complex reasons why Ujidi was weakened. Even though some of them were being naturally recovered over time, it was far from enough. He had to personally move his body or meditate in order to raise his strength back up. It wasn't anything difficult. He had been doing it for at least several centuries, and he had already once become the strongest human in existence with effort alone. What? You want to train together? On the morning of a certain refreshing day, Ujidi asked Yoram to go training together. She, who was wearing leggings and a crop top, tilted her head with a frown. What's going on? Weren't you the one who always turned me down? I don't like having someone next to me while I train. Far out let me just ask while we're at it. You weren't like, hiding all the good stuff from me or anything, right? Ujidi shook his head. To be frank, Yoram wouldn't be able to copy him even if she saw what he was doing, because Ujidi was using an extremely inhumane, horrendous and self-destructive method to train himself. So, what are we going to do? In response to Yoram's question, Ujidi gave his reply. Let's have a spar, like an actual fight. Yoram squinted her eyes. Like an actual fight? 
Yoram knew better than anyone else what Ujidi meant by saying an actual fight. Everything she learned from him was always in a stricter condition than what others could consider an actual fight. But whenever he used the words, actual fight, it always led to a life-or-death situation where her life was threatened at every passing moment. Are you sure you can handle what you said? Why not? Ha ha. I think you're looking down on me too much. Yoram turned around and faced Ujidi from the front. You haven't seen me train ever since we lived together right? I'm probably a lot stronger than you think. I know. No you don't. What you remember is how I was at the end of the amusement. Locking her fingers, she did a big stretch. Even though she was back to her young body, the cluster of will which contained mana her soul was still that of the one zero 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 year old Yuyorum. She had easily killed her oldest Uni, the cream of the crop, and never stopped refining herself until she was a thousand years old. She was by far the strongest out of the dragons of her generation. Yoram was about as strong as an average adult dragon. Although her body was weakened due to the regression, her combat skills were still with her. She was like a small car on the outside, except she had the engine of a sports car. I'm pretty strong, you know. Yoram said with a low voice while giving him a chilly gaze. If you want an actual fight, I'm not going to restrain myself. I'm going to do what you did to me. Can I do that? It wasn't a warning she was trying to double-check whether it really was okay to do as he said or not. Yoram. That's quite funny, said Ujidi. What is? You're talking as if you are obviously going to be the winner. It's very funny. I'm speechless. Ha. She gave a scoff as faint tension appeared between the two. I remember someone fainting from a single headbutt. Why do you sound so confident? You should not be arrogant before a fight. Did I not tell you time after time? How long ago was this? Listen. It has already been quite some time and there might be variables. You should not judge based on the past. Ho. What is this do you still think you're my teacher? Looking at your actions, it looks like it's still too early for you to graduate. Yoram forced her stiff lips into a smile. I'm actually gonna beat you up. Soon, after jumping across the dimensions to a barren wasteland, Ujidi and Yoram began to fight. I'm not gonna hold back. Unsheathing her sword, Yoram lowered her body. She took a big step forward as a large spark flickered beneath her feet, and... Ujidi had to widen his eyes Yoram dashed across in the blink of an eye and her sword was already right in front of him. Clank. He parried her attack. It was a heavy and oppressive yet clean attack. It created a ripple in the air and shook his bones, but nonetheless, he was able to block it. It was a stunning improvement compared to how he was like right after the regression. Because he had lost his killing intent, Shapeless Sword no longer had the same amount of power as before, but Ujidi still possessed thousands of authorities and abilities which he didn't need to use beforehand due to the Shapeless Sword. He was planning on pouring everything into this fight. Hugh. After a short exhale of breath, he reopened his eyes. The victor was decided after two hours. Blood was oozing out and several bones were broken for Ujidi. His eyes were bruised and parts of his body were exposed due to the partially scorched clothes. Yoram wasn't in a perfect state either she had also been struck several times, and the long cut created by a sword on her waist still had beads of blood dripping at every second. During the fight, Yoram came to the judgment that she would be exposed to Ujidi's thousands of attacks if she were to distance herself and aimed for a close distance and a grappling fight. Their swords broke and they rolled on the ground while throwing fists back and forth. And she proved that her judgment was correct. Slam! The back of Ujidi's head was forced into the ground as Yoram pressed onto his body from above. Hook, hook give up, she suggested. The tip of her dagger was next to his throat. While coarsely gasping for breath, Ujidi closed his eyes and gave a nod. It was a sign of surrender. What did I tell you? I told you I'll win, yes. I was right. You Yoram you crazy freak. Even Ujidi is nothing for you. Little Yoram is the strongest in the world, is she not? Answer me. Now. Bullshit. 
He gave his agreement all too easily and Yoram was unamused. It was boring to tease someone who was too straightforward. In any case, his body was in a pretty bad state and they had to end the fight here. That was why Yoram was about to raise her body, but she stopped in the middle. Hold on. A sudden line of thought popped up in her head. Had she ever beaten that Ujidi like this in her entire life? She pondered to herself. Except for that one time when she punched him in the chest, she had never beaten him even once in her entire life. But what about now? Ujidi was pinned underneath her. A grin appeared on Yoram's lips. Meanwhile, Ujidi bewilderedly opened his eyes after sensing how Yoram was showing no signs of standing back up, curious as to what she was trying to do. And what he found was a perverted smile hanging on her lips. What? Who? What are you doing? Move aside. Ho ho. The stern tension covering the two of them was gone in the blink of an eye. Yoram said after a giggle. Right now, you can't escape without my permission, can you? After a smirk, Yoram raised her hand and snapped a handful of her hair with her fingernails. She then grabbed the stiff and red hair strands like a brush. Oi. Kuhu, Q. What, uh, what are you doing right now? Kuhu. Kuk a kuk. Then, Yoram began tickling him with the red brush. His skin was very sensitive after being scorched by Yoram's flames, so much so that Ujidi was feeling ticklish despite being usually immune to it. Oi, dude. He frowned. Due to the fierce fight they had, he had trouble moving his mana properly, and thus couldn't cut off his senses. Besides, Yoram's movement of her brush was extremely explicit. From his ears, she sneaked past his earlobes and began sweeping his neck with her hair. Oi, you Yoram. UHP. Stop this right now. What do you think you're doing? Kohup. Can't you hear me telling you to stop? Kohup. What are you gonna do if I can't hear you? Hit me. You Yoram. Egu so scary. She held back her laughter which was threatening to burst out. Her brush continued to move. Before long, her hair traveled down the neck, past the collarbone towards his armpits as he called her name with a scowl. Oi. Oi oi oi. Yoram. Hearing the faint sense of urgency in his voice, Yoram could not stop herself and began chuckling out loud. For her, this was way too interesting. Wow. It was none other than Ujidi. That man who was always arrogant and aloof, who kept an indifferent look on his face all the time as if he was some kind of big shot was pinned underneath her while stuttering in a hurry. Stop. Let's stop this kind of prank. It's tickling me. Yoram replied after a chuckle. Don't wanna. If you're respectful, then maybe. Be as polite as you can. What kind of wacky shit is this? Stop this right now and move aside, you hear me? No. Why should I, HNN? What's in it for me? You. Why the hell are you doing this? Huh? No need to worry about that. Say please. If you don't want to, be as polite as you can polite enough to satisfy me. Her brush continued moving. It started heading to his wide chest. The destination were the dots that were acknowledged in a certain underground fight club of North America for being wonderful. So you're not going to do it huh? Are you still not going to do it? Huh? It's going even lower though. It's already past your collarbones. I can see your beautiful nips. Ujidi closed his eyes with a deep sigh. He had to end this horrifying humiliation immediately. It was a hard call to make, but he went through with it. I understand, so please stop. Yun. It's my loss, miss. He showed respect, but Yoram sneered back. What's this about? Did you not understand what I said? That's not it. I did what you told me to do, did I not? No. I told you. You have to be polite enough to satisfy me. How will you be satisfied then? Yoram grinned like a devil and licked her lips with her tongue. You see, I like cute guys, she said. Crazy. It wasn't even funny. 
using his last bit of strength, Yujidi tried to break free. No you don't. Even though he scuffled and struggled as hard as he could, he just couldn't escape from her grip due to his exhausted limbs. After twenty minutes of retaliation, he asked only after being pressed back down onto the ground. Are you serious right now? Are you seriously telling me to act cute or something? Yes. I do not understand. Why do you even want to see that? Because. He heaved a sigh. He was too tired and he wanted to take a rest. Yujidi had no choice but to drop his pride. He closed his eyes. His lips slowly cracked open, as his vocal cords began to vibrate. Yoram's eyes were tainted with excitement, and after a few seconds. Kaya ahahahahaha. Her laughter echoed across the wasteland. Appa. At home, it was hard to be lovey-dovey, unless it was a day like this. Do you remember what you said last time? What did I say? You know, the thing you said when I was trying to kill myself. The large pair of eyes looked at him. He silently met her gaze as her lips slowly came closer in. Chu. They shared a light kiss. Why are you bringing that up all of a sudden? Nothing. B.O.M. gave a faint smile before turning around and hopping away. They were at an open pavilion. Behind was the blue sky and thick clouds, and it was nothing but the evergreen nature all around. It was peaceful. A fair bit of time had passed since his reunion with the children. He was happy. He enjoyed each passing day the food was delicious his relationship with B.O.M. was delightful and the house they lived in together was very cozy. Until now, he had never known that living and breathing could be so enjoyable and precious. Only after belatedly realizing that, was Yujidi finally able to smile from the bottom of his heart. Uni. Look at that stupid smile on that guy's face. Curl sneered while pointing at Yujidi. B.O.M., who was next to her, also gave a smile. What was this about? Kaul's sudden words made the smile vanish from Yujidi's face. Ah right. How shameless. I know right. Does he think he has the right to be happy? What a piece of trash. Well, good for us though. I can do that now, right? Yun. Shoot. Yujidi. Watch carefully. Watch what I'm doing next. After saying that, B.O.M. took out a ballista and pointed it at Cowell's head. She then pulled the trigger. Bomb. Yujidi opened his eyes with a flash. Grabbing onto his chest, he tried to raise himself up but his body refused to listen to him. His body was screaming all around as if there were countless needles piercing into his body. With his entire body glistening from sweat, he gasped for breath. It was a dream. That thing just then was a dream. His sense of reality slowly came back to him as a deep frown appeared above his eyes. That was the third ridiculous nightmare he had ever since he began living a new life. His neck turned relaxed as his head helplessly fell back down. Something soft touched the back of his head, and only then did he notice the person sitting next to him. Are you okay Ajusi? It was Curl. He had been lying down with Cowell's thigh underneath his head. Wondering what was going on, he tried to raise himself up but his body shrieked in pain and refused to listen to him. You should stay down. I'm healing you right now. Thanks. Where's Bomb? She went outside with Joel. That startled me just then, you know. You suddenly started gasping and stuff. While collecting his breath, Yujidi shook his head. It's nothing. It was a nightmare as you said. He felt an excruciating pain all around his body and frowned. The injuries he got during the fight against Yoram wasn't fully recovered yet. Like, a juicy. Why did you have to fight like that? How is fighting to kill each other a part of training? You could have been seriously injured with one mistake. Because that's the fastest way to regain my power. Is there a reason why you're in a rush? There wasn't. It was just the way of his life he had to obtain something as quickly as possible if it had to be obtained. In any case, lying down using Cowell's lap as a pillow was weird no matter how he thought about it. Thus, he tried to lift his body up again but Curl pressed down on his forehead. 
Just stay still. Come on. Stop interrupting me and trying to heal you. By the way, Ajusi. Yeah. You really are a lot weaker now. Actually, I accidentally saw your dream. Drip. It felt like a droplet of water had dripped onto a lake. Sorry. That must have been startling. It's okay. That was all she said in response. Feeling slightly awkward, Eugidi added. But still, how could you peek at someone else's dream like that? If I was having an obscene dream, that would have made it uncomfortable for both of us. Ah, uh, I guess you didn't know about it because you've always been strong, a juicy, but we always live while passively accepting the emotions and memories of other races. So me looking at your dream just then, was not because I wanted to. I see. You should hurry up and become stronger if you want a sexy dream, hee <laughs> hee. She joked with a smile as he shook his hand in response. Even that small movement of his arm made his chest muscles scream due to the wound carved by Yoram so he lowered his hand back down and closed his eyes. Curl closed her mouth after the little joke, and Eugidi also stayed silent for a long time. Her hand resting on his forehead started to convey warmth down his skin. She slowly began caressing his hair. Leaving behind a rustle, her fingers traveled through the short strands of his hair from the forehead to the crown of his head. Curl stroked his hair which was probably dirty from the dust. He couldn't easily open his mouth. They had been living together for almost two years by now, but they still hadn't talked much about the past one thousand years, let alone the stories that laid at the bottom of everything. Although he decided to be honest, that didn't mean all of his problems would be resolved in an instant. He had initially chosen deceit because of how immensely difficult it was to come out clean, and thus it was still challenging to find the right occasion even after deciding to be fully honest. Let's do it one day when the time comes. Let's do it when we can open our hearts a bit more. He was delaying things and had been waiting for the right timing until this day. And now, while feeling her cautious fingers that were caressing his hair and her quiet gaze looking at him, he realized that the time had come at last. Curl. Yun. I have something to confess to you. UNN. What is it about? About the sins I've committed. He was scared. What if this occasion and this method was wrong? What if it created a crack in their relationship? Even though BOM had been telling him, there should be no problems, several times until now, the sinner still couldn't control his fear. Russell, Russell. The fingers stroking his hair did not stop, and that gave him the courage. Firstly, I need to explain about everything that happened. Lying down, he began telling Curl the start of everything. From how he met the gold hatchling for the first time in the distant past her life that ended with a suicide multiple times and everything that cornered them. He talked about all the unfortunate events. Throughout his story, Curl did not say anything. All she did was silently look into his eyes and blink. He was currently very weakened and couldn't censor every piece of floating memories and those were thus being conveyed to Curl. Everything that happened to B.Y. at the fourth iteration. The imprisonment in the fifth and the sixth iteration. And all the atrocities he committed within the countless forgotten iterations in the middle were all fully conveyed to Curl. His detailed emotions during that time were also in the mix. Eugidi did not try to defend himself because excuses were not necessary in an atonement. Eugidi did not try to explain himself. He did not try to decorate his wrongdoings. It might have been possible if he wanted to, but he didn't. He simply chose to be honest. Can you please, forgive me? Curl stopped her hand. That acted like a small signal that made Eugidi feel uneasy. No matter how happy Curl was in the seventh iteration, a change in history tended to negate happy memories. An approach with a hidden agenda. Pretentious kindness. Those hands that tied and imprisoned me were the same ones caressing my hair all the time, huh? That must be how Eugidi appeared to Curl. Anxiously, he held his breath and waited for her next words. Soon, Curl slowly opened her mouth. Eugidi widened his eyes. There were drops of tears budding in her eyes. The child gave a faint smile as the tears traveled down her cheeks. Curl smiled at him. I don't know if I have the right to forgive but if I do, I will forgive you. 
he felt his heart beating rapidly. Because of how hard it was for him to pour those words out, and because of the long moments of his fear and uneasiness. Cowell's one word felt like a breeze warmer than anything else that started to melt his past regrets and fears. So promise me, you won't have a dream like that again. It's definitely chocolates when you're feeling down. That's right. Here. Hurry up and have some. Ugd was unable to even lift a fork and was leaning on the backrest, when Curl suddenly came up and fed him a piece of the chocolate cake like what he used to do when Curl was sick one day. You see, after returning to Escalifa. I looked after gnomes. Curl started talking about the things that happened in a world without Ugd which she had been hiding in her heart. Raising kids is not easy, right? Egugu. Don't even mention it. She gave another silly smile before cutting off a piece of the cake and bringing it to his mouth. Looking back on the time she spent with the gnomes, there were in fact more memories of her hardship than her happiness. That made me think about Ajusi a lot. About me? Yun. Because I was clearly the biggest problem. You never showed it on the outside, but you must have been very frustrated and tired on the inside, right? No. Ujidi denied while shaking his head. There was no need to be honest about every single thing. As if it's a no. Hee <laughs> hee. Curl chuckled before raising the coffee mug and bringing the straw to his mouth. It was on a certain sunny afternoon of early autumn. In the middle of the background noise of the small cafe, the two people who had once been a guardian and a ward continued talking to each other. In a world where they no longer had to feel hurt, they shared the warmth of the past and that brought a small amount of peace to his sick heart. Thank you for apologizing to me. I will do a lot better from now on. Curl said with a bright smile. That day. Ugd received redemption from a girl. However, that was only the beginning. He still had to ask the other kids for their forgiveness. When would be the right timing? Who should I apologize to first? He was pondering and deliberating on the right occasion as time rapidly flew by. As he was starting to regain his power through his usual personal training sessions, Ugd suddenly realized that he had recovered a large portion of his strength and said to Yoram. Let's have a fight, you Yoram. Do you want to be humiliated again? Sorry. Master. Please stop. Yoram chortled after copying someone's lines. Ugd denied it. He had no idea what she was talking about. It was quite straightforward after they arrived at the training grounds. Ugd picked up a wooden sword and immediately dashed at Yoram. Kwang Kwang. After several bouts, Yoram went for a close combat again while remembering how to deal with Ugd. But unlike how he had to dodge her attacks a few months ago due to insufficient power, he chucked his sword away and punched back. He smacked Yoram's head with his fist and bashed her as hard as he could on her stomach. Uck. Fuck. In return, Yoram kicked his jaws with her knee as he wobbled and began to stumble back. A chance. Yoram grabbed him by his collars and gave his forehead a headbutt. Back. It rippled the surrounding air as dust soared up from the ground and covered the area. His body was falling his back was about to reach the ground. However, he suddenly shot his eyes wide open and made use of the power behind her frontal dash. He twisted his back and pulled Yoram down until she was underneath him. Kung. After a rotation in the air, Ugd was able to press down on Yoram from above. Ho. Yoram retaliated while hiding her fluster. What she didn't know was that Ugd was also a master in grappling. Walk. For fuck's sake. No matter what she did, she couldn't push nor pull him away. Whenever she somehow raised her body back up, his foot came flying in from a mysterious angle and made her fall back down. As if she was stuck in a quagmire, Yoram could not get up despite trying everything she could. When none of her tricks worked, she tried to shoot flames to burn his body but after recovering his power, Ugd was able to withstand her flames. Bouncing her back, she tried to stand up so Ugd held onto her neck and squashed her down. He suppressed her thighs to stop her legs from floundering around, and immediately sat on top of her body when she stopped moving. Pressing down on both of her wrists, he used his other hand to take out a dagger and rest it near her neck. 
Hook, hook fuck. That was the end of their fight. It was the grappling fight of two existences that were at the level of adult dragons. The ground was squashed and crumbled into fragments during their fight and the entire region was in a complete mess. Ha! You became hella strong in those few freaking months. Yoram shook her head with a dejected smile. It was the declaration of her loss. However, Eugidi did not move. With her eyes stuck on him who was still pressing down on her body, Yoram blinked her eyes. Did he not understand what she meant? Although Yoram detested losing more than death, losing to Eugidi wasn't really that big of a problem. It didn't hurt her pride as much so she tried voicing those words out. What are you doing? It's over. I lost. However, Eugidi still refused to move. His eyes were still indifferently gazing down at her. In that instant, she felt spooked. What you looking at? I'm telling you I lost. Why are you still there? In the middle of her words, Yoram denied the thought that sparked in her mind. It was Eugidi out of everyone in the world. There's no way. There was no way that Eugidi would be so narrow-minded that he wanted revenge right. But her line of thought was crushed due to the smile hanging on Eugidi's lips. You Yoram. Oh no. He mischievously called her name, as Yoram felt goosebumps appearing all over her skin. Why? Fucking what? You didn't forget, did you? Forget what? Even though she pretended like she was clueless, she was a dragon. And dragons did not forget. That thing on that day was the biggest humiliation of my entire life. W, what are you talking about? And in the type that always takes revenge. Huh. Revenge for what? This is just a spar, isn't it? She felt spooked. Eugidi raised his dagger and stabbed it next to her neck as a handful of her hair was cut off. After lowering the knife, he grabbed onto the bundle of red hair. No no no. Stop. Yoram gave a straight face, but that in turn brightened up the look on Eugidi's face. This is wrong. It's a crime if you do it. Who says? Everyone does. Fuck. Anyway, no. It's fine if I'm the one doing it, but you can't, you crazy freak. A smile appeared on his lips. She got goosebumps from that smile and quickly tried to cut off her senses but Eugidi's mana squeezed in before she could and repressed her mana. Wait, fuck. Soon, the red brush went down and reached her body. It landed somewhere between her neck and her collarbones. Wait, wait. You fucker. Don't Kayaha. Yoram resisted like an electrocuted fish but it was in vain. With an amused smile on his face, Eugidi moved the brush around. Oi oi oi. You damn bastard. I'm telling on you. I'm gonna tell you bomb you love tickling girls. I warned you. You do this and we're no longer friends. Okay. Hahing. Seriously, I'm betting on my mum that we will no longer be friends. Kayak. Oh, okay. Okay. My bad. I will scrap that, okay? I won't tell you Bioam either. NN. I, I can pretend like this never happened. Please H, help me. Sir. I don't want to be tickled. Yoram tried everything she could to try to stop Eugidi but he ignored them all. Goosebumps were covering her skin as her stomach caved up and down following her coarse breaths. Wait. Seriously, no ears. Please. My ears are hella sensitive kuahaha. That day, the barren wasteland was filled with screams. Yoram was tickled until she broke out in tears. Eugidi lifted his body as Yoram gasped for breath like a squid out on the land. She appeared to have become powerless due to the immensely long tickle. You know. While thinking to himself that she must be getting ready to swear at him, he reached his hand out to help her stand back up. I fought with my oldest Uni after going back. However, she suddenly started talking about a whole different topic. Crossing her legs, she covered her eyes with the back of her hand. The fight against her oldest Uni was naturally something he had constantly been curious about. 
The only reason he didn't ask till now was because he wanted her to mention it herself. Yoram returned to Earth thanks to Bomb's oath after she completed her grand schema. In other words, there could only be one reason why Yoram was able to be here. So you won. You beat her. He felt his heart being quite overwhelmed with emotions. You Yoram. His voice was a little brighter. I'm insane, right? She asked. Yes. You're crazy. Is Yoram cool? Fabulous. Is she the best? You're the best in the entire universe. Yoram twitched her lips as she soon let out a grin. Kolkolko like a person who can't control their laughter, she continued giggling like a boiling kettle. His compliment was like a full stop to her story. You did an excellent job. Her smile slowly dissipated. At this moment, Yoram had her life and hard work acknowledged once again by the one who trusted her more than herself. That very person asked her a question. How did you fight her? Do you mind telling me? She described everything that happened back then to Ujidi including every detail possible. While talking about those moments, a drop of tear left her eye and like a water drop on a document, it tainted the paper to smudge the ink of her memories. Wiping off those tears, Yoram calmly continued her story. Starting from the 300 years which had gone by as she blindly waited for the selection ceremony after returning from the amusement, Yoram explained how she trampled upon the condescending gazes of her parents to kill her oldest sister, as well as how she wailed by herself in front of her youngest Uni's grave at the end of everything. Those stories, feelings and words created a lump in her throat whenever she looked back on them but. He serenely listened to her story and lent a close ear to her chronicles. Meanwhile, it made Ujidi think that today might be the day for him to ask Yoram for her forgiveness, but her following words put a stop to his line of thought. It was super hard for everyone, you know that? I think I do, the more I listen to your stories. But, to be honest, I don't think what I went through is even close to half of all the suffering you BOM had to go through. You you really need to take good care of her. She worked really, really hard. Yoram then started mentioning the chronicles of BOM in a soft voice. She talked about the crazy vengeful spirits of the Black Dragons, the War of Green Dragons and the likes. But I guess she wouldn't have been that worried about the future. Because she must have been certain that she will be sleeping with you as a black hair. Her next words, however, were very confusing for Ujidi. Sleeping with him as a black hair. What is that about? Do what with me as a black hair? Ing. As if she finally noticed her mistake, Yoram shook her hands. Pretend like you didn't hear that. What is it about? Ah, uh, I don't know. Whatever. Don't tell her I told you that, and don't even pretend like you know what it's about. Okay. Ujidi was already greatly intrigued though, because he remembered how Bomb used to pick a few females in the association to become friends with. What was common between all of them except for one person was that they were all Asians. Until now, he didn't know why she hadn't tried to befriend some females over others and couldn't find anything common between them, but the sudden words of Yoram became a puzzle piece that entered his head. He remembered the hair colors of the ones B.O.M. had been trying to become friends with. He recalled the appearances of Kanga Jin, Juga Hayan and Freya Wahabi. Black hair. They all had black hair. That black hair or whatever are you really not going to tell me what it is? Ah, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. I can't tell you anything. Dino. Just forget about it. Please. Yoram stood up and shook her hands in the air before jumping across the dimensions to escape from him. After that, he asked her a few more times in secret when they were at home but Yoram did not tell him anything. Ujidi recalled what she said but I guess she wouldn't have been that worried about the future. Because she must have been certain that she will be sleeping with you as a black hair. It sounded positive as if there was an underlying layer of hope. Sleeping was probably referring to a sexual relationship. In other words, that meant BOM with black hair having an intercourse with him would lead to some kind of optimistic result. That, however, was strange. It was because her hair had been turning back to green ever since they met each other again. There was pretty much no strand of black hair left. If black hair would lead to an optimistic result. 
then why was her hair turning back to green? In the end, he couldn't ask Yoram for forgiveness that day, but he decided not to be in a hurry. Atonement was his lifelong duty. There was no need to be in a hurry, and the future ahead of them was still very long. He would have more opportunities in the future. Thus, he decided to drop the things related to his atonement in daily life for the time being, and started pondering about Bond's show of affection. He was way too curious to disregard it, but asking wasn't an option either considering the frantic attitude Yoram showed when he asked her a few times. It didn't seem like a joke and seemed like a fairly serious topic that shouldn't be delved into. Eugidi wanted to find the truth. There were two key words. 1. Black hair. 2. Show of affection. There was nothing he could do about the first one. It wasn't something he could openly ask about, so he had to control the variables and make BOM introduce the topic. Thus, he decided to control the second element. After that day, he avoided having deep affectionate actions with BOM. It wasn't easy. There were only three rooms. They didn't bother making any more rooms so he had to use the same room as Joel and BOM. It was on a certain warm evening in spring. The kids were outside playing and BOM was the only one who had returned before them. After coming into the room, she stared at him, as he turned his eyes and returned the gaze. There was noon inside the house as the two of them shared a suggestive eye contact. BOM looked very pretty today as well. Her eyes that were gazing up at his eyes from uneasiness and the nervously pursed lips were a sight to behold. They had already done it a few times, and yet Bill M was still very nervous before having a relationship with him. That was why it was usually his job to approach her and be the one moving. But today, it was different. Eugidi returned a faint smile before looking away from her. A look of doubt appeared in Baum's eyes. That was the end. While suppressing the burning passion inside, he soothed himself. He continued lying down on the bed reading a book, but that was when a fragrant scent of nature cleared up his brain. That was the furtive signal BOM was throwing at him. However, he contained his desire and refused to move. BOM tilted her head. She then swept past her lower lips with her thin fingers. After a few days. It was a day where Joel and Yoram went playing outside together despite bickering with each other all the time, while Curl came back after playing with Chirpy the enormous baby chicken and immediately fell asleep in her room. He was alone in the living room watching a documentary on hologram TV. That was when BOM came out of the shower like a human, while wearing a gown with her hair lifted to a bun. And that was a big problem. The white neck revealed beneath her hair gave off an indecent charm and the soft skin was an extremely lewd sight. That was why he was refusing to go into the room even though it was already close to midnight. He simply had to wait a bit more, because Joel would be coming back very soon. However, BOM did not go into the room either. Why are you out here in the living room? She asked. I'm watching a documentary. A documentary? Architecture of the early Ottoman Empire in the 14th century, in search of those roots. She tilted her head after reading the name of the documentary. Appa, are you interested in things like this? Yeah. It's more interesting than I thought. He had to give a ridiculous excuse. However, it was a good choice of documentary because BOM would definitely have zero interest in such a topic. But Bond threw that question while naturally sitting next to him. With a gush, the scent of nature grazed past his nose. While pretty much throwing her body on the sofa, BOM sat down and leaned on him. Her lower body crashed into his lower body as he felt the weight behind her legs. What was her question again? Was it about the content of the documentary or something? Eugidi had to pull his mind back together. Well. It's like. Like. It was. It's just about how the way they build houses is influenced by the past. He gave a random reply while turning towards her, but he had to immediately fix his gaze on the screen again. It might be because of her throwing herself down on the sofa, but the untightened knot and the loose gown revealed the lines of her white body inside. Hmm it doesn't look that interesting though. BOM said with a lethargic voice while leaning her head on his shoulder, all the while wrapping her arms around his arm in a natural manner. 
he could feel something that was both soft and heavy touching his arm. It's not bad. Of course. Finding the roots of the 14th century's Ottoman Empire's architecture is not bad. I was quite bored today, you see. I guess that's why this doesn't look that bad. Really? HNN. Bill M gave a nod. That slight movement of her head shook her body as the weight touching his arm also swayed back and forth. He stood his ground. By recalling a random catchy song, he formed a barrier around his brain. However, a soft whisper from BOM shattered his barrier like it was nothing. Do you want to do something more fun together? He turned stiff. He could feel her gaze she was definitely gazing up at his face and that was driving him crazy. Lust was something he had lost alongside his daily life. But after the return of daily life, the kids often called him a kid. He was also like a kid at the face of lust which had come back together with his daily life. Regardless of the matter with black hair and whatever, he wanted to do something dirty with her. It was when bombs were going off in his head. Yuan. Curl walked out of her room while rubbing her eyes. Ujidi felt those bombs being dropped into an ocean as he managed to regain his composure. Ah. Uh, what are you watching till so late? B.O.M., who had pulled herself away from him in the blink of an eye, replied to her with a smile. It's a documentary called In Search of the Roots of the 14th Century's Architecture of the Ottoman Empire. Ewing. Is that the title? That's new. Is it fun? Curl headed to the kitchen while giggling to herself as B.O.M. gave a response that seemingly contained a hidden agenda. It's the most boring documentary I've ever seen in my life. But Curl, who came to the living room after a cup of milk, was instead intrigued by her description. That makes me curious. How boring is it? Hee <laughs> hee. I'm gonna watch it too. Curl dropped on the sofa with her bum and leaned her head on B.O.M. Hiding his inward satisfaction, Eugidi commended Curl in his heart. Well done, you Curl. Meanwhile, he glanced at Bioem. She, who was no longer leaning on his arm, had already adjusted the front of her gown. The risk was gone. Heaving a deep sigh, he deeply immersed himself in the 14th century architecture of the early Ottoman Empire. Towards those deep and profound roots of the world of architecture. However, the true risk came at night. Yoram and Joel were not coming back. Curl returned to her room with a yawn, and unfortunately, the roots of the Ottoman Empire were not deep enough. When the documentary neared its end as the closing credits were starting to go up, Eugidi felt pressured and immediately called Yoram. The call ended with her saying they would be back home very soon. He then tried calling Joel but she said the same thing in response. Since there was no justification anymore behind sitting at the sofa, he lifted his body. He walked into the room and sat on the chair instead of the bed. But his location might not have been important. What was important was that he was alone with BOM. And like what she did during the day of the interim review, Baum abruptly sat down on his lap. Why are you like this these days? What? What do you mean? She looked at him with a depressed gaze as a voice dripping with sorrow left her mouth. I know you are trying to avoid me, Appa. Eugidi scrutinized her eyes. Was it uneasiness? Or perhaps displeasure? No. Hidden beyond that in her depressed gaze was a sense of desperation. That let him realize something. As expected, the optimistic result B.O.M. had been harboring in her heart throughout the hard times of Escalifa appeared to have a direct correlation with affectionate actions. No. I'm not trying to avoid you. He had decided not to lie, but it might not be bad to have some exceptions. Thinking that, he opened his mouth. Yeah. Why would I try to avoid you? How do I look right now? The prettiest in the world. Only then did she ease her expression. Maybe it wasn't the affectionate action itself, but the process of sharing affection. Did it include both the physical and the psychological element? It was when Eugidi was busy thinking about the truth of the matter while having wrong guesses. Baum started moving her waist. His eyes shot wide open. Holding on to his body, B.O.M. was moving her own body by rubbing it back and forth near his thighs. Soon, a soft voice tickled his ears. 
please don't run away if I'm pretty. If the coquettish action before was a bomb, then this was like an atomic bomb. His impulses exploded like a volcano and set his mind ablaze. Gathering the last bit of his patience, he replied. Be patient. The kids are going to be back soon. B.O.M., however, shook her head in response as he finally realized something. The optimistic result and whatever was not the reason why Baum was depressed. I can't be patient anymore. She sweetly whispered into his ears alongside a faint moan. I've been waiting for a thousand years. He raised both B.O.M. and himself up at the same time. He distanced himself from the source of heat. There was moisture left behind on his right thigh which made him feel cold. B.O.M. was blankly hanging in the air like a powerless doll but her face was definitely not powerless. Her eyes were blooming with nervousness and heat and the tip of her tongue that was slightly poking out of her mouth was licking at his heart. Throwing her onto the bed he jumped at her. Like a lion pouncing on a rabbit he pressed down from above as B.O.M. chuckled while faintly pushing his chest away. You can't she whispered as always even though it was clear that she had zero intention of stopping him. I might die she added those words as the emotions behind her expression deepened even more. She was even more nervous yet even happier. She was saying no, so should this be considered forced? If so, then it was time to do something bad. Or so he thought. That was when the door of the house was suddenly pushed wide open with a thud. Kwong. Judging from the sound, it seemed that Yoram had opened it with a kick. Ah fuck. Im Su drunk. The following voice was the proof. The surging passion rapidly fell back down. Although the kids all somewhat knew about it, Eugidi and Baum had never shown anything similar to it on the outside and had never mentioned it either. The kids were now considered adults but it would still be a big problem if they were caught. That was why he was about to quickly raise his body back up but Baum held on to his wrist. In an instant, Mana floated up from her body. He checked the equations and noticed it was teleport she was suggesting that they escape to a different place. Eugidi hurry up and come out. There's something you Joel wants to show you right now. At the same time, words that were completely outside of his expectations left Yoram's mouth. She was telling him to come out because there was something Joel wanted to show him immediately. It sounded like there was something that was impossible to see if he missed the opportunity, and if he were to embrace BOM here, he would be back at sunrise. He turned to Baum and was met with a pair of yearning eyes. You Jaiti. You have to be quick. Her steps came closer to the door and so did her voice. He had to make a judgment. Walking out of the room, Eugidi met Joel who showed him a cluster of snow. There was no way it would be snowing on a summer day, so this ball of snow was proof that she was slowly regaining control over her body and magic. Meanwhile, Yoram blinked her eyes while staring at B.O.M. A deep scent of forest and a slightly messy gown with wrinkles in the knot and other areas her temperature was slightly higher than normal and what was more telling than anything else was the faint look of disappointment in her gaze. All the above could only mean one thing. Yoram gave a frown. These guys. The next morning, Eugidi came to Yoram and asked what the black hair was about one more time, but she shook her head in response. It might be okay to tell him at this point but it was a matter of trust, and Yoram placed a great amount of importance on trust. After he left the house, Yoram went to B.O.M. and stood in front of her, who was quietly watching a movie in her room. Oi you B.O.M. Have you gone crazy or what? You. I told you to definitely make sure we are not here when you're doing that stuff, didn't I? B.O.M. became flustered but soon returned an awkward smile. Funny. Is this funny to you? Everyone somewhat knows about it but we don't want to know anything more about it so please don't let us see it. And besides, you're the ones that didn't want to live separately, were you not? Seriously. Bitch, shouldn't you create an alternate dimension or something until we move to a different house and get a room for yourselves? You're right, but opening a dimension is a bit. I don't think I can control myself. Oh dear. You crazy bitch. What in the heck are you even saying? Yoram rebuked her. B.O.M. also agreed that it had been too risky and thus silently listened to her complaints. Anyway, think about behaving yourself properly. 
You're clever don't you understand how uncomfortable it would be forever for all of us. N.N. Sorry. She continued the lesson for more than thirty minutes. A conversation like this was very embarrassing and Bomb nodded while feeling like hiding herself in a corner. Seeing that, Yoram also changed the topic. Anyway, what are you gonna do if you become pregnant or something? She talked about a random topic but looking back, it was something she was quite curious about. Humans could not receive the seed of a dragon and the lofty dragons did not bother receiving the seed of a petty human. But what if they wanted to? Can a human and a dragon have a child together? Bill M nodded her head. Polymorph made the body exactly the same as a human body, and they would get a child in the form of a fetus instead of an egg. Dragons didn't have periods though, because they could get pregnant at any time. That was why her next question was also quite natural. Ah, so have you been avoiding it till now then? In that instant, Bond's expression turned dark as Yoram became curious. I can't have babies. She sounded so calm that Yoram replied, okay, and only after belatedly realizing the meaning behind her words did she drop her chin. My heart was damaged severely during the war. So what? Is there, like, a problem in your conception organ or something? There were many devices in the dragon heart that related to the reproduction and continuance of the dragon race. They played a part in childbirth and growth, and the conception organ was the one in charge of conception. BOM replied with a voice that was still very composed. It's not just a small problem. It's completely crushed. Everything is slowly coming back but that organ just refuses to heal back up. It was similar to a circular bowl of glass being shattered. Even if she were to receive affection, the bowl was gone and it was difficult for a life to establish itself there. She had been trying it time after time just in case but had never succeeded even once despite dozens of attempts. Have you told you Gidi? Not yet. What? Why didn't you tell him already? How am I supposed to say this to him? Like, it's not like you did something terrible and it was all to bring you Gidi back to life. What in the heck is stopping you from saying it? You should have done it ages ago. How could you say something so important to me before you Gidi? BOM pursed her lips into a pout without saying anything in response. Soon when she reopened her mouth, her voice came out in a composed tone but the slight look of depression on her face was still there. She said with a deep sigh. I don't know. This isn't something you can just say, I don't know to. I don't know. Yoram thought to herself that BOM was doomed, but after another glance, she realized that she looked quite nonchalant. Yeah, well. A baby? You don't need one. And you know, not everyone should raise babies. I can tell you two mental patients shouldn't give birth to a child. You guys will be happy even without a baby, right? Yeah, and if you really want to, you can raise little Yoram as your baby. Feed her some milk as well. That's a bit. And fuck, who knows? You know, in romance novels, miracles happen because of the power of love and whatever, right? You never know. She tried her best to cheer her up as much as she could but Bond stayed silent without even nodding in return. Fuck it. This is not for me. Yoram said to herself. In any case, it was her fault for bringing up a wrong topic. With her mind in a slightly vacant state, she threw out a random topic for a change of mood. By the way, you know, there is something I've been curious about. What is it? Ho ho, how is you GD's dick GD, hmm? Ah, uh, wait, this is not it. Yoram reproached herself. Due to being in a hurry, both her question and the tone of her voice came out strange. BOM gave a slight frown but it was too late to swallow her words back in. But all in all, it was true that she was curious. So how is Dick GD? Is he good? Yoram. What are you talking about in broad daylight? BOM raised her tone in a fluster, and there was an undisguisable trace of fluster in her eyes. Who's stopping me from saying it during the day? So, is he good at that or what? Yoram rolled her hand into a fist and pounded it on her palm multiple times. Bond's face turned into a deep blush. Seriously. You. And how is his pee-pee? 
it's not going to be this small considering his build and his height, right? She said while pointing out her index finger. I don't know. Why are you even curious about that? Of course I'm super curious. It's not like I'm ever going to see it, right? Of course you shouldn't see it. So you tell me how it is as someone who saw it in real time. What kind of nonsense is that? I don't want to. Ah, why are you so against it? Did I say I want to have a taste? Or did I tell you I want to use it? I have zero interest in anything like that, so just tell me the size of your dildo. What's wrong with you? Stop asking such a strange question. Yoram persisted with her question so Baum ran away in disgust. However, BOM wasn't showing a possessive attitude like the time when she was under a self-brainwash, and just seemed quite embarrassed based on her reddened cheeks. Despite her attempts, Yoram did not give up and continued asking questions while chasing after her. Come on. Is his dick big or small? She became increasingly more curious over time. What would you GD be like on the bed? I don't know. Stop following me. BOM started sprinting away but Yoram was a little faster. She even used teleport to escape, but Yoram also knew how to teleport after all those years and followed suit. Through the deserts, all the way through Lair and to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, their race continued as Yoram consistently begged about his dick. Are you not gonna tell me? Why the hell would I tell you, you dumbass? At last when BOM even cursed at her, Yoram felt her curiosity almost erupting like an active volcano. It was because of the doubt that it might actually be super tiny. EY, let's just do a comparison, okay? I won't ask you any more if you tell me this. What now? Is it this big? Yoram created a long gap between her thumb and her index finger in front of her eyes. BOM glared back at her in extreme disgust before heaving out a deep sigh and distractedly scratching her hair. BOM settled her heart that had been jolting in embarrassment, after which she opened her mouth with a voice dripping with disgust. Yoram. Sometimes you act like an actual piece of trash, you know that. How can you ask me that question after everything I told you? My bad. If you're sorry, then go away. Stop following me. Hing but Wunchen. Little Yoram is a red dragon and is super curious about weenies. Yoram replied with an awkward smile. It was seriously a crazy obsession. BOM heaved another deep sigh before turning to Yoram's hand. She irritatedly glared at it before giving up and reaching her hand out. Her hand traveled towards Yoram's hand and it went past and grabbed onto her arm. What? Yoram's eyes widened into circles, as she dumbfoundedly looked back at the olive pair of eyes. She was too stunned to say anything. Her mouth was agape as if she was smacked on the back of her head. Yoram nodded as Bom nodded back to her. Nod nod. Meanwhile, Bom's face was so red it seemed like she was seconds away from exploding, but considering how stubborn Yoram was, she decided to tell her one more thing. Have you heard of the Korean expression, so good you could die? Hugh. Yoram replied in a shrill voice as a shocking set of words reached her ears. You do faint, but you don't die. Leaving those words behind, BOM jumped over the dimensions and disappeared. Left alone in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, Yoram thought to herself. Holy cow. Swoosh. The wind blew at her face as she gazed into the horizon. She then nodded her head. Nod, nod. Yoram returned home. She saw Joel, who has always frowned immediately after seeing her. Usually, she would have thrown her a curse word but today's Yoram met her gaze with a serious look on her face and nodded. Joel tilted her head in displeasure. At night, Eugidi returned home after sending the byproducts of a dungeon to an auction house. Yoram was playing a game in the living room, and when he came in, she turned around. Her gaze shifted to his feet and slowly came up, before suddenly going back down and stopping at a certain part of his body. What are you doing? Yoram raised her thumb. What? Why are you showing me your thumb, he asked but she didn't say anything in response. After giving him a thumbs up, she stole a glance at her own arm before turning back to him with a nod. He frowned. 
For some reason, he felt like a victim of sexual harassment. Bill M was feeling down. There were actually a few things which she hadn't mentioned to Yoram. After retrieving the lost daily life, BOM had thrown Eugidi roundabout questions a few times, asking if he had conducted an experiment and taken a look at the organs related to conception and childbirth when vivisecting her body. But he shook his head. I didn't. All my experiments were related to the origin fragment. There was no reason for me to touch anything else. Did you not touch the heart at all? To be exact, I did have a look at a section of the heart that shared organs with the origin fragment. The things inside a dragon heart weren't actually in one piece so there was no need to touch anything else. Throughout his response, Eugidi stole glances at her face in concern because their conversation was related to his unsightly past of conducting experiments on her body. However, BOM had already forgiven him and did not care about it. It was on a certain midsummer evening when she was alone by herself. The surroundings were quiet and the sunset over the window was casting an ambient light over everything. While applying a red pedicure on her toes, BOM thought to herself. I'm currently living a happy life. Each and every passing day was overwhelmingly precious and satisfying for BOM. She no longer had any great concerns or problems like the past, and was creating wonderfully incredible memories with the kids and her most precious person in the world, Eugidi. However, not everything can be perfect and beautiful. That was the bitter truth of reality. Her toenails were colored into lustrous red as she deeply pondered to herself. Like other women, BOM also couldn't help but think about having a child after having someone whom she wanted to spend the rest of her life with, and that was what she had been thinking of for the past several centuries at the very least. A reunion with Eugidi, having his baby and living happily ever after forever. That was the hopeful future she had been harboring in her heart through the agonizing times at the bottom of hell. And because of that, BOM cried buckets out after realizing her conception organ had been shattered, even though she still had to act in front of her mother and the vengeful spirits. One of her greatest hopes had been crushed. BOM forced a smile on her face. She had to stop that line of thought because lingering on that topic only made her more depressed. As long as she forgot about it, although it was unforgettable, she could still live while immersing herself in happiness. How could you say something so important to me before you Eugidi? Yoram's voice vividly came back to the surface. But, how was I even supposed to say this to Appa? It might be because she was greatly conscious of it already, but Bom started having a strange experience after that. First of all, her eyes picked up more children in the streets than before, to the point it made her wonder if this was the normal number of kids in the neighborhood or not. There were a lot of children energetically running around with a shout, as well as babies blankly gazing at the sky on a pram. At the start, her eyes were fixed on those young children, but they soon moved up towards the joyful parents. People smiling with their baby standing on their lap a mother gazing down at her child while breastfeeding and a father walking with his son sitting on his shoulders. It must be because she was jealous. After admitting that fact, BOM decided to switch off her interest for the time being while waiting for her emotions to settle back down. However, that wasn't the end of her strange experiences. Hee hee, chirp chirp. Jerp, jerp. It was when she went to a spirit beast cafe with Curl and Chirpy. Curl loved spirit beasts and came here very often. BOM followed her today and came across all sorts of cute spirit beasts that ranged from birds, cats, dogs and mice to spirit beasts that resembled animals that were not from earth. Ah. Uh, you're here. There was someone who recognized Curl as soon as she came inside. Surprisingly, it was the staff working at the spirit beast cafe. Yes. Hello. Ego, one of our kids was dying for you to come. Could you please have a look? The staff brought a young hedgehog spirit beast. It was glaring at the keeper with the quills on its back standing tall, and looked quite temperamental. Ehu. Is this child doing this again? Ha ha. Yes yes. It's very concerning. He doesn't want any food. It's great that he's okay for a week after every time you come, miss, but. BOM tilted her head while wondering what that was about, but that was when Curl carefully hugged the hedgehog, while making sure the sharp quills wouldn't stab through her clothes. 
The upset hedgehog glared at Curl as she looked into its eyes in return. She then carefully swayed the hedgehog back and forth, regularly like a rocking cradle. Come on. Why didn't you have any food? Curl coaxed in a soft voice, while gently tickling its nose with her fingers. She slowly rocked back and forth as if the spirit beast was her precious baby. The hedgehog slowly relieved its tension and peacefully gazed up at Curl while diligently twitching its nose for a sniff. A hey, goo, goo Good boy. At last, after hearing Cowl's soft tone of voice that even soothed her heart and seeing the affectionate interaction between the spirit beast and Curl, B.O.M. felt strange yet again. This was not good. Besides, there was no reason for her to feel this way. B.O.M. told herself that it was because she was overly concerned about looking away from it in the streets that she was seeing their interaction in such a strange light. B.O.M. scratched her head and tried to empty her mind. But her thoughts had already been sparked to an ember, and her strange thoughts continued even after she returned to Unit 301. For some bizarre reason, Giles' tiny head was sucking in her gaze more than ever, and the same was with her small, doe-like body as well as her chubby cheeks that she could see from behind. Lastly, seeing Giles' minute fingers fidgeting around zealously left an afterimage in her brain. That was when Jules suddenly turned around with a flick. She was asking her with her gaze, what are you looking at? Nothing. B.O.M. chuckled while stroking her hair. After that, she was about to go back to her room but was stopped by Joel who suddenly walked up to her with the remote controller in her hands. A bright smile was hanging on her lips, and she seemed keen on watching a movie together. B.O.M. felt awkward. Whenever they were watching a movie together, Joel always used to sit on her lap. The backrest was too uncomfortable when sitting on Curl, and the seat was too uncomfortable in the case of Yoram or it might in fact be her existence itself. Due to those reasons, Giles' favorite sofa was bomb. Now, they were no longer in the relationship of a mother and a daughter. They were just friends who were slightly more affectionate of one another. Was she wrong for being conscious of it? Should she be natural like before? Thinking that, B.O.M. placed the child down on her lap and watched the movie together. Actually, she tried to, but couldn't do it naturally. The small head resting on her chest was way too adorable, and the tiny body leaning on her belly was so endearing that it almost drove her crazy. This is not good. She couldn't focus on the movie at all. Joel was too cute. Actually, I'm sorry but I think I have to stop watching the movie. Sorry. I'm a bit tired. After that, she avoided coming into contact with Joel. Joel seemed puzzled by her actions but it couldn't be helped, because B.O.M. had to consciously create a distance between herself and Joel. But as if mocking her determination, a different situation came knocking on the door. It was on a certain morning. Eugidi was getting ready to go out to a park with Joel sitting on his shoulders. There was a speaking practice book in his hands the two of them were planning on going to a park and practicing speaking to help Joel with her pronunciation. Joel chuckled and mumbled something into his ears as a similar smile bloomed on his face. Eugidi and a baby. That's what their relationship appeared like in her eyes. It seemed way too natural and joyful. The image of Eugidi and a baby was a perfect match as if it was straight out of a painting. The birth of a baby means a new relationship and the start of a society. That was the phrase Bill saw when reading a book that day. Her fingers twitched. She almost unconsciously closed the book but somehow managed to continue reading the next words. It is when there are exactly three or more people that we form a society. Three liars can forge the truth, and two out of the three can bring misfortune on the remaining one. Members of the society gain access to a far greater amount of power than what they possessed as an individual. It's the same for a married couple and their baby. The happiness of themselves as an individual is brought by the happiness of the society and as such, the members seek a healthy and happy society for the happiness of their own. The personal wounds and dissatisfaction the couple has against each other become easier to swallow after the birth of a baby, let alone the ones that were made before the foundation of the society. The birth of a baby is one of the methods that allows a couple to forget the past misfortune and head towards a new relationship. Bill M. closed the book. This might be why Eugidi started to avoid having a relationship with her. 
In the end, BOM couldn't spend the night with Yujidi on the day they discovered the deep roots of the Ottoman Empire. She didn't have any opportunities after that. Before, there would have been some level of furtive show of affection in the inhabited staircases of the apartment or the quiet and dark alleyways but nothing happened even when they were alone in such areas. That was why BOM thought to herself that it must be somehow related to babies. Although she couldn't exactly connect that reason to what was happening right now, she couldn't come up with any other possible reason. BOM knew that she had to confess about her infertility to Yujidi one day, so she slowly prepared herself over time. After a while, she had the opportunity. It was when they left on a family trip. The family trip was very enjoyable. Spending two weeks in a cabin next to the coast with a warm breeze, they caught fish for sashimi and caught prawns and the likes for a stew. They cooked raw sausages and lamb shanks, and topped them with nice sauces, and had plenty of delicious food. They saw a bunch of pretty corals, and traveling around the wonderful underwater scenery was also a delightful experience. When they were having a race by holding onto the shells of turtle spirit beasts, Yoram constantly bickered with her turtle so Baum laughed her heart out. Quietly chatting with each other under the refreshing breeze at night in front of the campfire was also a nice experience. Having a sneaky kiss with him away from the eyes of everyone else and then hiding from Joel who walked towards them during their kiss. Everything made her happy. Lastly, she gazed at the falling stars. It was the same thing they saw when they first met as well as during their farewell and today even though it was her third time seeing falling stars, that scene always appeared refreshing and beautiful. After waiting for the right opportunity, BOM asked Yujidi if they could take a walk along the coastline with just the two of them. Holding onto his hand, she walked across the fine grains of sand on bare feet, before coming to a stop and sitting down. It was a bright and starry night. A long silence befell the beach. It was time for her to say it, but the long silence made her feel all the more frightened. The answer she had been running away from the whole time added to her fears. However, his hand grasping onto hers was very warm. His hand used to be cold the whole time but that was now no longer that case. That was like a solace for Bill and gave her courage. She marked the end of her hesitation by opening her mouth. There is something I want to ask. I actually have one myself as well. Then shall we ask one at a time? Sure. You can go first. We both have to be honest, okay? He nodded as the back and forth Q&A session began. A wet and soothing breeze blew at her face. BOM chewed on her lower lips before finally opening her mouth. Why have you been avoiding me these days? You mean from having a relationship? It's because I happen to hear about a black hair. Sorry. BOM widened her eyes into circles. Eugidi replied while looking back at her. What is this thing about a black-haired person, Bomb? And what's the relationship between me and the black hair? There is something I am not aware of. Hmm. You don't have to tell me if it's hard for you to say it. It didn't seem like a light topic to casually ask about, so I was wondering and thought you would tell me in one way or another if I avoided having a relationship with you, but that wasn't the case either. It seemed that they had been misunderstanding each other. The thing about black hair was probably something he heard from Yoram. Him avoiding her wasn't because he didn't like her, nor was it because of the problem with babies. BOM felt the problems in her heart melting away as she replied with a smile. A long time ago I saw this providence. She told him about the future and the providence she saw a long time ago including how she saw herself being embraced by him as a green hair, followed by a black-haired woman in his arms in a distant future. At this point, I don't think that black-haired woman is anyone else no matter how much I think about it. It won't be right. Of course not. He mischievously pulled her in as she collapsed to the side. Kayaha Bilem chuckled as she laid down using his lap as a pillow. And then? And after that, I thought of something. She was embraced by him as a green hair, and she was happy. In the future, she would be embraced by him again with her hair dyed black, but that was up to her choice now. It was a very rare phenomenon how the thing she saw through the eye of providence had become a choosable future. My happiness has been proven to last until I do it with my hair dyed black. 
In other words, that means our relationship will continue forever all the way until I spend a night with you, Appa, with black hair. That much is certain. But I don't know anything about the future after that. And you see, thinking about how clueless I was, I became very uneasy. It felt like I was walking with my eyes closed. Bill M said with a self-deprecating smile. After knowing the backstory, he felt pity. If she had a firm belief that this happiness would last forever, she wouldn't be thinking about such a thing. That in turn meant that Bill M was still uneasy about this happiness. So, that's like my totem. A totem of belief that we will definitely love each other until that day. Ha <laughs> ha. Like how he had been having a nightmare, she also had her own share of troubles. He looked back at his own past. Even though it had already been a long time, he could still close his eyes and see it vividly in his memories. Because of how precious his daily life was, the problems thrown by reality that brought him to devastation were shivering cold like the blade of a knife. Since the start of his wounds had been from daily life, he was no longer able to take in that daily life with a comfortable heart. It was an anxiety that stemmed from his mental scars. He would oftentimes feel uneasy despite being calm most of the time, and that appeared to be the same for Bill M. How long ago was it that she started having such symptoms? Looking back at how her hair started turning green immediately after their reunion, he noticed that it must have been from the start. That meant Baum had also been suppressing her surging anxiety by acting composed like he did. Thinking about it like that, he felt a sense of kinship rather than pity. He opened his mouth. You don't have to be that worried. We won't fight like before, right? That will never happen. And you don't like, hate me on the inside or anything? Of course not. Why would I hate you after coming this far? So is everything okay? Are we all happy? Yes. You don't need to be anxious about anything. Think about all the things we went through to obtain this happiness. Why would we let go of it? Right. That's right. Like a broken dam, her lips shivered and endlessly poured out words. And then. You're right. I know. I know but I know there will be nothing happening to us and am also sure that we will continue living happily but. You don't sound like it at all. That's the strange part. Even though everything is definitely making me happy, I keep getting scared and I keep on having these insecure thoughts. Her eyelids started to tremble. It was something she had never shown after returning to daily life. Ugd squinted his eyes. Bium. Let's calm down. Take a deep breath. D, do you not like green hair? What is this about all of a sudden? Does my green hair appear like a symbol of disbelief? Or maybe it doesn't make me look as pretty? She asked while tightly grasping onto her hair but he shook his head in return. B.O.M. was still pretty and the color was not important. Then, you know. And then. What if I tie it like this? You know how I don't tie my hair very often. Saying that, she suddenly took out the elastic band that was around her wrist and began tying her hair. It was quite rare as she said to see her in a ponytail. Do you still not hate me? He naturally didn't hate her. Hairstyle had nothing to do with it. Over time, Ugd realized that there must be a reason why Bill M was feeling so uneasy. There was something something that made her think to herself that she would be discarded. What if I cut my hair? It will suit you. What if it's very short? Like bob hair. That will also suit you. What about a boyish shortcut? What if I look like a boy? ITLL be nice and refreshing. W, what if I shave my hair? That's. Did I go too far? Sorry. Although they ended it with a light joke, there was uneasiness hanging in her eyes like fruits as she melancholically gazed at him. There was no brainwash now, and her love didn't seem serious like that of a mental patient. Seeing her do that made her look quite cute, but the topic at hand was most certainly something that required a serious approach. It doesn't matter. Whether you shave your hair or tie it to a pigtail. I might find it funny over time, but I do not think that will be a reason for me to hate you. Do you mean it? What if I can't have babies? For a moment, 
He thought he heard it wrong but Bio M still had a serious and gloomy look on her face as she gazed into his eyes. Can't have babies? What was that? Even if I can't have babies, will you still not hate me? Do you mean you can't have one right now? She turned even gloomier after hearing his question. Drops of tears were budding beneath her eyes. No. Forever. Tears traveled down her cheeks as soon as she finished her words. She blinked her eyes on repeat as two and three drops of tears fell from her eyes. He finally realized what that long set of questions at the start was for. There's something I have to confess. While controlling her emotions, B.O.M. started composedly confessing about her past. The things that weren't included when she first talked about her past events during their reunion were starting to be revealed one by one. A broken conception organ, a body that cannot have babies as well as how she failed upon dozens of attempts. Ujidi felt disordered throughout her speech. Some wounds were left behind as scars even after being healed and burned one's skin endlessly, all the way until death. Beasts had trouble withstanding the sensitive and aching pain of their skin and lived while unendingly licking their scars. And that would become a habit that sticks deeper over time. Like how countless soldiers live the rest of their life in misfortune after a war. Bomb's confession was not just representative of her own circumstances. Ujidi was in a similar state. The scenes he often saw in his dreams would show the kids killing each other in the worst forms and kept on instilling an unhappy image in his brain. In this place were two wounded beasts leaning on each other. Will you still, not hate me? However, they were different from the past. Although elements like these tended to become a problem after stacking themselves up, Baum no longer tried to hide her deficits with deceit. It was time for him to also show his sincerity. I need to confess as well. There was something he had prepared immediately after coming to his senses, which he had been delaying constantly while waiting for the right opportunity. Ujidi walked up to the nervous and uneasy BOM and took out a small box from his dimensional storage. How was this supposed to be done? He couldn't remember it properly but there were a few things he saw, so he got down on one of his knees. Then, he handed her the box as wonder appeared in the eyes of BOM who had been waiting for him to continue. The box cracked open. He remembered how baby Bom used to think there were only black flowers in the world. To explain freedom to that child, Ujidi had shown her all sorts of colors. Because of those memories, this time he prepared a white flower. Bom. This is my reply. The white flower bud slowly started to blossom. On the other hand, Bom shrunk her body. It was because she saw a ring that was hiding inside the white flower. The flower hanging in Ujidi's hand gave off a white radiance of light through the dark night. Please marry me. Her eyes widened into circles and she covered her mouth to stop her emotions from flooding out. It wasn't easy for her to take the ring. Tears constantly fell down her cheeks and her wrists and her hands were therefore very busy. Her tears still refused to stop so B.O.M. gave a bright smile that bloomed through her tears. The statement that people became happy by smiling might be true her emotions started bursting out like water through a broken dam as everything started to feel realistic. B.O.M. gave a very slow nod. She then fully wrapped her trembling hands around his neck as he stayed on one of his knees. He'll be glad to. The proposal and the short date they had alone were all over in the blink of an eye. It was time to go back to the cabin. On the way back, B.O.M. walked while holding on to his hand as her feet trampled on the rustling leaves. Even though it was late at night, the streets were still bright thanks to the abundant street lamps. People that had no thoughts of diligently staying at their cabins in this campsite were still energetically playing outside with firecrackers. Suddenly, a group of young kids appeared. They chuckled while running off somewhere by themselves with tiny shoes on their feet. Bomb's hand holding onto his hand suddenly turned stiff, so he clenched his grip while faintly covering her sight with his other hand. What are you looking at? We're going this way. Ah. Yes. His words made her heart flutter once again. Love. Even though she was feeling it every day at every instant, it was times like this that made her feel an immense amount of love that pushed her rationality off into the distance. That was why Baum couldn't take her eyes off of his face throughout the way back to the cabin. 
It was when they were in the forest nearby. Three hundred more meters and they would be at the cabin but Bill M suddenly halted her feet. Eugidi felt resistance from her hand as he stopped and turned back to her. He stared at her flushed cheeks in puzzlement and opened his mouth. What are you? As if she resolved herself, Baum lifted her hands and started undoing the hair that was tied behind her hair. With an indifferent expression and circular eyes, she untied her hair and disheveled it by running her fingers across. Her hair that had been slowly returning to green rapidly began to be tainted in darkness like magic. Let's go. After changing her hair to pure black, Bill M pulled him by his hand and started walking somewhere. She energetically pulled him forward so he obediently followed from behind as B.O.M. glanced around before opening an alternate dimension. A small room with nothing but one bed revealed itself, and B.O.M. immediately realized that this place was the one she saw in the past using her eye of providence. She didn't need any more totems. B.O.M. decided to trust him even more. When the door of the alternate dimension came to a close, an ambient source of light emerged from the ceiling and brightened up the dark and small room. Their lips converged. This time, he didn't avoid her. B.O.M. let out a moan after getting her neck and collarbones bitten. His lips slowly traveled further down. When he supported her bum with his powerful arms and raised her up into the air, she instinctively wrapped her arms around his neck. Because of the difference in their height, her feet almost never landed on the ground. Even so, she was able to see his face and share her breath with him. The sweetness of his lips loosened the nervousness filling her body, and the smell of his skin jolted her dizzy mind. With their future together in sight, Bill M thought to herself. Even though things might not always be perfectly good, she would still be happy. Although she might not be able to achieve everything she wanted, she would still be content. Only after dropping the burden in her mind was Baum able to accept the incomplete happiness. But what she definitely hadn't expected was a miracle. At the end of the trip, B.O.M. conveyed the happy news to the kids who hopped in joy and congratulated her. They decided on the day of their marriage. There weren't that many people to bring, so they decided to hold a simple ceremony at the forest near the house. B.O.M. and Curl went around looking for a wedding dress. Time flew by. As happy as it was, the flow of time was also very rapid. By the way, you Bioem. You know that onion core. Yoram said while scratching her chin. I forgot about it, but that jinx thing is broken now right? Oh yeah, you're right. There used to be an equally great misfortune after a fortunate event that was her life. However, nothing particularly happened because of the onion core. There were a few things that happened around the same time by coincidence, but looking back at it now, they weren't anything significant unlike her nameless dead sibling and her father who did not come back after leaving her. Come on. That's just superstition. Do you still believe in things like that? What? Hi Goo. I should have taken a video when you were shivering and peeing yourself. When did I do that? You can't fool me like that, buddy. You were poking your head into a rubbish bin and stuff. It was a nightmare. Yoram giggled while reflecting on the time they were doing a gotcha on the onion core. B.O.M., who shared the same memories as her, also couldn't hold back her laughter. Those were the times. That was when something changed. Uh. B.O.M. blinked her eyes. Something. There definitely was something. Inside her belly. She put her hand inside her outstretched t-shirt. Since one of them suddenly stopped laughing, Yoram also turned around and faced her and saw Bioam blinking her eyes while stroking her lower belly. What's up? Did some kind of miracle happen or something? After saying that, Yoram looked into her eyes and felt goosebumps crawling up her body. She thought back on the words which she had thoughtlessly thrown out. Miracles happen because of the power of love and whatever in romance novels that was what she had said herself. Baum's eyes widened like never before as goosebumps covered her skin. It was a miracle. Jewel twitched her lips and moved them. She had finished shedding her skin the first time. The body of a baby which she had been hating was now in the form of a young girl. Jewel wriggled her mouth. Speaking slowly was a habit but the strange thing was that her ability to speak turned worse after the regression. 
However, that was now a thing of the past. A few days after shedding her skin, her vocal cords turned itchy and this morning, she even unknowingly hummed to herself. That could only mean one thing. It was here. Today was the day. Standing with her hands resting on her hip, Joel glared daggers at the mirror and saw herself glaring back at her through the mirror. Hugh. The mechanism itself was simple. Taking a deep breath in, she tightened her vocal cords and moved her lips. It was a tense moment. Phrase number one, ready. Fire. I. A. M. You Joel. Wah. It was a bit wonky but she could finally speak. Joel hopped on the spot with a bright smile. She was so happy that she almost flew into the air. At the same time, all the hard and agonizing times that went by due to her inability to speak properly melted like spring snow. How sad had she been. Her unis teased her every time, and she couldn't even talk to Ujidi even when there was something she enjoyed. All she could do was chew on a pacifier to endure through the hardships. Jill wanted to dash out of the door and give a mouthful to B.O.M., Yoram and Curl who used to tease her all the time. You Yoram. Is. Trash. Ha <laughs> ha. Just like that. However, Joel inside the mirror shook her head. No no no. This is not it. She was finally able to speak, and she wanted the first target of her speech to be Ujidi. Her plan was to sneak up to him and mumble like always. That was what she had been like until just yesterday, and Ujidi would probably hug her without knowing anything. That would be when she says, Daddy. How surprised would he be? Ah. Joel tightened her fists in excitement. This was the day she had been waiting for the whole time. Ah. Now was not the time for this. Looking at the mirror, she decided to practice to make it the most perfect confession in the world. Daddy. I. Missed you. Daddy. I. Missed you. After saying it dozens of times to herself, she at last readied herself to say the perfect line. She placed her hand on the door knob leading to the living room, but that was when words that were completely outside her expectations were heard from the other side of the door. Dude. You GD's a daddy now. It was Yoram's shout. Joel was startled and her hands were frozen stiff. You GD, what? What nonsense was that idiot you Yoram talking about? She was about to turn the door knob while glossing over her words but that was when Ko followed suit. Huck, that's insane. A juicy. You're a daddy now. A daddy. Curl yelled while running to the veranda to look for Ujidi. Following that were cheers, screams and touched voices. Hearing those cheers and tears, Joel turned stiff yet again. Kagagagung. A thunder was going off in her head. Joel also knew about the nature of Ujidi and Bomb's relationship. She was no longer a kid, and knew the things that were happening between them and was also expecting such a day to arrive but. Why did it have to be today of all days? This. Can't. B. Her mind turned dizzy. Everyone in the living room appeared to be thinking that she was still sleeping, and didn't even come looking for her. Without going out to the living room, Joel turned around and gazed outside the window. Resting her chin on her small hands, she organized her thoughts. Pushing aside the slightly regretful timing, Joel also felt her heart beating fast. For goodness sake. Eugidi's child. How cute would the baby be? She shouldn't be staying holed up in her room by herself, and should go outside and celebrate with everyone else. There was still a lot of time to spend together as well as happy memories to build, so the best option would be to decorate the starting point of a new relationship as happily as possible. Kuhum. Kum. After clearing her throat, Joel turned around. She was about to walk to the living room, but suddenly halted her steps and returned to the window. Reaching out with her small hands, she grabbed on the hinged window and pulled it to a close. While she was closing the window, her blue eyes flickered through the gap but when the window was fully shut, the inside of the house was no longer visible. But after another sound of a door being shut, there were more bustling noises resonating from the living room. Most of those sounds were that of laughter. 
what was happening inside was no longer something others could see. However, there was one thing that was certain. As long as they were together, they would continue living happily ever after. Forever. Kidnapped Dragons. After Story. The End.